I worked for a local government agency for a long time. Each summer, we would get a new crop of interns. Most were fine. Some caused issues like when we caught the two of them making out in the file room. Overall, they were just normal kids from high school or college trying to get some work experience. In 2016, my department received an intern later than usual, right in the middle of summer. Warner was a bit older than the usual crowd, around my age, maybe late 20s. We initially hit it off pretty well, and although I found him sort of strange, I didn't mind since he was friendly and we had some common interests. He was the only person in my department who was even close to my age. The interns were all teenagers, and the regular staff averaged around 60, older than my mom. I was pretty psyched to have a peer to chat with, so occasionally I would eat lunch with Warner or stop to talk at his cubicle. His strangeness was mostly an outsized personality, a mix of over-the-top enthusiasm with a bit of social awkwardness. I got zero bad vibes from the guy. It wasn't long before Warner started having major performance problems at work. He would produce little to no work on most days, no show, or arrive late without informing anyone, and generally acted unprofessionally. One day he showed up for work at 3.15pm, when our workday ended at 4.30. The office manager was livid and told him to go home. His behavior bothered nearly everyone in my office, but I did not supervise him, and we had plenty of slacker interns in the past. While his antics were a bit of a spectacle, it wasn't a big deal to me. If you're wondering why he wasn't let go, two words. Political favor. I found out from Warner himself that he was hired because his uncle donated to the campaign of our big boss. He wasn't going anywhere. Near the end of that summer, I put in my notice that I was leaving my job and relocating to a new state. Once Warner caught wind of this, he would constantly complain that it sucked I was leaving because we barely had time to become friends. I would always laugh lightly in response and give a sympathetic, yeah. He would start to monopolize my time at work more and more, and it became disruptive to the people who sat near me. I found it slightly annoying but I was also extremely happy to be leaving that job for reasons unrelated to Warner, and I spent my last month there not caring about what my co-workers thought. I tolerated him lingering by my desk. One day he caught me leaving work and offered me a ride home. I usually took the bus, and occasionally other co-workers would offer me rides home if they were going my way, so this didn't seem odd to me. I accepted and walked to his car with them, it smelled awful, and it was full of garbage. He hastily cleared off the passenger seat and apologized. We got on our way, but once we were on the main road, he started begging me to stop and get dinner with him. I laughed and said he didn't need to ask me that insistently. I said we could stop at a diner on the way. We had a nice meal with a pleasant conversation. He was intelligent and had a variety of interests. Our political positions aligned and we shared a disdain for our cranky old co-workers. I had a good time. I expressed that he didn't need to drive me all the way home now that it was late, but he kept insisting, so I relented. As I directed him toward my house, he started whining again about how our developing friendship was cut short because I was moving. At this point, I was tired of hearing this. The decision to leave my job and move away from home was extremely difficult to make and I was proud of how bold I was being. I stopped responding and laughing, and his whining faded out. We came up to the turn to get onto my street, and when I pointed it out, he accelerated and drove right past it, laughing. I laughed in a, oh my god, what the fuck way, thinking he was joking around. When I began giving instructions about how to turn around and get back, he started begging me to keep hanging out with him because he was lonely. This immediately set me on high alert. It suddenly hit me that I'm in a man's car, someone I don't know that well, who doesn't exercise proper behavior at work, which is the only context I know in, and now he's displaying weird behavior outside of work as well. My instinct was not to insist I be let out of his car. I felt as if this would escalate the situation into something bad, and in hindsight, 
It may have been the right thing to do when I think about the type of person he turned out to be. I told him we could hang out at the park near my house if he wanted to talk. He seemed to like that idea and we parked and walked over. The pleasant conversations resumed. Besides the weird clinginess, he was perfectly fine to talk to until he dumped his entire life story on me, which included his prior arrest for theft, his heroin addiction, and related struggles with depression. I try to be sympathetic, but I was very put off by this. It was a lot of highly personal information all at once, and I was still on alert because of his prior behavior. I tried changing the subject by showing him pictures of my dog. I scrolled one picture too far, and the next one was a photo of me wearing makeup and posing cutely. He grabbed the phone and said, Wow, you're very photogenic. I felt awkward and didn't say anything. There was a long silence. Then he launched into a weird tangent about how compatible we are, that we have similar interests and everything like that, and that he wishes I wasn't moving so we could try to hang out again, but on a date. I didn't say anything, and he broke the silence with, Sorry I'm saying all this stuff. I'm actually high right now. That's why I know where Riverside is. I went there yesterday. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said it. I'm sorry. Internally, I freaked out. He had definitely put his drug addiction in past tense, and I assumed it was something he was recovering from, not currently using. I also realized I'd been in the car he was operating while he was under the influence. I don't know anything about heroin, so I was clueless. I felt very, very stupid. He immediately started whining and begging me not to judge him or hate him, and he kept saying over and over again how nice I am, and how understanding I am, that I'm pretty and smart. All of these weird compliments interspersed with talking down about himself. I didn't know what to do, so I smiled reassuringly and told him not to worry, but that I was tired and wanted to go home. That's when the crying started. He had this weird, wheezy song but no tears were coming out. I sat there silently while he did this, trying to come up with some sort of graceful escape plan. My patience was wearing thin, and my anxiety was through the roof. It's a weird feeling to be annoyed and panicky at the same time. I stood up and apologized, said the park was close to my house, so I'll walk, and I started to leave. When I remembered, I left my stuff in his car. Trying a new approach, I casually mentioned I forgot my stuff in his car and joked that if he wanted my dirty lunch containers, he could keep them. He ceased his bizarre cry, stood up, ran over to his car to unlock it, and I grabbed my stuff out of his back seat. His demeanor changed drastically as he calmed down, apologizing for making things weird. He asked if he could drop me off at my home so I didn't have to walk alone at night. I said yes but I made him drop me off a block over from my little side street so he wouldn't see which house was mine. I could end it here, but what bothered me the most about this guy happened after the encounter. I'll make this part short. A week or two after that weird evening, the end of August by this point, I had my last day at the job and moved a thousand miles across the country. Warner would sometimes text me with long ramblings, detailing his feelings about himself and about our missed opportunity. I didn't respond to these messages. Now that I wasn't near him, I didn't feel the need to placate. The text stopped after a few weeks, and I forgot about him. Fast forward to February, and I get a text from a former co-worker. Her message said, Sorry you had to hear about it this way. And her next message was a link to a local news article titled, Man Dies from Wounds in Riverside Stabbing Wednesday. Because of the way she worded it, I thought Warner was the victim, but when I read it, it included his mugshot in the charges. He was the attacker. He murdered someone. I felt so shocked and disgusted, I couldn't believe I knew someone who killed another human. Later on, I called an old work friend for some details. Apparently, shortly after I left the job, he was fired for trashing the men's bathroom. Like he just threw anything around he could lift and poured all the soap out and smeared it all over the place. He then lost his apartment. 
I have to assume that's how he ended up in the aforementioned Riverside. There are a lot of homeless and drug addicts who squat in abandoned houses. I wonder if the man he stabbed had refused to give him something he wanted, and that's how he reacted to a hard no. I don't think I made all the wisest decisions during my interactions with Warner, but I'm glad I was able to avoid setting him off since he was clearly not stable. Hands down, the worst intern I've ever encountered. So I'm a female living alone in a fairly safe apartment complex. I live on the fifth floor. On my floor, there's only my apartment, my neighbors, and a laundry room with a washer and dryer. I know most of the tenants in my building, except for my neighbor. He's only been living here for a week. I only know his name, but I've never talked to him. I only know he's an older guy from talking to another neighbor. So, at around 8 one night, somebody rang my doorbell. Through the people, I saw a guy standing in front of my door. He was like in his mid-40s. I thought that's probably my neighbor. It's normal in our complex to go introduce yourself. So I thought that's what he wanted. I only opened the door a bit. You never know, and I left the chain on. He saw me, smiled, and then he said, Hey, but he didn't say anything after that. I was already a bit confused, so I said, Hi, how can I help? He introduced himself as Bruno. Didn't say he's my neighbor or anything. I didn't say anything either. After a few seconds, he said, Don't be afraid. I don't bite. I was about ready to slam the door shut. If somebody tells you not to be afraid of him, there's definitely something to be afraid of. But before I could close it, he came really close to the door, almost squeezing his head in the gap. I know I should have slammed the door in his face at that point, but I was kind of shocked. Before I could do anything, he asked, Did you do this to my laundry? Confused, I looked at him, and I said, what? He then repeated, Did you do this to my laundry? At this point, I was really confused. I told him that I didn't know what he was talking about. He said something along the lines of, Well, come and have a look. He then pointed to the laundry room. At that point, I noped the fuck out and slammed the door shut, double locked it, and called my boyfriend. I saw the guy stand in front of my door for at least another minute through the peephole before he left downstairs. He didn't seem angry or anything. He just had this weird, blank expression on his face. My boyfriend drove to my place immediately. He checked for cars outside the complex, checked the stairwell, but he couldn't find the guy. We went to look for the laundry he was talking about, but there wasn't any. I know he didn't take it with him, because I saw him leave without any. I was looking through the people the whole time until my boyfriend arrived. He asked me if I knew the guy, and I told him that initially I thought it was my neighbor, but I wasn't sure. He went to ring my neighbor's doorbell, and I watched him through the door, and the guy that opened definitely wasn't the guy that rang my doorbell. He also didn't know anyone that matched that description. Honestly, this whole thing creeps me out so much. What would have happened if I went with the guy into the laundry room? I was walking down the sidewalk to enter my friend's apartment building around 9pm, so it was already dark outside. I had to park down the street a ways due to all the spots being filled up. As I approached her building, an older man, roughly in his late 40s, wearing a wife beater and dirty jeans, steps in front of me, facing me, gets very close to me while saying, Hey baby. I'm no stranger to the occasional harassment, so I quickly sidestep him and go on my way. To me, it seemed obvious he didn't live in the complex, since it's mostly occupied by 20-something-year-old undergrads. Now, in order to get to my friend's apartment, I have to take a smaller path to get to the back of the building. I was walking on that and didn't hear him behind me anymore. But as I enter the more unlit part, I look behind me just to check. He was right behind me, not at normal following distance. He was so close to me, I could reach out and touch him. 
and he was walking fairly silently as I hadn't been able to hear him, even though we were the only ones walking around. I'm scared shitless at this point. I see some people in front of me on the stairs, so I start running toward them. I was yelling, I don't know you, please get away from me. I began to pull out my pepper spray while still running toward the onlookers, who were still on the stairs. He got flustered and ran away, and I was finally able to contact my friend and get inside. Even though he had left, the people who had witnessed this all happened to end up not saying a word to me and going back inside. I'm not sure what else they could have done at that point, but being alone while waiting for my friend to let me in made me feel incredibly unsafe. I held onto my pepper spray until I was completely inside the building. Okay, so it was a Saturday night and me and my girlfriend were out having a few drinks at her friend's house. So it gets a little later and we go home. I've still got some beers which are finished at my apartment eat some food and pass out on my couch. My girlfriend is in our room, so I fell asleep on my couch and hadn't locked my back door. So around 6am Sunday morning, I'm awoken to a labored breathing sound. My groggy, half asleep, half hungover brain was trying to figure out what sound that was. I questioned if it was my girlfriend. No, it sounds like it's in the room with me. So I wake up a bit more lying on my couch. And I say, hello? Suddenly a tall man stands up from laying down right in front of my couch and says, Hi, I'm Jay. So this happens and I'm very confused, thinking it's one of my friends. I say, what are you doing? I got invited here, he replied. No you didn't, I said. He says with a more stern voice, yes I did. That's when I went into full-on flight mode, my adrenaline pumping. I don't know how I got off my couch, but basically I sprung up at him, yelling at him to get the fuck out of my house. He backs up and says, Hey, hey, relax. So I did relax, but not enough to carry on any conversation. So, me in my green underwear and pink Floyd shirt points towards my kitchen and says get out. He starts walking and I'm following. The guy was nice enough to take his shoes off at the door. I couldn't believe it. So in my kitchen I say, what are you doing in my house? He sort of stares off out my back window and he replied, uh, I did a lot of drugs tonight. I started laughing and say, okay. So he gets his shoes on. I open the door for him and he turns to me and says, you got a cigarette man? I say, no, get the fuck out. So he leaves and I go put some pants on and do a quick walk around my place to make sure he left. And after that, I went back to sleep. This happened to me a few years back when I was in my early 20s. At the time I worked in a department store at the makeup counter. The job relies heavily on good customer service and building relationships because you want people to keep coming back to spend money on your products. We're given personalized business cards so we can build our own client base. It's not uncommon to be familiar with people who frequently shop in the store. As workers, our training is focused on being friendly and accommodating. One day while I was working, I had to move to a makeup counter that wasn't my own to cover someone else's lunch break. It was a really slow day, so I was just leaning over the counter, people watching, you know? I could tell most shoppers were just browsing, so I kept to myself. One of the people that I noticed was a very tall and broad man. He walked very slowly, almost hunched over. His face was fixed very aggressively, like he was angry, but focused. He circled around the corner a few times, but I could feel his gaze on me instead of the product. After a few rotations around the department, I decided to greet him, just in case he needed help. It wasn't until he came directly over to me that I realized just how big he actually was. I'm a 4 foot 10, 140 pound female, 
so I feel pretty small regardless. But even with his slouched posture, he was over six feet tall and well over twice my weight. I'll never forget his teeth. They were completely black in the front. Your eyes couldn't help but go to them. Despite his menacing appearance, he was soft-spoken. Truthfully, I could tell he wasn't all there by the way he talked. He told me no when I asked if he needed help, but requested my number. It was so direct. We'd never spoken before. I declined and said that I was in a relationship and that it would be inappropriate. He then asked if he could have a business card for the counter in case he wanted to get products. Since I wasn't on my normal counter and I really wanted him to go away, I handed him my coworker's business card and told him to call if he had any questions. It worked, and he walked away after that, filling me with relief. Only a couple of minutes later, the phone on the counter rings. I answer with my preppy customer service voice and say, Thank you for calling. How can I help you? And immediately I know it's the same guy when he starts talking. He asks me again for my personal number, and I explain once again that I cannot do that. But he just wants to talk, he explains. Since he wasn't getting the hint, I say, I should have told you that I'm married. You can't have my number. Politely, he apologizes and hangs up. I thought that would be the end of him. But for the next few weeks or so, I spent much of my time at work anxious that he would show up. I would see him every week and he would lurk around the corner looking for me. Anytime I would see him, I'd immediately drop what I was doing to run and hide or run to the closest customer and offer any bit of assistance to make it look like I was busy, just so he wouldn't talk to me. I successfully dodged him every time, and it came to the point where I stopped seeing him. I was thrilled. I had almost completely forgotten about him, until one day I decided to go to Walmart by myself to pick a few things up on my day off. I generally like to shop alone. I can take all the time I need, and I like to leisurely look around. I grabbed a basket and made my way over to the cosmetic and wellness section, since that's where most of the things I needed were. I only managed to grab a few things before I locked eyes with them as I walked by the supplement aisle. I'd recently changed my hair color and wasn't wearing my work uniform, so I didn't think he'd recognize who I was. I was ready to just go about my shopping and ignore him until I noticed that he had dropped the items he had in his hands and started heading my way. I panicked and swiftened my pace immediately. I thought to myself, he's not really going to follow you through the store, right? But as I turned around to look, I could see his humongous body just plowing through people, with that same terrifying look on his face, only meaner, his black teeth growing closer with a snarl. Since the direction I was walking was the opposite of the exit, and there was no way in hell I was going to turn around, I decided my best course of action would be to follow the perimeter of the store and then cut through the center section which would bring me closer to the registers. I sped walk the entire time in the hopes of losing him amongst the crowd but never once turning around again. By the time I made it to the register area, I could actually feel him behind me. Still not wanting to turn around, I glanced in the reflection of the soda machines that are in between the register aisles to see how close he was. To my horror, it was only about a foot and a half to two feet between us. I was afraid to just drop my stuff and run out the door in case he followed me to my car. I parked in the far back of the parking lot and didn't want to risk it. I also didn't want to get in line at the registers since the lines were long and I would just be standing out in the open alone. Instead, I walked into a cluster of people crowded around the self-checkout line. I noticed another large but older gentleman with his carriage in the middle and ran straight for him. The people were so closely clustered together that the man following me could not make it through. I ran over to the man in line and grabbed onto his carriage. I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not cutting you, but there's a man that's been following me through half the store. I need to stand with you. He was so sweet and let me be with him while we waited in line and even let me go ahead of him so I could leave quicker. As I was cashing out, I could see in my peripheral vision my stalker staring at me and pacing about, but he couldn't come near me since the self-checkout is somewhat sectioned off. 
By the time I'd finished and grabbed my receipt, I couldn't see him anymore. I looked around, but he was nowhere. I thought about asking the older man to walk me to my car, but he still wasn't finished at the register, so I decided to call my boyfriend and make a run for it. Staying on the phone, I explained to him what was going on as I sprinted to my car in tears, frantically looking around in case he tried to follow me outside. I made it to my car safely and rushed right home, breaking down to my parents about what just happened. I could feel it in my bones that the man wanted to do something to me, and thankfully I didn't find out what it was. His aggressive aura was palpable. To this day, I can still remember the adrenaline, nervousness, the sheer terror I felt when he followed me. I had never felt so vulnerable and helpless, even with all those people around. I quit that job roughly two years later. I had only seen him one other time there since the incident, but I still live in constant fear that we will cross paths again. I am afraid to shop alone, something that I would not give a second thought to years before. When I was pregnant with my first child, who was born in 2013, I joined an online birth club community for moms who would do the same month. Eventually, this led to a smaller Facebook group, which allowed for more personal conversations. As you can imagine, being in a group of people whose only common connection is when your kid is born can lead to coming across some interesting characters you would probably never interact with otherwise. Anyway, over time, Bonds were formed and mom shared a lot of their daily life, whether it was about the kids or otherwise. Among this group was Leslie Filataro. Almost a year after our February 2013 babies were born, she announced another pregnancy and that she was due in June 2014. Of course, everyone congratulated her and were looking forward to new updates. Leslie mostly posted about her everyday life with her twins, annoyances living with her sister-in-law, feeling stuck, and how she and her family were really struggling for money and couldn't wait to be able to move into their own place. These posts about their financial issues got more and more detailed and frequent, and then some people sent baby supplies to try to help out a struggling mom. With her due date approaching about four weeks away, another mom posted and tagged her to check on her. She asked how everything was going since she had seemed to completely stop posting and commenting in the group. Someone got the idea to Google her name, and that's when the news story popped up that about three weeks prior to this post check on her, Leslie was arrested for her connection to her boyfriend's attempted murder on a woman in their town. This sent the entire group down a rabbit hole of Facebook investigation and piecing together the story until all the details came out and her trial started. Leslie sighed is that she was dropping her boyfriend Chad Horn off to a friend's house, and she was waiting in a nearby park to pick him up when he was done there, that she had no knowledge of what he was there to do. She had her twin one-year-old daughters and nephew in the car with her, and she was obviously nine months pregnant at the time. The real story is that she was his getaway driver. He was hired as a hitman to kill the woman he was dropped off to. She purchased supplies that Chad took with him to use in the attack, which were ultimately what led her to a guilty verdict in being complicit with the crimes. Chad forced his way into the home at gunpoint. While this woman and her two children were home, he made her go out and start her vehicle while he stayed inside with her kids. And when she came back, he bound her hands with zip ties, slit her throat, and fired one shot at her, which missed and then he fled the home in this woman's car. The woman survived all of this and was able to get to her neighbor's house for help. Chad called 911 twice to report two made-up shootings at different locations to lead them away. There was a police chase with them, and he ended up shooting and killing himself. There was a suspect who may have hired Chad for a hit out on this woman, but no evidence has been found on him, even after 70 search warrants had been issued. After much Facebook stalking from the group at the time of this trial, we suspected that it may have been the woman's ex-husband. It's just speculation though, as none of it's been confirmed. 
The victim was married to a woman at the time of this hit, and I'm assuming her children are from her previous marriage. Again, it's all speculation, but it seems the likely answer for me. There was a lot of doubt surrounding Leslie's trial. Some jurors that gave a guilty verdict came out and said they regretted it later, and they wished they could change it, that she shouldn't be held accountable for Chad's crimes and intentions. I personally believe without a doubt that Leslie knew what Chad had intended to do. I think their sole motive was money, due to all of her posts with the group about their financial struggles, and that she was growing more and more desperate to get out of her sister's house because they were not happy there. Whether or not she knew the details of this family, or would have agreed to help knowing this woman's young kids were also home, who knows, but I do believe she knew her role was to be the getaway driver for Chad. Leslie was found guilty in 2015 for her part in the attempted murder, burglary, and kidnapping. She was sentenced to 43 years in prison. When I was about 10, a really big storm went through the northeast corner of my state. It was about 4 p.m., and I was practicing with the community children's choir, an after-school program that I actually really enjoyed. We were practicing for a performance tour to all the nursing homes in the town. I sung in the soprano section, and we were receiving some criticism from our director when someone's mom showed up 30 minutes early to pick them up. Then another mom showed up, and then someone's grandpa, and another kid's dad. One by one, everyone left early and then my mom showed up. She seemed really worried and told me to hurry up and get in the car, so I grabbed my backpack and we went out the door. When we walked outside, everything was dark. It was like the sun went down at 4.30pm after spring forward. That just doesn't happen. Apparently it stormed so badly in the hour I was at choir practice that parts of our town had flooded. There was hail so big it busted car windows and damaged homes. The ride home was pretty scary for me at that age. I had no idea why I was picked up early. When we turned onto my street, it was flooded. The neighbors were rowing a canoe from one end to the other, and the older kids were trying to ride their bikes through the muddy water. We pulled into my driveway, and I immediately went inside and put my backpack in my room. My dad was in my room, cleaning up glass from the floor and my bed. There was water all over the floor and my bed was soaked on one side. He said the hail busted my bedroom window, and the rain poured into my room, and the hail melted on the floor and on my bed. My dad wasn't able to replace the window that evening, so he got a plastic tar, the kind you use to cover furniture when you're painting. It was folded into four layers and attached to my window with a staple gun. We had a movie night and just spent time together as a family that night. It made me feel better about sleeping in my room, but I still wanted a light on. It took me a while to fall asleep, but I read a chapter of Little House on the Prairie that helped me fall asleep. That night, I had a dream. At least I thought it was a dream. I heard a weird shuffling sound outside my window, kind of like the sound of a window opening and closing a few times. I realized I wasn't dreaming, but I couldn't move. My eyes were wide open, but it was like I was still asleep. I tried moving my legs, raising my arms, even tried rolling off the bed, but my whole body was stuck. Finally, I just used my voice. I mustered enough strength to scream as loud as I could and managed to turn my head toward the window. All I saw were two hands with white gloves holding the wood frame of the window, then moving it up and down and trying to jimmy it open. When I screamed a second time, he was gone. I jumped out of my bed and started to run to my parents' bedroom, but my legs felt like bricks and it felt like it took forever to get there. When I was outside their door, I just screamed at my mom someone was at my window. Fear and panic overwhelmed me as tears started dripping down my cheeks. My dad went outside to investigate and didn't see anyone. I never knew why they didn't call the police right then. I ended up sleeping in my mom's bed with her and my dad slept on the couch very close to my bedroom. The next morning, my dad walked around the house, 
and there were large muddy footprints from the street to my window and back again. The screen to my window was ripped off and tossed into the neighbor's yard. The plastic on my window had a large hole the size of the man's finger right above the window lock. My parents did finally call the police. An officer came to my school to get my statement, and I just told him what I saw that night. I slept in the living room for months after that. It's a Tuesday night at Office Depot where I work. A customer comes in needing to fax some things at 7pm. He said he remembered me from the last time he was there to fax and I said, Probably. I don't remember you, but I'm bad with remembering faces. Whatever. Skip to about 5-10 to 10 minutes later when his confirmation page finally comes in. I'm ringing him up and without any context he asks me, Do you know how to get rid of a dead body? I replied nervously, no. Well, I do watch a lot of TV, so he interrupts me with, this is how you get rid of a body. You deep freeze the body, you get a wood chipper, you back it up into a river or lake, and you chip away at the body, and then the little fishies eat the body away. Then you take your wood chipper to a car wash and wash it out. He's not laughing or cracking a smile. He just tells me this very calmly and with a practical tone as if he's giving me instructions on how to change a light bulb. It may not seem like a big deal. I'm totally into true crime and reading up on serial killings. But this was not reading an article. This was a man with a blank stare giving me instructions on how to effectively get rid of a dead body with no context whatsoever. I'm a female, and this happened to me when I was about 17. I worked at a convenience store in my hometown. Back then, we did solo overnight shifts. It's not as common in the big chains anymore for safety reasons. I was working alone when a young man came into the store. He was about 19 to 20. I went to the counter to wait on him, and I realized he had his pants unzipped, and he was exposed. I was internally shocked but I thought it was probably a prank and he was trying to get a reaction out of me. I decided I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction, so I waited on him like a regular customer. It was the weirdest interaction. He walked around the store, exposed mind you, looking at all the items, walked up to the counter to buy something, paid for it. I gave him his change and he left all the while letting his twig and berries get some air. I thought, well, he was probably disappointed about how that went, and then I went back to my work. The next day I found out the cops had arrested him because he'd come back later and was hanging out by the dumpster at the same convenience store, exposing himself to customers as they went into the store, telling them to come here. The cops came and arrested him. It creeped me out a bit because honestly, at the time I thought he was just some kid with friends outside, just trying to get some sort of reaction out of me when in reality, he was a full-on creeper. I'm kind of glad I didn't react. It probably even confused him. I ended up quitting overnight solo shifts because my mom had a nightmare that I got stabbed in the back cooler while I was working alone. A few weeks after that dream, the guy that replaced me was held up at knife point. Well, there you go. That's my story. One summer night, my roommate and I were both sitting on the couch of our living room, talking and watching Supernatural. Two ladies in our late 20s, we felt safe with just the unlocked screen door closed a few feet from us as I sat facing the window to our backyard. Now, I will say this, we weren't completely naive. We had the porch backlight on and lived in a townhouse facing a ravine, so for anyone to get back here, they would have to walk past either 10 houses on the left side or 5 other houses on the right. It wasn't the safest area around, 
as it housed mostly students from our nearby university. But hey, we knew all the drug dealers by name. They were our buddies. This is also why my roommate didn't freak out right away when I began yelling. She thought I was joking with a drunk friend. So, the stage is set. Now to the creepy part. I was sitting facing the window and my roommate faced me, so her back was to it. I was the only person to have actually seen him. At first I thought my mind was playing tricks on me. Just at the edges of the window, I could see the smiling face of a middle-aged man. But before I could register what I was seeing, the face backed up out of view. Not wanting to freak out my roommate, in case it was nothing, I went silent and got up to look out the back door that was to the left of the window. And there I saw an image that has been burned into my brain to this day, five years later. An obese man, wearing nothing but a black flat cap, was walking up the two steps of my porch toward my unlocked screen door. I yelled at the top of my lungs something like, Get the hell out of here, I'm calling the cops. The part that is stuck with me is the fact that he just held his hands up in an appeasing gesture and kind of silently chuckled as he backed up a big grin on his face the whole time, like it was all just some funny misunderstanding that he was naked in my backyard, about to come into my house. My roommate never saw him, which I'm glad for, but she was mad I didn't tell her what I suspected was going on at the time. We called the cops and three officers showed up. They searched the area but found no one. The part that still freaks me out is how long he was standing out there listening to us. I don't really know if he would have tried to open the door, but the fact he could have terrified me. I rationalize it now, thinking he just wanted a reaction, and I'm glad I gave him an angry one instead of a scared one. So I'm doing an outreach in a neighboring town. I see patients till around 4pm, and then I go to the guest house I normally stay over in. I'm tired as hell, so I check in, go to my room, throw my luggage in the corner, put my phone on the bedside table, get undressed, and I jump in bed. I'm almost asleep when I hear something next to me. I open my eyes, and there's this old lady standing next to my bed with my phone in her hand. Well dressed, deathly thin with these penetrating grayish blue eyes. She's calmly pressing and scrolling and turning my phone every which way like it's something she's never seen before. I'm disorientated more than panicked. I speak as gently as I can. Ma'am, may I help you, ma'am? She stops fiddling, slowly looks up to the wall, and turns her gaze towards me. She doesn't even register that I'm naked. How long have I been here? She said. I don't know, ma'am. This is my room. She looked confused suddenly looked at my phone, and gently set it back on the bedside table. Then she turned to me again and smiled in this sad, out-of-worldly manner. I don't belong here, do I? She said. I smiled back. That's okay, ma'am. She turned around and calmly walked out the door. Turns out she had Alzheimer's disease, and she wandered off while her husband was checking in. I forgot to lock my door when I came in. Her husband apologized profusely for the incident. I just told him there was nothing to apologize for. But it was still creepy though. After getting my driving license, I was hanging out with my friends in Rome. There were five of us, me and four passengers. It was around midnight when we hopped off in a square in the south of the city with a football to play with. It was during summer vacations, so it was a normal thing for us to do. After some time, a guy in his early 30s came up to us with a big travel bag. He wasn't creepy, but he was strange. He was skinny, but very toned and athletic. He wore shorts, very used sneakers, a long sleeve shirt. He had a beard and greasy long hair and a baseball cap. It was not a common look for a 30-year-old Italian man. He started chatting and then asked if he could join us. After some minutes playing, he started to ask about our interests. 
And then, about our sex life. I'm a shy guy, but some of my friends are, so they started going along with them, and he started to show us, without reason, finger push-ups, one-leg squats, and some other cool exercises. One of my friends was fooling around with him, and treating him like he was stupid, always asking for more exercises. Bear in mind, before he started playing with us, he had hid the big bag he had between two parked cars. The friend of mine who was messing around with them sent the ball a bit farther from us. He asked the guy to get the ball for us. Meanwhile, my friend asked me to unlock my car. He went to grab this man's bag and throw it in the back of my car, and then told me and my friends to get in the car in a hurry, to leave this guy with our ball and we'll take his bag. In a few seconds, we rushed to the car and he started chasing us. After driving some distance, he disappeared from my rearview mirror. I can say he ran pretty fast. I'm no thief, but as a teen, we do stupid things. I really didn't want to do something like this to a random guy. We parked near our houses and my friends started opening the back. And here's where things started to get creepy. What we found were dirty clothes. A knife that looked to be some kind of dagger, some food, and a small box with a three-digit lock. We were really curious about it, so we smashed it on the floor, trying to open it. After we threw it on the ground a few times, the box revealed 16 female IDs, all different. I started to worry about my safety, since we used my car, and he could remember my license plate and maybe find me in some way. We also wondered who the man could be and why he carried these things. We went to my friend's house, switched cars, and went back with my friend to the place where we met the guy, just to check. We arrived and all lowered ourselves to hide, making it look like there was only one person in the car. When we got there, more than one hour later, he was still there, sitting on the car who was parked in front of mine before. He didn't notice us, and we went back home with a lot more doubts about him. After ten years, I still remember this guy. The day after, one of us went to the police with a bag, saying we found it on the road. We left the daggers and IDs inside. My friend made an official report, lying but surely doing a good thing. A little over a year ago, I was approached via Twitter by a girl claiming she wanted to work together. Her location was not only the same city as mine, but in the same community as well. After a brief conversation in the DMs, I realized this profile was strange. It was fake. Immediately I block her and keep it moving. After this, it just gets so strange. This person continues to make fake profiles, pretending to know me, and eventually went into fake phone numbers to text me. I never once gave them my number. It's weird enough this person is persistent in stalking and harassing me. I'm a freelance entrepreneur, and a great portion of my income comes from online. So if it was up to me, I'd just unplug. But I can't let this harm my career. But this person has gone onto my friend's numbers and profiles, trying to contact them. I have no idea how. I'm very discreet. I don't interact with these friends online. And somehow, this person is finding them one by one over the past year, and persistently harassing them, even making fake Facebook profiles to harass certain people I deal with. It was not only my friends in the same area and group, but friends I have from other cities. When I tell you, and this is not an exaggeration, I have blocked over 100 Instagram accounts, Twitter profiles, texting app numbers, and emails from this person. And keep in mind, you need to make a new email to make an Instagram account. I'm a single man. Of course I have lady friends, but none of them are under the impression it's anything different. I also have no bad blood with any ex or former fling. I'm on good terms with everyone, as far as I know at least. But someone is targeting me, and any person they think I date or talk to, romantically. It has affected relationships with people I deal with. Either someone I know, I have no idea how close, but they are close enough, secretly hates me and wants to make my life hell. Or, a stranger is obsessed with me and wants to run everyone around me away. 
I have prayed on this, just talking to God to reveal who this is to me, or just make it go away. After a year, this persistence is starting to wear me down. I have no idea who this is. I have reported it to the police, but they haven't done much. I even tried to hire a digital private investigator, but the few I've contacted said they can't help me. It's just sick. Something has to give. This happened to me about a week ago. I found a summer job at our local supermarket and was about two weeks in. I got asked to work the late night shift, 11 till 5 a.m. roughly. I accepted since I was in need of money and I never sleep early. Everything was fine and dandy until about 3 a.m. when a shirtless, scarred up guy came into the store. After lingering around the store for a while, he quickly came up to the counter, making intense eye contact with me. As I was about to ask him if he needed any help, he whispered, Don't you dare move. I didn't hear him at first, so I asked him if he could repeat that. At that point, he got agitated and yelled, Make another sound, and I'll cut you up. In the swift motion, he vaulted over the counter to the alcohol section, trying to grab a bottle of whiskey. Thankfully, the owners hit a bat under the counter. The moment he turned his back to me, I took the bat and swung full force at his knee. He winced in pain and tried to get up. I winded my bat again, acting like I was going to hit him again, just to see him pull out a homemade ship of some sort. I let him get up, and the moment he got up, he swung his shiv at me, lightly lacerating my wrist. I pushed him back with my bat and ran for the door and got out. The day after, I called the cops and showed them the security camera footage but they haven't contacted me since. I think it's safe to say I won't be working the late night shift again for a long time. Up until junior year of high school, I flew mostly under the social radar and stuck to my status as a nerd girl. But when I was 15, I joined Varsity Cheer. My school's cheerleaders weren't popular by definition, but everyone kind of knew we were because we were on the announcements, performed at pep rallies, and generally engaged with the students a lot. I made a lot of friends that year, and some of them happened to be the cool kids. For a while, I thought this was my long-awaited karma payoff for the years of bullying I'd suffered at their hands. I even developed a crush on one of them. A crush which the junior cheer captain herself volunteered to help me pursue. Homecoming is a big deal where I'm from, and I began to fantasize about my crush asking me to go with her. I'd heard rumors he was planning a dramatic proposal, and as homecoming season approached, I became more and more sure I would be his date. The junior cheer captain, who was close with her, kept dropping hints that I was right. One day at practice, she asked me what my favorite candy was, and I knew it would be so my crush would know what to give me. You can imagine my surprise when, after an exhausting theater rehearsal, I walked into the parking lot and was confronted by a guy I hardly spoken to, asking me to be his date. My theater friends all applauded, assuming I was overjoyed. I saw both my parents in the parking lot recording the whole surprise. But most importantly, the cool kids I'd recently befriended were standing there right behind him, egging him on. I didn't understand why, because he was not popular at all. In fact, he was known to be kind of creepy. The junior cheer captain was laughing, encouraging him to give me the box of my favorite candy he was holding. She definitely orchestrated the whole thing. I didn't really know the guy but I didn't want to humiliate him in front of the coolest kids in school, so I faked a smile and rolled with it. I promised myself I'd deny him later, in private, so he wouldn't be embarrassed. Afterwards, when my parents excitedly asked me how I felt about the whole ordeal, I explained how uncomfortable it made me. I said that I got strong creepy vibes from the guy. 
That did not fly with my parents. My mother accused me of having expectations too high, and my father demanded to know if I was secretly a lesbian. To make his case stronger, i just become best friends with the only openly gay girl our school had ever seen. Long story short, I knew that if I shut my date down, I'd effectively declare war on my parents. However, I played my dad's protective instinct against him and persuaded him to let me friendzone my date. After all, he knows how high school boys think, right? I texted my date that night and explained that I only saw us as friends, but would still be happy to go to homecoming with them. He was very polite about it, although I could tell he was interested in me romantically. It seemed we'd reach a deal until the next day at school, when one of my cheerleader friends referred to my date as my boyfriend. I corrected her and told her we're just going to homecoming as friends. She seemed confused and told me my date was telling anyone who would listen that I was his girlfriend. A few more of my friends approached me with similar comments, and I confronted my date about them. He denied all involvement and suggested it was just a rumor. I reminded him that we were just friends. I had zero romantic interest in him. He said he understood. I got a call from the junior cheer captain. She pretended to be sweet and conspiratorial, but I was still annoyed that she led me to believe that my crush would ask me to homecoming. She began her attempt to persuade me that I was wrong to friendzone my date. She said that she'd spent many afternoons planning his proposal with him, and she knew he was kind of creepy from afar, but he was sweet and caring underneath all that. I said, if he was such a catch, she should date him. Annoyed, she dropped the sweet act. She told me that I had to date him, because he liked me so much, that he'd gone to so much trouble to ask me to homecoming. I had to give him a chance, because he'd gone out on a limb for me. I told her she was wrong, and I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to. I owed him nothing. I ended up hanging up on her soon after that, but that was just the beginning. Starting the next Monday, he would corner me in the hallway and give me a rose he held in his teeth. He usually did so between my 6th and 7th periods, when my path through the hall crossed his. I was deeply uncomfortable with this and told him so, but he wouldn't stop. I took different routes to escape him, but the junior cheer captain and her posse made a point of tracking me down so he could find me elsewhere. Every time he did this, everyone in the area would treat it as a sweet romantic gesture, despite my obvious discomfort. Wouldn't any girl be lucky to have a boy so devoted to her that he gave her a rose every day? He was still telling everyone I was his girlfriend. The final straw for me was when he walked into a class he wasn't in to find me and give me my daily rose. My teacher, who was friends with the junior cheer captain, let this happen. For weeks afterwards, she would ask me about my date every day. When he came in, I told him to get out and leave me alone. His feelings were clearly hurt, and he left, looking like a kicked puppy. My classmates started calling me a cold hard bitch. It didn't matter what I had to say about him. I was an ice queen, refusing this sweet boy's advances. Everyone in the school had decided that I was in love with him, and nobody cared what I had to say about it. My crush, who was part of the popular group, Join the cheer captain in pressuring me into returning my date's feelings. At every event where the cheerleaders were present, my date would push his way to the front of the crowd. He would go to great lengths to get my attention. At football games, he would have a flag in the student section, so I'd look at him when we were cheering. The other girls would make comments on how endearing he was when he waited in the parking lot by our bus back to the school. Also, he could hug me and tell me how great I did. I didn't know what else to do other than to let this happen. I had only recently ascended to a position of visibility. If I conflicted too hard with the cool kids, who were so dead set on setting me up with this guy, I could be an outsider all over again. I hoped that if I just kept ranting to my real friends about how creepy he was and publicly let him do what he wanted, it would all blow over. 
My school had a 15 second attention span, so some scandal had to one-up me sooner or later. The truth emerged, as usual, in the locker room. It turns out the junior cheer captain had been telling him, during their afternoon trips together, that I was into him. He'd come to her for help, announcing his crush on me, and she'd gone a step further and convinced him I felt the same, despite the fact that I didn't even know his name. She'd lied to him for weeks prior to the homecoming proposal, and when I told her that was wrong, she did not care. She told me I should be grateful because everybody was starting to think that I was gay. My best friend and I, inspired, spread a rumor that we were dating. After all, everybody already thought I was gay, right? But my date wasn't phased. In fact, he told everyone that he just turned me straight again. Ew. Three weeks after he asked me, it was finally homecoming night. Thanks to cheer obligations and a complete coincidence involving a switched backpack that left me without my dress, I ended up only attending the dance for half an hour. My date awkwardly stood on the other side of the room while I danced my heart out to Mr. Brightside. I almost felt bad for him when, right at the end, the junior cheer captain appeared like a summoned demon to suggest we slow dance at the next opportunity. Thank God I escaped that one by walking to the DJ and suggesting he play Footloose. My date walked me out to the parking lot to wait for my mom to pick me up while we waited for her to drive around, which took entirely too long because she'd hoped I'd stop making a fuss and date him. He asked me out. I politely declined. He quickly stammered that we could go with a group of people like the junior cheer captain and my crush. I denied him again and made it clear we were only friends. I wasn't interested in romantic endeavors because I was too busy. That was actually true. I was in all advanced classes, varsity theater, and cheer, and I also worked part-time. A few days later, a teacher eloped to Vegas, and nobody cared about my love life anymore. My date and I were distanced again by classes and activities and work. It appeared that everything was going back to normal. That Friday at the football game, my crush asked me to sit on his shoulders for the alma mater. Overjoyed, I accepted, and I hoped this was the beginning of a new chapter for me. I ignored the frantically waving flag in the stands. On Monday, my date stood on a chair in his second period class and announced that everyone should be wary of my crush, because he would steal your girl. I heard everyone buzzing about it a few hours later, when someone called me a bitch, again, for breaking my date's heart. I knew I was being dramatic, but I decided not to go to lunch that day, terrified of running into him. I'm so glad I didn't. Later, I saw on Snapchat that my date had carved my name into his arm with a pair of scissors. His bleeding arm was screenshotted and sent to me by half a dozen people, most of them demanding why I'd hurt him like this. He did it in the middle of lunch in a crowded cafeteria, and somehow, no administration noticed, or cared. The school was buzzing. My date was a broken-hearted victim, and I was the evil, secretly gay bitch who would not give him a chance. I got so many dirty looks. By fifth period, I was ready to just walk out, but my good girl instincts kicked in and I decided to tough it out for two more hours. Around that time, I got a panicked text from one of my cheer friends. While she'd initially been insistent that I date this creepy guy, she had apparently changed her mind after the lunch incident. She told me that my date, who was in her fifth period class, was going off the rails. He had started out saying that he wanted to kill himself because I would not love him. This had escalated to saying he would kill my crush for lying to me and stealing me away. Finally, he started talking about how he knew where I lived. My parents had given him my address when he initially wanted to ask me to the dance. He said he would make me pay for wronging him. I knew that, after sixth period, our paths would cross in the hall. Since the beginning of this ordeal, the school had cracked down on students getting outside. My alternate route to escape him was no longer an option. My class was at the far end of the hall with nowhere to go but into the central hub, and he would be coming from the other end of the hallway towards mine. 
I was stuck up a chimney, basically. Desperate. I texted the junior cheer captain to finish what she started and tell him that I was not and had never been interested in him. She'd made this mess and I would make sure she had to clean it up. She said she'd go to the counselor, but she didn't know what else to do. This was way beyond her control now. For the first and only time, I skipped class. I hid out in the theater hall and waited for seventh period. I got a few texts during the passing period that my date was waiting for me by the bathrooms. There was a little alcove right there where you can't see people coming around the corner, and the thought of him hiding there and waiting for me to walk by alone horrified me. Right before seventh period began, a few of my classmates burst in. They were cackling and proclaimed that my date was coming down here after school to kill my crush. They thought this was hilarious, but judging by the look on my crush's face, this wasn't a joke to him anymore. Our teacher brushed this off as typical theater drama, pun fully intended. I watched the clock and tried not to cry, knowing that, by the time the bell rang, my date would be waiting outside for me and my crush to emerge. That day ended up being a work day, so my crush and I were able to escape the classroom and hide out elsewhere in the theater hall to get away from him. He opted for the black box theater, and I went for the lighting closet. Obviously, I didn't witness what happened, but my best friend filled me in afterwards. Allegedly, my date had turned up three minutes before the bell rang and stood outside the classroom where we couldn't see him when we opened the door. He told everyone standing around that he was ready to have a knife fight with my crush. We didn't know if he actually had a knife or not, but the idea that he might was enough to terrify me. His arm was wrapped in paper towels that was bleeding through. My best friend told him my crush and I were gone, but he didn't believe her. He stood outside for 25 minutes until the administrators began walking through to make sure no one was in the school who shouldn't be. My date wasn't in the theater so he wasn't allowed to stick around. That night, I messaged him that not only would I never date him, but could no longer even see a friendship between us. I sent him a number to the suicide hotline and told him to get help. Finally, I told him that he needed to learn what no meant, and I never wanted to speak to him again. He responded that he was sorry, and he asked if there was anything he could do to fix this. I told him no. I don't think he learned the meaning of the word after all. He ended up pulling some seriously weird shit, even until after we graduated. None of it was as epic as Junior Homecoming, but it definitely cast a shadow over the latter half of my high school experience. For the months after Homecoming, things started to settle down again. I didn't have any classes with my stalker, and the only other person I still had to deal with was the junior cheer captain. She would go out of her way to be nice to me, inviting me to parties and buying me coffee and giving me rides to games, basically bribing me to keep quiet about what a manipulative person she was. My stalker reappeared on Valentine's Day 2016. I was still a junior, but I had almost forgotten that homecoming even happened when, halfway through my day, he cornered me in a hallway and gave me a rose out of his teeth. I hoped that would be the end of it but I underestimated my classmates' appetite for drama. During seventh period theater, we were in the library computer lab. After the rose thing, my crush from fall semester, who had since come out as gay, warned us that my stalker was carrying around a present for me in his backpack. I thanked him for the heads up and told my best friend. She and I were sitting together on the inside row when the bell rang. We stood up to leave but the girl on the other side of me turned to face us, blocking us off from the exit. She was a close friend of the junior cheer captains. She asked me what I was doing after school, and I knew that she must be trying to hurt me towards my stalker so I could collect my presents. I leveled with her and said I knew my stalker was waiting for me somewhere, and I told her straight up that I was not going to play nice with him anymore. She turned on the same old guilt trip as everyone else, telling me how much he cared about me, how hard he worked on these presents. But I refused to go. I knew I needed to get out of the school as soon as possible before she just told my stalker to come meet me at the library instead of the theater hall. 
To get her out of my way, I said I'd go meet him after I went to the bathroom, and she moved out of my way. My best friend and I hid out in the bathroom farthest from the theater hall. I knew he wouldn't leave until he delivered his gifts, and we had rehearsal that day, so I knew I'd have to go down there sooner or later. My best friend suggested she go down there and retrieve the presents for me, so he'd leave before I had to go to rehearsal. Two more of my friends happened upon our bathroom crisis, and they decided to link up with my best friend on her mission. I waited in the bathroom while they went to intercept the gifts. Twenty minutes later, they returned. Among the gifts were three boxes of my favorite candy, an expensive Doctor Who jewelry box, and a full bouquet of roses, again. They told me, laughing and comfortably, that there'd been a whole group of people waiting for me to walk into the theater hall. My stalker wasn't too happy to hand over these presents, but my friends made it clear I would not be coming to get them, so he could hand them over to my friends, or never deliver them at all. After about ten minutes, the group waiting for me dissipated, and my stalker gave away the gifts. I was so creeped out that I didn't keep any of them. For my birthday a few weeks later, I got out of school after fourth period, and went to a theme park with my cousin. I didn't tell anyone I was leaving or where I was going. My best friend told me my stalker had waited outside the theater hall for me, with a letter and a rose in hand, until the school kicked everyone out who wasn't in the theater. I was assistant director and night crew for one act play that spring. An acquaintance of mine who didn't keep up with gossip was in charge of making the program and she mentioned how cute my boyfriend was for taking an ad in the program for me. I was sufficiently freaked out. I told her I didn't have a boyfriend, and I asked to see the ad he paid for. It was a picture of my stalker and I from Junior Homecoming, along with a note that said something like, Good luck, Saucy. I love you. I begged my friend not to put it in the program, and she didn't, seeing my obvious discomfort. She refunded him his money and made some excuse about a local business buying more ad space. He tried the same trick for the last show of the year, which I was actually in. He showed up to opening night and got kicked out for filming. The theater department has now instituted a widespread rule of checking with the person an ad is targeted at before printing it, which is more than the school administration ever cared to do. During a cleanup day for theater the summer before senior year, a guy from a different school showed up to help. He'd been talking to me over social media for a few weeks, and I knew I was his next target. He made a game out of going on a date with every girl in our department. Sure enough, he asked me out while I cleaned up the prop closet, and I agreed. He was decent looking, and he wasn't mentally unstable, even if he was a fuckboy. I also knew that, if I played my cards right, I could turn this to my advantage. He was using me, so I just made sure I got something out of it too. We went on our date. On the way home, I directed the conversation towards homecoming. He caught my drift and asked me right there, no muss, no fuss, and I said yes. Senior year started. My new date was all the way over to his school on the other side of town. My stalker was in two of my classes and had taken the same lunch as me. I was hyper aware of him staring at me that day, but I didn't want to make a big deal about it. I knew he wanted my attention, and I refused to give it to him. Instead, I went about my life as usual. I made friends with the teachers who were lunch hall monitors so I could leave the cafeteria, effectively avoiding my stalker. I ate lunch in the theater hall with my best friend every day, I asked my biology and English teachers not to make me sit by him or work in groups with them. They agreed, if somewhat reluctantly. They, like pretty much everyone else, thought I was a dramatic cheerleader making up stories. I was a senior, and I really didn't want to deal with the bullshit of a crazy stalker anymore. Not that I ever wanted to in the first place. Homecoming was even earlier this year than last year. In English class, my stalker sat near two theater girls who usually walked to seventh period with me, 
and he turned around to ask them for ideas on how to ask me to homecoming. They were in the camp of classmates who were amused by my stalker's antics, so they wanted to rile him up and watch the fireworks. They also knew about the fuckboy I was talking to, because theater kids are the worst gossips ever, and they gleefully told my stalker that I already had a date. He proceeded to attempt to bite his finger off in class, which went about as well as you might think. Obviously, he did not succeed, but he did draw blood, and he terrified my two theater friends who had incited his instability. He stared at me the whole time, and I sat on the other side of the room and ignored him. I didn't care what he did. I refused to give him my attention. I would not be intimidated by him anymore. After class, my two friends came up to me. They told me the details of what just happened. Together, the three of us approached the English teacher. She fully believed me this time. He was moved into a different English class by the next week. I didn't have to worry about him after fourth period, because I skipped lunch every day. I was getting confident about my escape maneuvers. I forgot to mention the third and weirdest self-harm incident. After getting kicked out of English class, he desperately wanted my attention, so he got a hall pass out of his class one day and found mine. He walked to the trash can outside the door to my class, and I watched in horror and disgust as he had pulled a tooth out and held his face over the trash can, spitting out blood. I know I said I wasn't giving him attention anymore, but the kid just ripped out a part of his body. I feel like I'm allowed to be terrified. Then, my usual hall monitor was gone, and I got stuck in the cafeteria. I had been out of lunch for so long that I'd forgotten my stalker was in the same one until I accidentally made eye contact with them, staring at me from across the room like some kind of grudge ghost. The second I saw him, he started speed walking across the room to my table. I ignored him, hoping he was just trying to psych me out, but it didn't work. He sat down in the seat next to mine. I was freaking out. I looked at the girl on the other side of me and begged her to get him out of here. She simply laughed at me. A year before, I would have kept quiet and dealt with my discomfort for fear of people hating me. But I was a year older and already contracting senioritis. So I stood up, grabbed my backpack, and stomped out of the lunchroom. The hall monitor stopped me asking me where I was going and if I had a hall pass. I said I was going to see the crisis counselor, and he let me go, probably because he didn't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. I walked directly to the counselor's office, signed in, and found myself sitting in her office a few minutes later. I told her the whole story from the beginning. I'd been to her office once before, and she shooed me away, saying I was being too dramatic. This time, she didn't. Instead, she spent the greater half of the hour I was there, asking why I hadn't come to her when this all started. When I finally got to address the actual problem, her first question reaffirmed my fears. She asked me, after I told her about the self-harm and threats and general creepery, what about him made me so opposed to dating him? I thought I was going to scream. I had a gut feeling that the truth wouldn't get me anywhere, and I needed action. I didn't care how I got it done, but I needed him out of my life, and definitely out of my classes. So, knowing full well her attachment to Jesus, I pulled the saving myself for Jesus card. I put all those Sundays being forced to go to church to good use, and it worked. She stopped asking me why I waited. Why not just date him, and ask me what would make me feel safer? I told her to get him out of my schedule, and she said she'd look into my options. Within a few days, I was called back to her office. She'd gotten him placed in another lunch period, but biology was only offered fourth period, and both of us needed it to graduate. I still considered this a victory. I only had to see him for 50 minutes each day. She told me to come talk to her whenever I needed someone to lean on. She would make sure my teachers understood. Fun fact, junior year, my best friend was sexually assaulted by an adult man. When she left class, mid-panic attack, 
to go see this crisis counselor. She was told to pull herself together and get back to class before she missed anything important. My stalker found new methods of seeing me. My best friends didn't make the cast of Winter Musical, but I did. I didn't realize that I'd been isolated until my stalker joined the crew and regularly tried to intimidate me. He would drill holes in set pieces that didn't need work because I was sitting near them and he wanted to watch me flinch. He would steal the props I used and hide them in the shop, so I had to be near him to retrieve them. My new crush and I were co-dance captains, and she convinced her friend, the set head, to keep my stalker off stage at all times. After musical ended in spring, my new crush told me she heard my stalker was getting angry about me, playing hard to get. I was hanging out in theater hall with a few crew kids, getting ready for one act play, when one of them pointed at me, shocked, and went, You're saucy. He told me he'd seen pictures of my backyard. I was confused and weirded out, so he explained that my stalker had showed him pictures of my backyard and porch. I asked to see them, and he said he didn't have the pictures, he'd just been shown them by my stalker. I didn't really believe him, and he could tell, so he said, You have a big bay window in your living room, a bunch of bikes on your back porch, and a big ass rose bush. It was an accurate description. I don't know for sure how to explain that, but I've theorized that my stalker had, at some point, been in my backyard before we adopted our purebred Doberman. The dog had freaked out in the middle of the night a few times, when we brushed it off. Now, I wasn't so sure. My bedroom was in the front of the house, so I tried to reassure myself by thinking that he hadn't seen me changing or anything really scary, but it didn't really help. My best friend was disowned by her mother and stepdad, and within a week, she was shipped off to live with her biological father. I told myself I could survive the next four months and graduate, and then I'd never see my stalker again. I persuaded my parents, as prom and graduation approached, that I only wanted one present, my best friend. They paid for her plane ticket both ways, and flew her home to be my date to prom. I kept her a secret so I could surprise her other friends when she showed up at prom to dance with us. My stalker only briefly entertained the thought of asking me to prom, which I later discovered was the cheer captain's doing. I guess she finally started to realize the full effect of her actions because she told him he needed to leave me alone. I didn't know what else she said, but he went eerily silent in the weeks leading up to prom. He still came to the last play of the year, but he didn't film me this time. He waited for me outside the auditorium afterwards, but I was with other people on our way to cast dinner and he didn't try anything. At prom, my friends were elated when they saw my best friend had returned. We danced, talked shit, and had a great time together. It was honestly one of the best moments of my life when they walked in and saw her. Of course, my stalker tried one last time to change my mind. My friends and I were sitting alone at one of the tables together, laughing and catching up, and I saw my best friend's expression turn into a glare when someone walked up behind me. I turned around to see my stalker waiting behind my chair. I stood up and said, as calmly as possible, that he wasn't welcome here. I was also 17 and pissed off and feeling unstoppable, so I tacked on. If you ever speak to me again, I'll rip your dick off. It was the last thing I ever said to him. My best friend flew away again. We all graduated and everyone went their separate ways for college. I saw my stalker again at the first homecoming after I graduated high school, but he didn't talk to me, he just stared at me the whole game. Later, he showed up to my sister's fall play at her alma mater. He asked a cast member where she was and if I was there. Luckily for me, the cast member was one of my littles, and he told my stalker he needed to leave immediately. I guess this story has a happy ending. I got away in one piece, with no foreseeable appearance of my stalker in my future. The worst part, looking back, was somehow being
being at fault for everything. To this day, people from my high school reference this whole ordeal as that time you wouldn't date that poor shy kid. I can't even appreciate red roses anymore. To my dad, I do, in fact, like boys. I just like girls too. But for the sake of the subreddit and my happiness, homecoming date from hell, worst set crew member ever, and bringer of tea, roses, and junior mints, let's not meet again. Several years ago, I was in a bit of a financial pickle. I was 21, with a shitty job history, a shitty job, and shitty credit. My living situation went sideways, and I had temporarily moved back home with my folks. As anyone who has ever had to move back home as an adult will tell you, this was a terrible, horrible situation. I was in a rush to get back out on my own, which is why when my best friend told me that an apartment had opened up at her shady-ass apartment complex, I actually jumped at it. If you're from around here, then you'll know that every apartment complex in town is kind of a shade star. But for those of you not from here, this place is a shady non-town outside of another non-town with more liquor stores than any other establishment and several apartment complexes with no credit checks and same-day move-ins. A couple months went by, and while the cops did occasionally show up in our parking lot, and you had to watch your step for more than one broken bottle. It wasn't the worst place to live. I worked the night shift at a large retailer, shuffling around freight in the back, hating every minute of every shift. So one night, while I trudged up and down a ladder like a zombie at work, my cell phone fell out of my back pocket at the top of the ladder. I grabbed it, obviously missing, and died a bit as I saw it smack the ground and go black. No amount of restarting or shaking could fix it. The LCD was completely shot. Fuck, I thought to myself, and decided this was good enough reason to go home mid shift. Driving home at 3am on some random weekday, I turned onto the dark back road that led to my apartment building. I saw something faintly up ahead in the road, and immediately think it's someone's dog. I pulled up slower praying that I wasn't coming up on someone's dead pet, and I saw that there was actually a teenage boy laying on the side of the road, waving. There was a bike laying in the dirt next to him. Holy shit. The kid saw me and jumped up, weaving toward the driver's side of my car. Now, I've made a lot of poor decisions at this point in my life, but thankfully I hadn't gone completely brain dead. I suddenly thought of all the warnings to young women, about how serial killers and stuff would lure girls in by playing to their kind hearts. I locked the car doors, but cracked the driver's side window. Are you okay? What happened? Let me get some help. I got hit by a car. They fucking left me. I need help, the kid said. He looked dazed and was scuffed up, but something about him also set my nerves on edge. I'm gonna call for help, okay? I grabbed at my cell phone and then remembered the damn thing was basically useless due to its ladder plunge. My cell phone is broke, but I live nearby here, okay? I will get help. I hoped he didn't think I was lying, but then I didn't care. The kid slammed his hand against my car. Just let me in. I need help. Now. I promise. I will get help and come back. Everything will be okay. I felt torn. I wasn't going to let this kid into my car, but at the same time, I couldn't blame him. If I was scared and hurt, I would probably be frantic too. The kid slammed his hand against the car again, and I started driving. I hadn't been exaggerating. It was a 30 second drive to my apartment. I didn't have a landline, and I didn't want to somehow lead this kid to my empty apartment with no way of calling for help. I saw my best friend's car parked in her spot and immediately was thankful for the stroke of luck. I ran up the steps to her apartment and began banging on the door. Roy answered the door, probably expecting a crazy person, and was immediately even more alarmed to see me. What's going on? 
why aren't you at work? I breathlessly explained that some kid had been hit by a car off the back row, but my cell phone wasn't working. I needed him to come back with me. Melanie, my best friend, emerged from her room, sleepy and equally confused. Roy immediately took charge, told us both to get into the car, and drove us back to the boy. The kid was still there, waving us down. Roy, a large man, Mel and myself all got out of the car. Help, I need help. I'm here to help. My friend saw you and came and got me, okay? Calm down. I got jumped by this gang man. They beat me up and stole my backpack and rode off. The kid said frantically. I immediately became alarmed. That's not what he told me at all. I looked at Mel, my face clouding over. I thought you got hit by a car. Why did the gang jump you? I asked. What? Yeah, they beat me up and then someone hit me with the car. Plausible. I was still confused though. Roy also seemed wary of this change in story. Listen, man, let me call an ambulance, okay? Can you tell me your name? The kid loses his shit. He screwed his face up and clenched his fists, hitting the side of his head. No, 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 no. Just let me in the car, man. Just take me to your house. Roy was done. That's not happening, kid. I'll call an ambulance and the police. And I can wait with you while they get here. But we can't bring you back with us. The kid slapped the side of his head some more. And then, in the most disturbing thing I've ever seen, grabbed fistfuls of his shaggy hair and began pulling it out of his scalp. This sound is still the most disgusting and alarming thing I've ever heard. Roy gave Mel and I the get the fuck out face. We jumped back into the car. I'm calling the police, okay? I will tell them you've been hurt and you need an ambulance. Roy began dialing and the kid began stomping around and screaming. Take me to your house. Just let me get in the car. Why won't you take me home? Fuck you. Fuck you. The kid stood in the street, blood trickling from where he'd torn his scalp. Roy got back in the driver's seat and spoke with the cops as the kid raged outside. He then came to the window, staring so intently at us that I felt my skin had shriveled up and fallen off. He began kicking the tires, and Roy, clearly over it, drove off, the kid grabbing frantically at the back of the car. Roy drove past our turn, around Peter's Creek twice to avoid leading the kid to the apartment, and then back down our road. The kid was gone. The bike. The kid. Just gone. I have no idea where he took off to, but clumps of his hair were still in the road. We never saw that kid again. We searched the papers and the internet to see if he'd been picked up, or if any other strange things had taken place that night. But nothing else ever showed up. What confuses me still about it all is why he would demand to come back with all three of us. One person could obviously be easily overtaken. But what the hell were his plans for all three of us? This happened to one of my best friends and I back in 2017, and I feel like it's worth sharing. For a bit of backstory, my best friend Elise was dating a guy named Mark in 2016. They broke up right as New Year's was approaching. I've known Elise for over a decade, and we didn't talk much while they were together. I ran into them once at a local coffee shop, hugged her and was chatting away while Mark stared at me in disgust as if Elise wasn't allowed to talk to her friends. At the time, I thought nothing of it, assuming he was just antisocial. I had no idea he would go on to ruin an entire year of my life. It's really fuzzy as to how Mark got in contact with me specifically. I believe Elise posted about her breakup, and I offered my support publicly. So he targeted me. It began on New Year's Eve. He started messaging me on Instagram over and over, threatening me. I was having a get-together with my then-boyfriend, two of my now ex-best friends, 
and now my ex-best friend's boyfriend. I remember seeing my notifications blowing up and ignoring it. Everyone else seemed more concerned than I was. I brushed it off until late the next day. I checked my phone and I had dozens of DMs from Ma, as well as a few public posts that he targeted Elise and I in, calling us every name in the book and claiming I was the reason they broke up. I answered his DMs, asking why he was targeting me. That was the biggest mistake I ever made. After some angry messages from him, he blocked me and I thought it was over. I also had some missed calls from Elise, so I finally contacted her and asked her what was going on. She frantically told me that Mark was a dangerous man and that he's been tormenting her since the day they became a couple. He would throw her around his apartment, leaving awful bruises that she sent me photos of. He would threaten to end himself if she left him, and he even threw a hissy fit at the tattoo shop because they wouldn't have to release his first and middle name over his eyebrow. He got Crybaby instead. Fitting. Elise also informed me that Mark had went to jail before meeting her for domestic abuse. He stabbed his ex-girlfriend in the leg and was only behind bars for a month before his dad bailed him out. With this new information... I was terrified. Elise told me where he lived, and it was directly behind the coffee shop I mentioned earlier. I frequented that building and that part of town in general. That'll come into play later. I eventually calmed myself down and forgot about it, until he got my phone number. I still don't know how he got it, but I woke up to 30 plus messages from him one day, and I was horrified. His messages included threats to kill himself if I didn't help him and Elise get back together, threats to kill me, cries for help, him blocking my number and then unblocking it just to start the cycle all over again. I, being very naive and not wanting to be held responsible if he actually killed himself, did not block him. I asked him to leave me alone and if he wanted a number to a hotline where he could get some help. He pretended to calm down for a bit. I gave him the number after many messages from him, saying how much he missed Elise, but also wanted to kill her. I told her immediately and pushed her to go to the police. She didn't. He conditioned her to believe that she would get into trouble if she reported him. This went on for months. I usually didn't respond, and when I did, he seemed to chill out for a bit. I'm skipping ahead to a particular night where Elise and I were hanging out at my house. We were chatting away when my phone started to light up. I ignored it and kept talking because I didn't want to be rude. Elise peeked at my phone and said, It's Mark, look. Sure enough, Mark was bombing my phone with threats to slit his own throat because he knew Elise was at my house. Calling us both names and claiming it would be our fault if he died that night. I didn't answer, but what came next is something that still haunts me to this day. He sent me a video. Being curious, I clicked on it, Elise watching over my shoulder. It was a video of Mark's arm, a huge gash going down the middle. He was fake crying in the background, saying, You made me do this. I fucking hate you, Bo. He clenched his fist over and over to make the blood gush out. Elise and I were so in shock that we watched the entire 50 second clip, despite how disturbing it was. I immediately called our local police station. Elise gave them his address and an officer came to my house to view the video and then take some notes down. While we waited for the police to arrive, Mark posted the gruesome video to his Instagram and unblocked Elise and I just to tag us in it, claiming we told him to do it. Being a conventionally attractive guy with the e-boy aesthetic, the girls that swooned over him commented some pretty harsh things about us and kissed his ass like crazy. He was admitted to hospital that night, and I wish they kept him. The harassment continued the second he got out. I'll time travel a bit more now to a few months later. Mark hadn't let up, and Elise and I were still very close. We had a friend, Kayla, 
visiting from across the country. She also had a run-in online with Mark and hated him, but she wasn't afraid of him. She was always carrying more than one weapon, some pepper spray, and she knew how to fight. So she suggested we go take a walk in the part of town he lived in. She wanted to visit that coffee shop, see some of our small businesses, and then grab dinner at a pizzeria. But Lisa and I reluctantly agreed. We parked in front of the coffee shop, grabbed some drinks, and started walking down the road. Within about five minutes, Mark drove by on his motorcycle. Elise and Kayla were immersed in conversation as I trailed behind. I looked up and made eye contact with Mark. Elise and Kayla noticed him too as he was speeding off. Kayla assured us he wouldn't get anywhere near us with her around, so we kept walking. Mark began circling the block we were on with his bike. As we crossed to the next block, he switched to that block and circled it too. On the third block was the pizzeria place. Their walls are all glass, all see-through of course. We went in and were seated in the corner, right next to the glass. We sat there for about an hour and a half, eating, talking, and sipping on soda. Mark circled the restaurant the entire time, and we did our best to ignore him. Once we were finished and got up to leave, Mark sped off, and we didn't see him again that evening. Some time passed by, and Mark began riding by Elise's house every night. Within a week, he started doing the same to me. I told my parents and my stepfather, who kept a close eye on our street. My mom always made sure our doors and windows were locked, shades were shut, and all that stuff. Before going to bed, my dad would even do a nightly patrol where he would drive around my street for a few minutes on his way home from work, since he no longer lived there. He would call me and let me know the coast was clear as he was leaving. I still woke up almost every night to the sound of his motorcycle engine revving outside of my house. We had no proof of this to show the police, because he was somehow doing this without a trace, so we didn't even bother reporting it. At the end of 2017, Mark took his motorcycle and sped off to California to avoid the legal trouble he'd gotten into here. Elise and I were relieved, to say the least. He still harassed us from time to time, but he never came back. We stopped hearing from him after a while, and we thought nothing of it. Fast forward one last time to September of 2019. Elise and I were out and about, enjoying the sunshine, when she got a phone call. Mark was dead. He had died right after his calls and messages to a stop. He got into it with his new drug dealer in Arizona and pissed them off enough for them to shoot him. He died instantly. He also caught two more domestic violence charges in California and Arizona and was also on the run from his warrant. His father told everyone it was an accidental overdose because Mark was known for abusing Xanax and other miscellaneous drugs, but really, it was to cover up his sociopathic son's ass. I'm not sure if Mark's death was his karma or some higher being protecting us and all the girls he's hurt before and would hurt in the future, but he's gone. We never have to worry about our safety because of him ever again. Although... Seeing photos of him does still give me the creeps. Ma, I don't know where you are, but this world is better off without people like you. I am so glad you're gone. So at the start of the year, we were introduced to our teachers. All of them were good teachers, except Miss Say. So we went through classes, and in each one we got those cheesy beginning of the year introductions. It was quickly clear her class would not be normal health class, as evidenced by the fact that during her introduction, she went off about how terrible her divorced husband was. So classes started picking up, and her insecurities somehow kept making it into lectures. One day, a few weeks into school, she just stopped showing up to class consistently. You know, her job. Now, at this point, 
Everyone was cutting her some slack because she was a single mom, but it just got worse. We would have to do whole units from a workbook with improvised substitutes. This culminated when Miss C missed two weeks of school for no apparent reason. Most of the class could see her mental deterioration. Me and some friends in class started noticing some form of distress from Miss C. More and more stuff about her personal life would leak into lectures that she was there for. Suddenly it came to a head. She suddenly became distant and developed a tough shell around her. Missy actually started coming to class consistently too. She started bringing her kids to class. I have a hunch she started doing this to help justify her inactions to her employers. One day she just sort of broke down in class about how horrible her husband was for not taking equal responsibility for their kids. It was a bad joke at this point. How long would Miss C last before being fired? Unluckily for us, it was too long. We just sort of endured lectures from this mentally unstable woman. Mind you, she was doing a fine job at suppressing traits associated with that around other school employees. One day we come in and she wasn't in class, breaking her streak of actually coming. We got our answer of how long she would last. A counselor walked into the room. Everyone knew what was up. She was gone. What had gone down exactly? She walked into her ex-husband's house on the Sunday before that class period. Her excuse to her ex was to deliver cold medication to her kids. After threatening to call the cops after a home invasion, she locked herself in the bathroom. She called the cops and unlocked the door to the bathroom. She then walked over to her coat, pulled out a gun, and opened fire on her ex's girlfriend, killing her. Mrs. C was then pinned until cops showed up. That wasn't her first offense either. Suspiciously close to the time when she hardly showed up to her job, she had several assault charges against her that she somehow managed to keep a secret from her job as a teacher. Weirdly enough, students who didn't have her as a teacher didn't take it seriously. It took less than 30 minutes after that that information was made public to the students in general for them to make a meme page about the incident. Weird how that worked. It got taken down. It was the summer of 87 and I was 4 years old. I remember this like it happened yesterday. I used to live in a small town in southern Indiana in 87. The schools were shut for the summer break. Me and my cousin, who'd frequent us another city a hundred miles away, went out to play on scorching summer afternoons. We'd found this massive pile of construction sand at a nearby site where we'd spend most of the time making sandcastles and such. Right next to this massive pile of sand, was a large water tank built with poured concrete and filled to the brim with water. Me and my cousin, when we'd be bored with the sand, would sometimes sit by this large tank and look at the tadpoles, which my older cousin convinced me were small fish. Neither of us could swim, and being cautious even at that age, never ventured too close to the tank. That day, for some reason I do not recall, my cousin had to head back to his home 100 miles away rather abruptly, cutting short his stay with us. I, being the only child, feeling lonely, with nothing else to do, decided to head to the construction sand pile. There was this other kid, a bit older than I was, who I'd never seen before. He was sitting by the water tank and chucking a piece of rope with a stick tied to one end into the water, and he would pull it back. I simply loved this toy he fashioned out of rope plus a stick. I asked him if I could join him. For sure, he said. He made up rules of a new game on the spot. You sit at the other end of the tank. I'll chuck the stick end of the rope at you, holding the rope end. If you manage to catch it, then you win your turn. If it hits the water, you'll lose a point. Deal? Who could say no to this? So yeah. We started this game. I think I caught it a few times, 
Some other times the stick landed in the water. He was losing, and he kept shortening the throws, so I had to keep reaching in for the stick. One fateful throw, I landed in the water. It was too sudden. I didn't realize what was happening. I was in the water, struggling to get out, trying to hold my breath and flailing my arms. Luckily, I managed to get hold of a rung on one of the corners of the tank, and I managed to climb out of it. The other kid was nowhere to be found. He came back about 20 minutes or so later. Oh, you managed to come out? I looked at him, fuming. Did you get lost? I remember asking him angrily. Oh, I just went to pee, he said nonchalantly. I never thought you'd make it out. The water is deep. Did you not try to find grown-ups and tell them that I was drowning? He just shrugged. For a long time, I remembered this incident, every detail, what I wore that day, except something else came to light, rather unexpectedly years later, when I was talking about this with my dad. Yeah, I know. How would it have bothered you so much, feeling betrayed by your own cousin, when you were drowning? Yeah, years later, I realized I had processed every bit of that incident and changed one crucial aspect in my head. There was no strange kid that day. It was my own cousin. My partner in crime, every summer break, that for some reason, only known to him, decided to let me drown, or fend for myself. I got in a pretty bad fight with my boyfriend while I was staying at his house one night, and he asked me to leave. I drove around crying and finally settled on parking in this huge open parking lot in the front of the Dollar Tree to get my bearings. It was pretty late, around 2am, and there were a few cars in the lot. I chalked it up to people going to the 24-hour CVS nearby. I was crying pretty loud in my car for a few minutes until I heard tapping on my window. I stopped crying and looked up. A woman was gesturing for me to roll down my window. I froze and kept the window up, and she started signing and speaking to me. She told me to stop crying and keep my chin up. She said she could see I was in a lot of pain, and that she could understand pain because she's deaf. I found it kind of reassuring that she said God sent her to speak to me, and she was a heaven-sent angel. She told me to open my door and let her come in to talk to me. I'm not very religious and was really wary of her intentions. I got a really bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I locked my doors while she kept trying to convince me that God put her and I in that place at the time on purpose so she could help me. She kept pleading for me to open my door and I shook my head. I started my engine and peeled out there as fast as I could. I sped to my parents' house in the next town over and called my boyfriend. He met me and we reconciled. Since then, I have never told anyone this story because I felt like it was a bad move on my part to park in a terrible part of town in the middle of the night just to wallow. Later on, I remembered that my brother's friend got shot in his car in that parking lot a few years ago. Moral of the story. Find a safe place to cry, friends. A couple of weeks ago, my mom was coming back from the store at around 10 p.m. She got herself a pack of cigarettes and was hanging out with a friend of hers as she did so. On their way back, they came across Jeremy. It was a guy they'd both met, and even I had seen him a couple of times. Nothing major, just an acquaintance we barely spoke to. Though he was either high as hell this time around, or drunk, or both. I don't know. I do know this wasn't how he usually acts. Jeremy was angry over something. He came up to them and started screaming about wanting to fuck them. He then pulled it out in public. After both my mom and her friend tried to just walk out of the situation, 
he started attacking my mom. Both my mom and her friends started fighting back. They managed to get him to stop. They made their way back to the house where I currently am, unaware of what the hell was going on. However, note that I said stop, not leave. He lived in the same building as I do and was following them from a distance away. So they both made their way upstairs when my mom realized she left her keys inside. Nothing new. She's pretty forgetful and I'm generally here to open the door when she does. The problem being, Jeremy made his way upstairs too, past where his floor is and to ours. He tried to fight her again. I opened the door to my mom shouting my name and being absolutely clueless as she entered and tried to close the door, but Jeremy pushed the door open before it could be shut. He made his way into our apartment. This is where I got involved. I grabbed a knife and threatened him to get out, which he did. I have no idea how he managed to get this impression, but he seemed to think I was trying to find him, because after we made sure to slam the door the exact moment he exited and locked it, he started screaming at the top of his lungs about how we were pussies and to call the police claiming he knows the landlord and can get him to delete any footage caught from outside of the building and the hallways inside. My mom, being a quick thinker, started recording him from the door as he banged and kicked it, trying to open it. Eventually, he left when he heard we were actually calling the cops. He would think this would be over, right? No. It keeps going. After a couple of minutes, he returns to the door with a knife. He started stabbing our door while screaming and insulting us at the top of his lungs, saying he will kill the cops too. The police can clearly hear him from the phone, and I think that's why they came this time round. The doors in this building are strong stuff, metal I think, I'm not quite sure. But while he made some light holes and scratches, he couldn't do much to it. So he shouts he'll be downstairs waiting for the cops, which we of course inform the cops currently on the phone of. And perfect timing, while he makes his exit, they make their entrance, both using two different elevators. Four officers knock on our door and we open up and told them what was going on. We told them what happened start to finish. While my mom showed the cops the footage she recorded, I was taking pictures of the damages to the door. The cops, clearly not wanting to be here, begrudgingly said to come downstairs with them. So my mom and I did, to which we heard screaming from the first floor. Bear in mind, we were on the fifth floor and heard him perfectly, though his screaming stopped really quick when four cops showed up, instantly went, oh shit, and he started playing nice with the cops. The cops were not having any of it, they arrested Jeremy right then and there. His friends were there, asking what he did, screaming and shouting at the cops, but they eventually ran off. Jeremy was taken away. I sent the damages of the door to the lawyers, and I don't know what happened about that. So this is where the story ends, right? No. Jeremy got off with a restraining order, though since he lived in the same building as us, we couldn't stop him from simply being in the building. He was only not allowed to talk to us or cause any problems. This did not last long. On my way to the store, maybe two weeks later, he and his friends were all outside of the building in a group, chatting and drinking. When I walked out, Jeremy instantly switched up the topic, saying, You see that kid? I'm gonna fuck him up. He got the cops on me. Fuck the restraining order. I wanted to get away from that as soon as possible but I had already left the building and would need to get close to the group I just finished taking my first couple of steps away from in order to get back inside. So, I quickly make my way to the store since I would be in public with people present. I end up just getting everything I need from the store while trying to call my mom to tell her what happened. She didn't answer. Great. And here's where I admit I was a bit dumb. I should have instantly called the cops, but I didn't. I didn't remember what Jeremy was wearing, and I am honestly a wreck with anxiety. I wanted to first see if the group was still there before I attempted to make the phone call. They weren't, and I quickly made my way upstairs and informed my mom, 
who calmed me down and got me to call the police. The exact same police as last time showed up, and thank God for that, since they were well aware of Jeremy being a nutcase from the last time. But this time, we had no proof other than what would just end up being a he said, she said scenario. So they had us sit in the hallway while they called their boss to make sure the arrest would be okay due to the previous history and restraining order. All the while, Jeremy was in the staircase, laughing and being extremely loud with his friends. Eventually the police got an okay from their boss, and we all made our way to the staircase. I tried to stay out of sight as much as possible, and once again they arrested him. Jeremy claimed to be unaware of what he was being arrested for, and his friends left once again. His sister, who was in her mid-twenties from what I could guess, was screaming though insulting them and saying he was being arrested for no reason. Jeremy was hauled away again, and I have no idea what happened. There were no calls from attorneys or the police, no nothing, though I ended up seeing him within the week, straying from eye contact with me or my family. He usually walks away the moment he sees us. I wish more came out of this, but I'm happy we are being left alone all the same, though he is always pissed at seeing me. I need to explain two things before I tell this story. First, I have a sleep disorder and I've had it my whole life. I sleepwalk. Nothing too dramatic, mostly just do everyday things while I'm sleeping. Open the fridge, put clothes in the washer without starting it, take the vacuum out of the closet, and set it in the middle of the room and leave. That sort of thing. When I was younger, this was an every night occurrence, but now, in my late thirties, this is now a once or twice a year thing. Second, I am native. I have a healthy respect for the stories of spirits my ancestors told. Many hunting trips, I would sit around the fire with my dad, listening to him tell stories of the tricks Wendigos play to try to lure you out to them. While I'm unsure if I believe the stories of skinwalkers and Wendigo, I don't tend to mess around, just in case. Shoot to roughly three weeks ago, my husband and I both work construction. We have hard, long, and rewarding days. Once dinner is over and planning for the next day is complete, the dogs have been taken out for the last time. Our heads hit the pillows and it's light out until the alarm sounds. We sleep like the dead. I'm pretty sure a war could break out in our bedroom, thundering tanks and all, and we would sleep right through it, only wondering in the morning where all the holes in the walls came from. Our bedroom is fairly good sized and has a small window in the corner. My husband likes to sleep with fresh air, so he takes the window side of the bed. This particular night though, something woke me up. I never wake up. The dogs were quiet. There was typical northwest weather, rain quietly tapping away, no thunder and no heavy winds. I looked around the dark and quiet room and nothing was out of place. The only noise besides the rain was my husband's box fan gently humming away. I was confused, but decided to adjust my blankets, flip my pillow, and go back to sleep. As I closed my eyes and took a deep breath to relax, I heard my husband. Babe, babe, come out here and give me a hand with the boys. Confused and still foggy from being woken up from a deep sleep a few seconds earlier, I opened my eyes to the pitch black of the room again. Rarely one of our three dogs will need to go out at night, and if he goes out, they will all go. We live in an incredibly rural area, and it's easy for them to get lost in the dark woods. Not a good thing when you have bears, coyotes, cougars, and whatever else on your property. Babe, babe, can you come out here and help me with the boys? He called again. A voice right against the half-open window. Not concerned, just demanding. Annoyed and groggy, I leaned up 
propping myself up on a stiff pile of blankets to look at the window. It was too dark to see him. The floodlight is on the other side of the house. Babe, come outside, my husband demanded. It was the third beckon that bothered me. He was never that pushy. If something was wrong, like one of the dogs wandered off, he would say that. It's happened before. He would say something like, Come watch these two real quick. I can't find Murph. Something like that. Something wasn't right. I was regaining my focus and shaking off the sleepiness, quite awake at this point. I knew it was him. My husband has a very distinct tone. He's a Sicilian from Queens and has a very deep, unintentional loud voice. It was at this moment, staring out the black window, I realized I wasn't leaning on a pile of blankets. The pile of blankets was breathing. I was leaning on my sleeping husband listening to him call to me from outside the window. Babe, come outside. The voice came again from the window. I put my hand down on my husband's face. He was there, asleep next to me, but his voice, or what I thought was him, was at the window. I lay down next to him, very close to him, and closed my eyes very tight. In moments like these, I'm the type to just try and pretend it's not happening. I didn't hear it again and spent the next half of the night trying to fight off the spookies. And at some point, I had finally fallen asleep. I told my husband about it the next morning after his, oh my god, you look like death comment. I hadn't slept well. He laughed it off as I had. Probably had a creepy sleepwalking thing. The thing is, when I have a sleepwalking event, I remember nothing. I don't recall dreaming, walking, or anything from those nights. No matter how hard I try, it's like a blackout. I am sure I was awake for this. Every time I think of it these past few weeks, I remember those hunting trips. Poking coals around in the fire with a stick, while my dad tells me his serious yet animated tales of when to go tricks to get you to come with them. As silly as it sounds, I think there's a Wendigo in my woods. I live with my boyfriend in a small fourplex in a very small town. I work at 6am and wake up about 4.30. About two weeks ago, during my morning routine, I noticed someone standing behind a dumpster 20 feet away. I know my apartment is the only one with lights on, and he's looking at my window, just watching for about five minutes when I notice a dog with a man. I just wrote it off, until today that is. This morning I left for work as usual, stepped out the main door and scanned the area. All clear. I walked the 10 foot to my car, buckle up and start my music. I back out of my spot and when I shift to drive, suddenly I see a man with a bucket on his head standing at the end of the walkway. They were within three feet of my car. We made eye contact and he pulled the bucket off of his head. The man stepped toward me. I panicked and floored it before he got closer. I'm honestly scared. I even told my boss that if I didn't show up or call that I was in trouble. I feel so scared. I'm going to be carrying a can of wasp spray to my car every morning at least, until the pepper spray I ordered arrives. The police and the landlord have been contacted, as well as the neighbors. About ten years ago, I was fresh out of college and trying to figure out what was next. I went to college on an athletic scholarship, and I was just as interested in enjoying my college experience as I was in completing it. I ended up with a communications degree, average grades, and no experience. I was working as a bouncer at a small bar in the casino. I worked at said bar Wednesday to Sunday from around 7pm to 3am. My job was to greet people coming in, check IDs, break up fights and remove people who got out of hand while maintaining a professional and friendly manner. 
There was a man that started coming into the bar on the off nights, Wednesday or Thursday when it was slow. He would come in both nights one week, then not come in again for three weeks or so. Then he would do the same thing always on the off nights. Usually he would talk to me a couple of times throughout the night when he was there. Just normal small talk. It was never awkward. He was always well dressed in a suit or at least a button up shirt and slacks. He was clean cut. Had an athletic build, no visible tattoos or piercings, and a shaved head. I'm not into men, but I would guess he was a good-looking man in his late thirties. Well, the last night I saw him, the conversation was a bit different. He came in on an off night like normal, and eventually came up to talk to me by the door. The conversation started off like normal, but eventually he asked me if I enjoyed what I did at the bar. I did the typical... It's not bad, and it's mostly easy. Dissembling that I felt was a polite conversation. He asked me how long I planned to be a bouncer, asked if I thought I made enough money, and eventually dragged out of me that no, I did not particularly enjoy being a bouncer, and I didn't know what I was going to do with my future. At this point, he looked me straight in the face and said, Well, you could kill people. While maintaining our eye contact, I paused and waited for some type of joke or smile or something that would turn this into a failed attempt at a joke. No, nothing. He seemed 100% serious. There was no smile, no joke, nothing but him staring at me, waiting for me to respond. And at this point, I told him the first thing that came to mind. I'm pretty sure I don't have the skill set for what I think you're suggesting. He said, yeah, but you could learn all that. Think about it. You could travel, work once or twice a month, and get paid really well. While strangely, at that point in my life, it was an intriguing idea. I immediately thought of some sort of police setup and all the shadowy hitman handler betrayal I've seen in every hitman movie ever. I told him, no, I don't think that's for me. He then said okay and left. I worked there for another year and never saw him again. I was in a hotel and happened to be completely alone. Here's some backstory as to why I was alone. Our TV is hooked up to an antenna so the channels we got were repetitive and boring. It also meant we didn't get Macy's Day Parade. To solve this issue, we went to a hotel relatively close to us. Unfortunately, my mom came down with a horrible illness a day or two before, so she couldn't join us. We also got our room upgrade to the one with a balcony. Remember this, because if the room was not upgraded, I don't think this would ever have happened. This happened the day we were checking out, so it was Thanksgiving Day. Our plan was to hang out the night before, wake up and watch the parade in the morning, then we would get home by the evening. It was around 8ish when the rest of my family, not including my mom, went out to run an errand that popped up. I, being lazy and not wanting to get ready just yet, opted to stay in the hotel room. Before he left, my dad said to double lock the door and always check the peephole should someone strange show up. He even did a practice run before he left. In some weird twist of irony, someone started knocking on the door not even five minutes after they'd left. Doing what my dad instructed, I checked the peephole. I expected to see my dad surprising me with another checkup, but the person who I saw looked nothing like my dad. I believe the man was very old, with grey hair that showed signs of balding. I specifically remember a small cardboard box he held in his hands. I remember thinking that it was some sort of an illegal substance, even at my young age. Fear set in as I stood there, unsure of what to do. Then I remembered what my dad said to me if this situation should ever happen. The man said, Are your parents here? No, they're down in the lobby, but will soon be up, I said. Why are they down in the lobby? At this point, I didn't know what to say. 
I'm sure now my dad meant to talk to them if the hotel staff, so I backed away from the door. In hindsight, I'm also sure he knew what my dad had told me. It would turn out his room was right next to ours. I ended up FaceTiming my mom. I had an iPad because I wasn't allowed a phone at the time. She contacted the rest of my family and said to get hotel staff on the line. I tried calling them, but they didn't pick up. Not wanting to annoy them, I did not call again. I know that was stupid of me, but I was young and didn't know how to handle this. While this was happening, the man began banging on my door with a new intensity and was yelling for me to let him in. With all the shouting, I could not hear my mom, so I went out onto the balcony. However, that spot didn't last. I soon went back over to the people to see what was going on. There was what I believed to be a security guard trying to help the man get into my room. The weird thing is, the key he was using didn't work for my door, so there was no way it could have been a master key this staff has. Not to mention, this hotel does not have security, just staff, and I don't remember him wearing a uniform. I walked back out onto the balcony, freaking out. That's when he went into his real room and began banging on the window screaming for me to let him in. Terrified, I ran into the bathroom and locked the door. That's where my dad found me. The man's excuse was that his son and his girlfriend were supposed to be staying in our room. That was blatantly untrue, and probably to save himself. I didn't look old enough to be in a relationship, and he should know that since he saw me. If it weren't for my dad telling me to check the door, I would have opened it to that stranger, and with the perfect timing of his arrival and his knowledge of a young girl being alone, I have reason to believe he was stalking us. Thankfully, I'll never know that outcome. We never did upgrade our antenna, but luckily live streams became a thing. I'm a 21-year-old female. I drive from Miami to Daytona Beach almost every other week. I make sure to fuel up before I start driving. But this one day, this one, this one unfortunate day, I didn't. I left Daytona around 12 a.m. driving back to Miami. I drive a black Mustang 40th anniversary. I was flooring it back home through I-95. The entire route was empty other than a few trucks and small cars here and there. I was jamming to some good music, not paying much attention to what was going on with my fuel tank. Around 2.30 to 2.45 a.m., the low fuel warning came up. I saw it and started looking for the nearest exit, which happened to be Boynton Beach. I have never been there and had no idea about how the area is. I took the exit and saw there's a Circle K right off the exit. I was a little relieved, because now, at least I wouldn't run out of fuel in the middle of nowhere. Now with barely any fuel left in my car, I pull up to this gas station. It's totally empty. I cannot even see a single car inside or even outside on the road. There were no people, other than one tall man in a red colored jacket, walking around the area near the side of the gas station store where all the parkings are but he was not very close to the pump I was at. I was a little scared, but I usually try to shake off my fear by telling myself it's nothing. This man at this point is looking at the ground, but kind of walking in the general direction of my car. I'm still inside the car, contemplating whether I should get out or stay in. Usually I would have just gotten out and fueled, not being scared, but that day, something in my gut told me to lock the door and wait inside until he either goes away or walks past my car. At this point, this guy is just a few feet away from my car, still not looking at me. I'm trying to tell myself, it's okay, he doesn't even care that I'm here, I should get out. But then, my worst fear comes to life. This man looks straight up at me and dashes towards the driver's side door. He tries opening it. 
It's around 3 a.m., with no other people in the general vicinity. I froze for a second and thought I was going to die. He pulled on the door handle several times trying to get it to open, but then I somehow got my senses back. I turned the car on and floored it. He didn't let go of the door handle until I started the car and hit the gas pedal. I'm so thankful that despite the low fuel, my car still started up and drove off. I had nothing on me to defend myself, nothing at all, other than a plastic fork I got from Panda Express earlier that day. I still can't get over the whole experience. It scares the living shit out of me. So this happened to me quite a few years ago, when I was about 17 or 18. I was working at a grocery store as a bagger most days after school. So one day, I'm doing my thing, bagging groceries, and this guy, who was probably in his early 20s, comes up and hands me a little slip of paper. He didn't say anything, and he leaves. I was in the middle of working, so I put it in my pocket and forgot about it. A few hours later, I remember it and read it. It's this really creepy poem about how he thinks I'm so beautiful and basically comes into that store just to watch me and is wondering if I've ever noticed him. It has his name and number at the bottom. I didn't realize how creepy it was at the time because I was young and flattered, so later that night, I messaged him. I had a boyfriend, so I thought it would just be nice to tell him that thank you but I'm sorry type of thing. I made the mistake of not mentioning my boyfriend outright in the first text. I just said thanks for the poem. Not even five minutes after I read the text, this guy adds me on Facebook. I'm assuming he just searched my phone number and found me, and he starts commenting on all my public profile pictures. He'd started asking me if I ever wanted to meet up, so I text him again and said sorry, but I actually have a boyfriend. The guy loses his mind, texts me all kind of mean things about how I'm actually the ugliest girl he's ever seen, and he just felt bad for me and all this stuff. He even said he was going to come to my work and teach me a lesson for being a tease. I never answered and he kept sending texts for days, until he must have realized I was not going to answer. I was paranoid going into work for like a year after that. Scared he would be there, but luckily, I never saw him again. A couple of years ago, I got a phone call in the middle of the night. It was around 2 a.m. I didn't check who it was. I was half asleep and said, Hello? When a deep voice said, I hope you're ready. I'm going to kill you. I was so unbothered, I responded. Well, I'll see you soon. I hung up and went back to sleep immediately. The next day, I was at school when I remembered what happened. I thought it was just a crazy dream, but who would just call someone and say that? I looked through my phone and saw that I did have a call at 2 something in the morning from an unknown number. I never figured out who called me, and nor did they call back. When I was around 20 years old, I was working at a beauty supply, located in a large plaza with a bunch of other businesses. I ended up walking by a cab, saw a hiring sign, and applied. I got the job. I kept the beauty supply job, and since these two businesses were in the same plaza, I created a schedule where I would work both jobs in one day, with an hour break in between shifts. Sometimes I was so tired because of the commute and two jobs that I would take that time to nap. I started moving my car next to a small parking area beside a Burger King. There were only three spaces and one was occupied by a van. So I would park on the far left, leaving one spot separating my car from the van. I did this almost every day for a couple of weeks. The van stayed in the same place the entire time. At this point, I basically lived at the plaza. I never saw anyone going in or out of that van. 
I arrived at the cafe one day to see caution tape around my napping spot, where the van was located. I asked my co-worker what happened, and they said police were called since the van seemed to be abandoned, and that they discovered a corpse in the van. I can't remember how long they said the person had been dead for, but I was napping next to a van with a corpse. I changed my shifts to start back to back, no more napping in between. This happened to me about 15 to 16 years ago when I was displaced in Las Vegas after Hurricane Katrina occurred. I was 9 years old at the time and I lived in this cul-de-sac of townhomes. Without sharing all the details, this was the first time I ever had a friend who lived in my neighborhood. So he and I would often hang out from early mornings to about 11pm or so. One night while we were hanging out, there was this ice cream truck that was passing around. It hadn't turned on the typical music you hear when a truck's approaching, but when I got near, it began to light up and play the music. My friend and I, who was about the same age, approached the truck to see what it had to offer. I decided I didn't want any ice cream, likely because I didn't have any money to buy any, but my friend wanted some. He explained what he wanted to the guy. When the guy suggested he get in the truck and pick out which flavor he wanted, and he would give him an ice cream for free. For some strange reason, my friend was actually going to get in the truck when I yanked his arm and screamed something. Immediately after, we ran to our parents and explained to them what happened. After this, we'd have to be inside by the time the sun set. I can't say for sure what would have occurred, but I'm thankful neither of us got into that truck. This happened a few years back when I worked at Starbucks. I was the opening supervisor, and our store was in a kind of rough area. I always tried to arrive a little early, and this day was no different. I pulled in before my co-worker had gotten there, but in the otherwise empty parking lot was a truck parked sideways across three spots. The truck is facing the parking lot exit. Already wary, as it's around 4.15am, and there were no working streetlights in the lot. I keep my doors locked and stay in my car. Not a minute later, a man gets out of the truck and walks up to my car, then knocks on my window. I crack the window an inch, and he starts telling me how he has to get to the airport and he's in a hurry, but his truck needs a push to start. He tells me specifically that I just need you to come push for my door. I'll be in the driver's seat and that'll give me the momentum I need. I don't know shit about cars, but that set off all the alarm bells in my head. Not to mention, if his car's having trouble, our airport was really far and only accessible by freeways. Not an easy trip for a struggling vehicle. I tell him I'll be happy to push the truck from behind once my co-worker arrives, but I refuse to get out before. He immediately blows up. He screams and calls me all sorts of names then storms back to his truck. He starts the truck up and speeds out of the parking lot. Never had anything come of it, but I'm still pretty sure I foiled some malicious plans of that guy. I'm grateful I'm enough of a morning person to be thinking clearly that early. This happened when I was around 17 years old, and is still happening now. At 17, I felt lost in the world and stuck in a job I disliked, with work colleagues that didn't like me. This had to do with my accent, as I was quite well spoken, so they thought I was a rich kid. It all started on a Friday after work. The factory I worked in had a half day on Fridays, so I would just spend the rest of the day wandering around the city I lived in. It had been a tough day of relentless mocking. I was reaching my breaking point. I went around the city looking for a new job. I visited the police recruitment center, the army, navy and air force centers, and even the international red cross. I just wanted to get away from it all. 
After a few hours, I had a bag full of career pamphlets and still no idea what to do with my life. I turned a corner and immediately saw a sign sitting in front of me. I can remember it so vividly now. It said, Free personality test. Are you curious about yourself? Come in. I then looked up at the building, and in a big fancy sign outside, it said, The Church of Scientology. Now before I continue, yes, I already knew about Scientology. However, I had a morbid curiosity about it. I had heard all the horror stories and goings on inside the church, but Tom Cruise was my favorite actor, and he seemed to have his life sorted out pretty good. My famous last words right there. So I went inside. I was immediately greeted by a very nice lady. She asked me how I was doing and what she could do for me today. I asked if I could speak to somebody about the church and the personality test. She smiled and said, I would be happy. Please take a seat and I will get you someone to speak to. After a minute, I was introduced to an older man named Alan. He was the head of my city Scientology Center. Alan took me to a small room to talk privately. When we entered, I immediately noticed the large picture of L. Ron Hubbard on the wall. We sat down and genially had a nice talk. I told him about how I was unhappy about where my life was going. I told him about how I wanted to leave, plus all the trouble I was having at work. He seemed genuinely concerned for me, and I felt like he wanted to help. After a while of talking, I agreed to do the personality test. He gave me the test and left the room, saying to give the test to the receptionist after I had finished. Two hours later, I finished it. I am not joking. That's really how long it took. It was around 500 questions about anything and everything. I handed it in to the receptionist. She told me it would take some time to process. In the meantime, Alan had told her to take me to their private cinema and show me a film. I thought it was just going to be some old room in the back with a TV on the wall. But no, they did indeed have a private cinema. It could sit around 50 people and had a large screen in the front. It did feel a bit weird, just being by myself in a cinema, owned by Scientology. But I bet that hasn't happened to many people. Or maybe it has. Anyway, I sat down and they played me a film. It was about 30 minutes long and consisted of a narrator explaining those strange feelings you sometimes get. With some mediocre acting following along. I remember a section about how much you doubt yourself, knowing you have a locked door but going back to check multiple times. At one point, the film showed how a past event that happened to your mother while she was pregnant with you could affect your life in a negative way. I also vaguely remember something about rotten eggs and how much an event involving them can hurt you. I know it sounds absurd, but in some ways, the film really made sense to me. When the film was done, I was taken to Alan's office and he told me my results. He told me I was extremely depressed, one of the most unmotivated people he had even met, lacking cognitive thinking, and I was a waste of talent. Now this made me very upset, but Alan said he could help me. He gave me about four books and a DVD. He told me to read the books and watch the film before my course. I asked, what course? And Alan told me he had signed me up to do a course at the center. He convinced me that if I didn't do this course, that my life would soon spiral out of control. He made me hand over quite a lot of money for this course, and then said I would receive an email about the course, which was in a month's time. I left the center, ran home, and immediately started reading the books I was given. This all happened over the weekend. I basically locked myself in my room and did nothing but read and reread those books. I watched the DVD over and over again. Over the next week, I began taking notes about myself and my family. I emailed Alan with questions and concerns. I started resenting my own mother for my life. I began to think that she was the problem, that everything bad that happened to me was the result of her. I started to treat her badly, swearing at her and did the best I could to ignore her. When I emailed Alan about my mother, he told me that if she was the catalyst for my problems, then maybe I should consider disconnecting from her. 
and I took that bullshit seriously. I made plans to totally leave her out of my life. A week before my course, I developed some kind of god complex towards everyone around me. What I read in those books told me what I could become. I saw everyone in my family as below me. I really became a truly spiteful person. Just days before my course, I was confronted by my mother and father. They said they were concerned about me and that they searched my room. My dad took out all of my Scientology books and the DVD. I was outraged. I screamed and cursed at my parents. I said horrible, wicked things to them. I told them how I was going to leave them and how I never wanted to see them again. Hours of arguing back and forth, tears and crying. However, in the end, they did convince me that the church was a bad place. They said if I was so miserable at work, I should have told them. And that is true. To this day, I can't believe I didn't say anything to them. Instead, I went to Scientology. That night, after the arguing had stopped, they sat me down and confronted me. I really couldn't believe it. After the way I had treated them for the past three weeks, they still cared for me. The next day I emailed Alan and told him I would not be coming back to the church. He quickly got back to me, asking me why, asking if it was my family, and if I was being forced not to go. However, I ignored him. The emails I received in the next few weeks were mad. He told me stuff like, I should leave my family now and I could stay at the church. He tried to convince me that it was all because of my mother. He even emailed me to say something along the lines of, he wouldn't be surprised if he read in the newspaper that I was found dead because I killed myself. I am very sure he crossed the line there but I just kept ignoring him. The strangest emails I got was one all in binary code. 00110101 this and that. I used a binary code translator, but it all came back as mixed up letters and numbers. None of it made sense. I eventually blocked it. However, it hasn't stopped. About two or three times a year, I will get an email from the church. It's either asking how I am, or asking about my family. When I get them, I immediately block the email address, but they just keep coming. It's always someone new, saying they heard about my case, and that they were worried for me. The whole reason I'm telling this is because I just got one the other day. I thought it would make a good warning. Please, I beg of you, do not go to a Church of Scientology center. If they can make me into a spiteful degenerate in just a few hours, then what can they do with a person in a few months or a year? If you're lost in life, sad or upset, then please talk to your family, friends, or a doctor. When you're down, don't let others make you into a monster. Take it from me. After this event, I got help, and I'm a happy and confident person now. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, and Alan, if you're listening to this, you made me into a monster. So, I'm currently going through a nasty divorce. I left my wife about four months ago and moved into a house by myself close to work. We have a four and a half year old daughter which I haven't been able to see for the last four months because my wife filed an injunction against me. Luckily, she recently came to her senses and dropped the injunction and now I have 50-50 timeshare with my daughter which starts next weekend. Well, this past weekend, my mom came to town to help me set up the new house because you know, I'm a guy and guys have no sense of decor, right? At least, that's how my mom thinks. And when it comes to me, she's right. We bought a twin bed for my daughter's room. Bought her Frozen-themed furniture and decor. We got a bunch of knickknacks to decorate the whole house. Candles, pictures, fake plants, rugs, and that kind of thing. We did everything we could to make it more homey. Before we bought all these new rugs and set up my daughter's room, 
I kept my cat's litter box in my daughter's room for the past four months while it was empty. After setting up her room, I moved the litter box to another empty bedroom. Well, my cat didn't like the fact her box moved. Apparently she had decided that that room was going to be her room and absolutely refused to use the litter box after it moved. Instead, she would go to the bathroom on the carpets any time my mom and I were out of the house. The entire weekend, the two of us cleaning the new rugs with strong cleaning products. Every time she would use the bathroom on one. Finally, I decided to put the litter box back in my daughter's room until I could figure out a solution. Trust me, this is relevant. Fast forward to Monday late afternoon. My mom's flight is at 6pm, so we leave the house, go out for one last meal, and I drop her off at the airport. I get home around 6.30pm to my newly furnished and decorated house. It definitely made me feel more at home. I had no plans that night, so I spent most of the night on the couch binge-watching movies and drinking scotch. Around 11.30, I was pretty hammered, and I stumbled to my bedroom, closed the door, locked it, and collapsed on my bed. I passed out instantly. Around 4.30am, I woke up to the worst smell I think has ever hit my nose. It was so bad, it actually pulled me out of my drunken sleep. My first thought was the cat took a shit on the rug again. I ignored it, rolled over, and tried to go back to sleep. But I couldn't. The smell was that bad. Finally, I got up, unlocked the bedroom door, and peeked out into the living room to see if she had left a surprise on the rug. Clean. I looked in my daughter's room, and my cat had indeed started using her litter box again, so the smell wasn't because of my cat. I shrugged it off, closed and locked my door, and again collapsed on my bed. I laid on my bed, staring into the darkness for about 30 minutes, trying to fathom what I was smelling. Maybe it was the combination of my cat's shit, and all the cleaning products we used over the weekend. Maybe a pipe burst somewhere. Did I forget to take the trash to the curb, and I was smelling all the shit we threw away the weekend? No matter what conclusion I came up with, none of it made sense. A little after five, I get up and walk to the bathroom, and I sit down on the toilet. I browse Reddit for a few minutes on my phone until I'm done. I flushed the toilet, then collapsed on my bed again, you know that draining sound the toilet makes after you flush it? I'm laying there on my bed, listening to the toilet do its drain cycle, until it finally stopped and I was in complete silence. That's when I heard it. A sniff, and the sound of someone clearing their throat from my closet. I don't know what happened, but I immediately jumped into survival mode. I jumped out of bed, grabbed my phone, unlocked my bedroom door, grabbed my car keys and bolted out the front door and jumped in my car. I started the car and backed out of my driveway and into my neighbor's driveway across the street. I shined my high beams at the house while I called the police. They were there within minutes. The cops approached my car and I told them there was someone in my closet. I sleep naked so the cops thought I was just some random drunk at first sight. But after two minutes of arguing, they went in to investigate. They were in there for what seemed like hours, and sure enough, they came out with a very skinny, obviously homeless man in handcuffs. They put the guy in the back of one of their cruisers and approached my car to ask me questions. Apparently this guy snuck in through the back sliding glass door while I was dropping off my mom at the airport. He admitted to looking for pills or something to pawn for pills when he heard me come home. He freaked out and jumped into my closet. The smell I was smelling was his terrible B.O. coming from my closet three feet away from me. This man was in my house the entire night. What if I didn't smell him and open my closet the next morning while getting ready? What if I had my daughter over that night? The whole thought gives me shivers. I've been working from home for about two years. Three weeks ago, 
I was asked to come into the office, and yesterday was my first day back working at home. We have one of those doorbell cameras, but it broke down. Since I'm home all the time, we haven't gotten around to fixing it or replacing it. We haven't taken it down either. I don't have a gate or anything in my house. It's just the driveway, then the door. I have a clear view of my driveway and front door from my bedroom window. At around 1pm, there was a knock at the door. I looked out of my window and saw a man. He was wearing a dark brown hoodie and jeans. He didn't look like he was expecting someone to open the door. He also pressed the non-working doorbell a couple of times. It seemed like he was paying more attention to the street, looking around kind of nervously. When someone knocks at my door and I don't know them, I will not answer the door. I just stay quiet until they leave. But this time, I got a weird feeling. It was like I had a heavy rock in my stomach, alarms going off in my head. I yelled, coming. He suddenly stood straight up and looked around some more, waited a few seconds, then walked away in a hurry. I looked at him until he disappeared out of my view. This was one of the moments that your instinct kicks in, and deep down, you know something bad may have happened, and cannot stop thinking about it. This morning, my nosy neighbor came by to tell me the week's gossip. It's my day off, so I was sweeping my driveway. Someone had broken into one house yesterday, Nothing was stolen, but the shower had been used. The kitchen was messy from someone cooking, the bed was unmade, and all the TVs were on. The horror was, the family pet had been killed. I don't live in a nice neighborhood. A lot of my neighbors have cameras and alarm systems for this reason. I couldn't stop thinking about this guy knocking. According to some neighbors, they saw this weird guy around the block supposedly selling some cleaning products and supplies, but he only carried a clipboard around. I went to the neighbors that lives across the street from me. I know they have security cameras. I was hoping maybe they caught something. So for three days, this guy knocked on my door at the same time every day. I guess his MO was to make sure no one was home all week and then break in. What would have happened if I had stayed quiet like I normally do when someone unknown knocks at my door? He would have probably come in with me in the house. It creeps me out. When I was walking back into my house, my doorbell caught my attention. It was full of some gunky stuff, kind of like someone attempted to cover the camera. I guess I should definitely replace that. There's talks of some neighbors having video evidence. Others say they actually saw this guy. It's all still going on. I'm sure I'll know more about it in the next few days. I'm feeling really anxious. I've been thinking about going on a trip to visit my family, just to get away for a bit. I don't live in the US, so the way the police handle matters here is different. The family pet was a large dog. Neighbors say he started barking loudly at some point during the day, and then suddenly stopped. So that may be the reason why he was killed. I had just returned from a walk around the neighborhood when my fiancé and I saw the most peculiar and creepiest thing. There is a neighborhood cat that will sometimes follow us on walks, and tonight she came out to walk with us. We were turning back to head home when a man up the street came walking down with his German Shepherd in our direction. The cat froze on someone's driveway, giving clear signs that she was not okay with the man and his dog approaching her. But still, he walked towards her more. We hung around a house over, wondering what he was doing as he commanded his dog to sit in front of her, only a couple of feet away. They both just stared at her. The man was silent. The dog was growling and she hissed. I had a very bad feeling and did not want to walk on until he left, but he continued to stand there with his dog, almost to intimidate the cat. My fiancé then told him to leave the cat alone, and he didn't once turn to look at us. Instead, he kept staring at the cat. We waited a few more minutes and then repeated, leave that cat alone. The man very slowly backed off, said nothing to us, 
across the street and then walked back in the direction he came from. We both felt he was up to no good, especially since he never said a word to us, not even to mind your business or I'm not hurting the cat. It's almost as if we weren't there or something because he was not weirded out by us watching him. I am from a small town in Northern California. It's a very tight-knit community with low crime and a high average income compared to the surrounding areas, so high-profile events happen infrequently. But when they do, news and gossip spread like wildfire. This event happened to me when I was in middle school, around 2009. One week, I remember suddenly everyone was talking about the mummy that was found in a house in our town. To keep what I'm sure is a long story short, an 86-year-old woman had died in her home. Her adult daughter had kept her propped up in her chair, in the same position she died in. Four years. Some reports say two years. Some reports say up to five years. The police and investigators were unsure of what she actually died of. The last in-person sighting of her was around four years before her body's discovery. Her social security checks were being cashed up until the police were called for a wellness check. Her adult daughter, also a resident of the town, became the main suspect. Not for murder, but for interfering with a dead body and for fraud. The thing was, her daughter had actively been going in and out of her mother's house for years, keeping up the exterior, tending to the garden, paying the bills, making excuses and fabricating stories for why no one had seen her mother all while her mother's remains sat in the living room, decomposing. And while the daughter was investigated for various offenses, she was never arrested or charged. I'm truly not sure why. Perhaps money. Perhaps she knew the right people in the police department. But it was never followed through with. The truly crazy part of this story is that soon after this discovery, the daughter ran for city council. Everyone knew exactly what happened. But she was loudly and proudly vying for a seat in our town's government. She moved into her mother's house and planted a vote sign on the front lawn. She didn't win, but continues to run in each election to this day. Whenever I'm home for the holidays, I often see her out on the front lawn of her mother's house, watering plants, always wearing a cardigan buttoned up to the chin, and a black sun hat. No matter the weather. And the best part, the platform she runs on for the city council bids, extending aid to the community's elderly. When I was 17, I lived in a small village of 1,200 people. Usually every year, there's a local town festival, and all the adults go for dinner and party at the town hall. That's why they perform some kind of acting and make fun of the year that just passed. Usually this is in February, so it's snowy and dark pretty early. When the festival is on, all the 13 to 17 year old girls are booked for babysitting. Me and my two friends went for a drive around town since you have to be 18 to go to the party. So we just drove around, giving people a lift to the party to earn some extra cash. It was a good idea since there is no taxi rank in this town. It was a great way to earn some extra pocket money. We'd been driving for a couple of hours, and of course we knew where everyone lived. Some of the adults asked us to drive past their house to make sure everything is alright, and give the parents some extra comfort. In one of the older neighborhoods in the town, there were low floodlights, so we just drove slowly and one mom who we gave a lift earlier lived there. She was a widow with three young children, two, four, and eight, if I recall correctly, and her niece was babysitting, who was 15 at the time. The time was around 10 p.m., and when we drove into this neighborhood, which is surrounded by hill and some cliffs, my friend swore that he saw something move in her garden. We thought little of it, and just said it was probably a cat or something. We kept driving to the other end of town, but my friend in the back seat said that he had a bad feeling. He wanted to drive back to her house and check if we could see some footprints in the snow. When we got back there, we parked the car and looked over the fence. 
There were fairly new footprints in the snow. We all looked at each other and decided to follow the trail. The trail went past all the bedrooms, but near every window the footprints were turned to it. It was like someone was trying to peek in. Eventually the trail ended on the street. We lost it where the snowplow had been earlier in the night. We chatted if we should go get the mom from the party or ring the doorbell to check if everything was alright. Since none of the tracks led to the back door or the front, we decided that two of us would stay in the neighborhood, remaining hidden and monitoring the house. The driver would drive back to the police station and pick up the mom on the way back. That was a good call. Maybe five minutes after the driver left, we saw someone lurking behind one of the garbage cans a couple houses down. He wasn't moving. He just sat there with a cigarette. We monitor from a distance since he couldn't see us. After a while, he stood up, looked around, and started to creep to the house where the mom lived. He walked over to the back door. Without thinking, me and my friend ran through the two gardens that were between where we were and the mom's house. We wanted to catch him trying to enter the back door. We arrived just in time. He was trying to open the back door. When we shouted to him, he made a run for it and we followed. He ran down the street to get some speed ahead of us, but me and my friend were both athletics, so we were gaining on him fast. This was the most intense moment of our life. I remember the only thing I was thinking was not to slip and lose momentum. The end of the street was approaching, and the next turn would be a 90 degree angle to the right. So instead of slowing down, I cut the corner so I could intercept him as he would lose speed by taking the turn. My calculations were wrong, and he managed to take the turn without losing much speed. I spent too much energy sprinting in 12 inches of snow. I knew I'd have to slow down. I was still about 10 meters behind him, but my friend was closer and gaining on him. When my friend realized he could kick his feet and trip him, he did. He fell, and this was the quickest takedown ever. His head smashed to the frozen ground, and he was out. While we were catching our breath, he didn't move. We rolled him over onto his back, and he was breathing, but really shallow. There was a sort of cracking noise. I was terrified. Millions of questions came to my head. Is he dying? What if this was just some relative doing a prank? Why did we chase him? Meanwhile, my friend checked his pocket, and there was lubricant, strong sedative, and the broken camera. Luckily, the driver arrived a couple of minutes later with the mom and the police. An ambulance was called. When it arrived, they took him away. The day after we were brought for questioning in the police station, the chief told us that he was a known sex offender, and we saved the day and probably more kids. Since the tumble he took when he fell to the ground caused him bleeding in the brain, he's not able to wipe his own ass anymore. We told him the story, and when my friend said he tripped him, the chief stopped typing and said, Are you sure you tripped him? The way I see it, you three heroes caught a burglar in the act. He was running away when he fell and hit his head. The chief looked at us and nodded with a soft smile. But back then, this pervert must have planned this. Knowing that the festival was on, knowing that she was a single mom, picking out the house, knowing where she'd be, knowing that gives me the creeps. So, here's what happened. I'm at my parents' house with my mother, drinking coffee. I decided to drop by unexpectedly to spend some time with her, since I had worked a lot the weeks before, and I hadn't heard much from her. So we're talking when the intercom starts ringing. My mother goes to see, picks up the receiver, and there, the expression on her face changes. She seemed stressed, but she opens the door anyway. She then comes back to me, saying it's a guy she met on Facebook, someone that she hasn't seen for a year and a half, but that we have to say we're going to my grandma's so we won't stay long. I'm starting to think it's a bit weird, but we hear knocking, so my mom opens the door while I stay in my chair, overlooking the entrance. I see a rather tall man coming in, of normal build, bald, with small glasses. 
As soon as he entered the apartment, I felt the atmosphere change. Something oppressive was squeezing my chest. He kisses my mother and turns his head towards the living room where I am. Then he frowns when he sees me, as if he was surprised to find me here. I didn't like it. His gaze is empty, disturbing. He says hello to me from afar and walks into the living room, grabs a chair and sits down. My mother then asks him what he's doing here and why he arrived without calling first. Her answer froze my blood. I'm sorry I didn't take my phone. Actually, I'm coming from the hospital next door. I escaped. And since you told me you lived around here, I decided to stop by and say hello. At first, I thought he was joking, especially since he had said it with a big smile. But his eyes were really weird, and his attitude too. My mother laughed nervously and asked him if he was serious, to which he replied that he was. He even gave us the name of the town he came from and told us how we ran away. He tells us that he was outside with three doctors on a terrace, that the doctors came in before him while telling him to follow them. He took that opportunity to leave, passing over a hedge that overlooks a road where there's a bus stop. He got on the first passing bus and found himself not far from our house. He didn't know our exact address, but thanks to my mother, who gives her real name on social media, he knew her last name and searched all the interphones in the neighborhood before finding out where we were. While he was telling us this story, I went on Google Maps to check where he said he was coming from, and everything matched. The hedge overlooking the road, the back terrace, the bus stop, but most of all, it's not just any hospital he escaped from, it's a psychiatric hospital. So I started to get really scared. For myself, but especially for my mother, we have an escapee from a mental hospital in our house. He then explains to my mother that if she hasn't heard from him in over a year, it's because he came back there a year and a half ago after he lost his wife and all of his money, but he didn't linger on it for very long. It was too much for me, so I got up and said I had to go to my room. I went in. The door wasn't closing but I took my phone and I called my best friend, who is a security guard and lives 20 minutes away by car. I tell him what's going on and he decides to come over, armed with a knife just in case. When I hang up the phone and go out of my room, I see the man in the corridor near the door. He tells us that he's going to have to leave because people are probably looking for him, that he has to go to a friend's house, but that he has to take the train. We say goodbye to him and he leaves, but that's not all. I then explain to my mother what just happened, that she was crazy to have given her name and address, even approximate, to a stranger on the internet. And then she tells me that last year she was at his house with my father, that his wife was there and they had a great time, so she did not consider him dangerous. I still tell her that someone you've only seen once is not someone you can trust. My buddy arrives then, sooner than expected. We decide to call the hospital to make sure what he said is true, and also to warn them that someone is missing from their house. We call. We run into the secretary, and we explain our situation. She seems surprised and puts us on hold to check it out. When she comes back, she tells us that he's not in his room anymore, that all of his stuff is there, and that they hadn't noticed he was gone. It had been more than two hours since he had escaped, but since the guards had seen his belongings when they passed by the door, they hadn't worried. She, however, warned us that he's a dangerous psychotic who had a crisis after his wife left him, that he can be extremely violent if he's upset. At that moment, I only think one thing. What would have happened if I hadn't been there with my mother, if she had been alone with that guy? She told us that they were going to do whatever was necessary. We asked her if we could be kept informed when they found him, but she told us she had no right to give us that kind of information. We then raise our voices and explain that we shouldn't be afraid of him coming back every day. She apologizes but can't do anything about it. We hang up the phone and decide with my friend to go and do a walk around the neighborhood for several hours and the next few days to see if he's still there but we never saw him again. All this story 
which really happened, has a great moral. Never give your address to strangers, and never reveal personal information on social networks. This happened a couple of years ago. I've always wanted to have my own apartment, so when I found a one-bedroom place in an old house with its own private entrance on the side of the building, I thought I had found the perfect place. For a little background, the side door had a small deck of about 4x4 four four, with a couple of stairs that lead down to the gravel parking lot where all the building tenants parked. I was leaving one day to go study, and when I walked out the door, I immediately noticed a man in the parking lot. At first, I thought nothing of it. I went to lock my janky front door, and when I turned around, this man was standing at the bottom of my deck stairs, staring at me. He was probably just ten feet from me, and everything about his posture made me think he was about to walk up the stairs. I had never seen him before, and he had a disturbingly dead look in his eyes. It was so unsettling. I unlocked my door and immediately went back inside. I looked out the window about five minutes later, and he wasn't there anymore, so I left and went to campus to work. I had convinced myself that I was overreacting to some stranger wandering through the parking lot, but I still messaged my best friend about the incident. She freaked out and told me it was weird. She insisted I stayed with her for the night. I brushed her off because I will always choose to sleep in my own bed over a sleepover. I went home after a couple of hours of study and did a lap in the parking lot in my car just to make sure no one was loitering there. I didn't see anyone. It was dark out by this time. Flash forward to an hour later, my friend was insistent that I come stay with her. She messaged and called, and eventually I gave in to go to her place. Before I left my apartment, I decided to turn on the light above my decking, something I had never done before. I walked onto my deck, locked the door, got down the stairs, and that's when I saw him. He was hiding behind a bush on the edge of the parking lot, staring at me. I only knew it was the same guy because I turned my deck light on, and I could see him as clearly as I did when it was light out earlier in the day. I ran to my car and locked myself in. I skidded out on the gravel, trying to get to the main road. When I got to this road, I saw him running in the opposite direction that I was driving. I called the police, and then my friend to let them know what happened. The police called me back after searching the area. They told me that they didn't want to disturb me, but incidents like this have been happening in the area. Any information I have about what he looked like would be helpful. I'm a college student and I was living in a cluster of college apartments where anyone who looks over the age of 30 would seem out of place. This man looked well into his 30s or 40s. The apartment building has maybe 10 residence tops, so I would have seen him in the parking lot before this if he lived there. Within the week, the dead streetlight in the parking lot was fixed with what I can only describe to be football field floodlights. I still found a new place to live, and when trying to get out of my lease with the rental agency, I told them that fixing the lights were not enough to make me feel safe. They continued to tell me that in fact, they hadn't been the ones to fix the lights. They were upset too because neighboring tenants were complaining about how bright they were. This means that the police went to the city, and despite slow-moving bureaucracy, still got them fixed within a week. I'm so thankful to my friend who insisted I should take it seriously, and to the law enforcement who took it seriously, and decided to do something about it. I always wonder how close I was to getting murdered that day. My ex-boyfriend and I used to be co-workers. Every day after work, We'd go to this empty parking lot 15 minutes away from work to have a smoke before he dropped me off home. We were pretty young, so we didn't really have a lot of other places to hang out. We were standing outside and leaning on the driver's side of the car. It was pretty dark out and the plaza lights sort of faded away. 
so you couldn't see beyond a certain point. We started to get lost in our conversation and weren't paying attention to our surroundings. We came here every day and nothing unusual happened in the past. As we're talking, we notice a guy come out of the dark. He was walking or jogging pretty fast. Before we even had a chance to react, he was already pretty close to us. He was dressed in oversized clothes and had a backpack. We'll call him X. Everyone was silent at first. My ex and I were frozen and were already thinking of a plan to escape in case anything happened. We didn't want to make any sudden movements. But my ex secretly slipped me the keys to his car, assuming that he wanted me to casually walk to the passenger's side and get in the driver's seat so we can leave ASAP. As soon as I tried to move, X said, Please stay where you are. He seemed emotional. He seemed frantic. He was a mix between anxious, impulsive, and confident. He asked, Can I borrow one of your phones? My ex and I both said we don't have our phones. I said I hadn't paid my bill, so mine isn't functional. He said, while almost tearing up, You expect me to believe both of you don't have a phone. This is the type of shit I'm talking about. I hate being lied to. Then he really started breaking down. He said, Man, I just did the most fucked up thing. You don't know what I've just been through. We honestly thought he was on drugs. He started crying and said, I just had to kill my own best friend, my brother. And then said, I'm going to ask you again, do you have a phone? I said I had a phone, but it's not working. Which was the truth, because I paid my bill late. He said to us, don't make me have to do this to you. I really don't want to. Then he reaches for his backpack. That's when both my ex and I realized that this might be our last day on earth. But ex said one thing that sparked something in my ex. He said, I'm a fucked up person. God's never gonna forgive me. My ex wasn't religious, but he came from a Catholic family. He started talking and calming the man down. It was almost like a hostage negotiation. My ex said to him, Remember God, man. You can always repent and be forgiven. God will forgive you. The man started to cry and dropped to his knees and dropped his back. I ran to the passenger side, got in the driver's seat, reversed and flung the passenger door open for my ex. We drove off so fast. On the way home, we were shaken in disbelief. I called the police and explained the situation. The police caught up to us and asked us his description. They said they just received a call about someone with a similar description, but didn't tell us the reason. To this day, I'm not sure if he was telling the truth, if he was on drugs, or what was in his bag. My life definitely flashed for a moment. We searched the news every day for a month for a similar incident and we did find one about a man shot and injured in that area on the exact same date as the incident. We can never be sure, and I never really want to find out. So this happened to me about 13 years ago. I was 10 at the time and my brother was 8. We just moved to a new town that year and the Walmart here had this sweet arcade up near the service desk. So every time my parents would bring us grocery shopping, they'd give us each a few dollars and let us play in the arcade. The town had an incredibly low crime rate and the arcade is at the front of the store where dozens of people are checking out. What could possibly go wrong? My brother is playing the claw machine while I'm standing on the side of the machine trying to help him angle the claw perfectly above a stuffed animal he's trying to get. Suddenly this random hillbilly walks up to the claw machine next to us, inserts a quarter, and begins moving the claw around. But for most of this time he's making eye contact with my brother and smiling, not even watching the game. He's not talking to us, just staring and smiling. He has long, thin brown and silver hair pulled back into a loose ponytail at the base of his skull, a camo trucker hat and a long scraggly beard. 
I remember vividly the way he smiled. Stale beer, ashtray, and something that smelled like a sweet yet sour dirt or fungus. He tried making small talk with my brother and I, who were raised to be aware of strangers, but still to be polite. Eventually we got bored of the game we were playing, and I ushered my brother to follow me to a new game, on the opposite side of the arcade. A few seconds later, the man follows us, stationing himself once again at the claw machine next to us. At some point, an overweight lady walks in and says to the hillbilly, what are you doing to these little kids? And snickers at me. He replies, I'm trying to win them some stuffed animals. She then begins to play the claw machine on the other side of us, so that my brother and I are sandwiched between these two strange hillbillies. This comment comes across as weird to me, because previously I thought he was maybe trying to win something for his kids. But this entire time, He'd just been following my brother and I from game to game, trying to win us toys. This has been going on for maybe 20 minutes at this point. They followed us to several different machines and spent a lot of money. Each time my brother and I switched machines, they'd follow us. The hillbilly says to the lady, I'm out of money, you got any? She says, nah, I'm broke too. My brother says, I still have a dollar. Now this is the part that really scared me. I remember listening to these two talk about some weird things with us. Asking if I have a boyfriend. Asking where we go to school. Where our parents work. Asking if we've ever done drugs. All that weird stuff. But when my brother said he had a dollar, she responded with the most terrifying thing I've heard from them yet. The woman suddenly bursts out. Well shit, then give it to him boy. Her face was red. The tone in which she shouted was so ear-piercing and gut-wrenching that I could feel the blood drain from my face. My brother looked like he was about to cry. He hands her the dollar and her face lights up. She laughs it off, almost like she was trying to make it seem like she was joking when she yelled at us. My father walks up a couple of minutes later. As I turn to tell him that these people have spent close to $15 to win toys for us, they leave hurriedly before he gets a good look at them. My dad is livid. He takes up to the front desk and tells them what I told him. They make an announcement on the intercom to keep an eye out for these people, to report them to an employee if they see them. They eventually call the police. I don't actually remember this part, or much of anything after my father arrives. But this is what he told me. Growing up, my school was about 5 kilometers from my home. I had to walk it because my parents would work until 7 p.m. every day. The walk would go through a huge forest. I can probably count the number of times I've encountered anyone through this forest on one hand. This specific time is always stuck in my head, and looking back, I think I may have seen a kidnapping, or some children trying to escape a kidnapping. I was 12. It was late spring and very hot out. I was on my way home and had probably been walking for one, maybe two kilometers, when I noticed a group of boys walking my way. The boys had no clothes on at all. They were carrying what looked to me like a bat, the animal, not the sport equipment. There were three of them. Two were around the same age as me. One looked a bit younger. They looked flushed and sweaty, as if they'd been running or walking for a while. They were almost dragging the younger boy along. He seemed like he needed rest. I just froze and looked at them confused. They were speaking a language I didn't understand. I can speak both Spanish and English, so it was neither of them. The two older boys had olive skin with dark hair, while the younger one was more pale and blonde. One of the older boys tried to talk to me, but as I said, I couldn't understand whatever language they were speaking. I said to him in both Spanish and English, I can't understand you. He seemed confused, but he didn't waste any time. He pointed at the big one liter bottle I had in my backpack side pocket and shook his fist by his chest, as if he was begging me. I gave him the bottle and he made sure the younger boy drank first. 
They finished off the water I had left in there, nodded their heads as if to say thank you, before carrying on the way they were going. I kept on walking home, but I felt creeped out by whatever I had just witnessed. After another kilometer or two, I saw a man. He was tall and thin and looked to be in his late 20s or early 30s. He was pale, but pale in a way that he looked ill or sick. Looking back, I think he may have been on something, but that didn't click for me at the time. When I saw him, I tried to keep my head down and kept walking, but he stopped me. In broken Spanish, he said to me that he was looking for his little brothers, that they were lost and asked if I had seen them. I shook my head. He said thanks and carried on walking. I tried my hardest to walk normally, but as soon as he was out of sight, I ran, and I didn't stop running until I reached home. Once my parents got home, I told them what had happened. They shrugged it off and told me I shouldn't worry. When I insisted I was serious, my dad promised he would call the police in the morning and tell them what I had seen. If my dad did call them, I was never called in for further questioning. No police asked me for descriptions or anything. My dad swears he reported it, but I have my doubts. I just wish they would have taken me seriously. This happened in January a few years ago, on my way into work one cold, wintry Friday morning. I had a rough start to the day. I remember waking up in a panic as I realized I was holding my phone in my hand. I had been hitting snooze on my alarm for the past hour. I wasn't even giving them a chance to sound. Apparently as soon as my phone started to vibrate, I would hit the side button to silence it. I was exhausted. I had already worked Monday through Thursday. 10 hour days that typically turn into 12s at that time of year. I had just found out that I was pregnant the week prior, so I was even more tired than normal. This type of behavior was very unlike me. I'm always on time to work. I don't usually work on Fridays, but once a year we have our annual mandatory training for all staff members. It's definitely not a day that can be missed or one to be extremely late to, so I quickly throw on some clothes. Tie my hair up into a ponytail and brush my teeth, and out the door I went. I had 25 minutes until I had to be there, so I didn't even let my car warm up. As I pulled out of my driveway, I remember thinking to myself my dad would kill me if he knew. He's a mechanic, and that was something he was always preaching the importance of. I finally get out of the neighborhood, hit the highway, and notice my gas light is off. Another annoyance that would cut into my time but I decided I would stop once I got off on the exit as I had a few minutes to spare. So I did. I pull my car up to the pump and turn it off, hop out into the freezing cold to get the gas started and quickly jump back in. There's a guy pumping gas into his white work truck right in front of me. I didn't really pay him much mind. Those trucks were everywhere near my workplace at the time, as it's near the river where all the bridge construction had been going on. I'm texting my friend from work and letting her know where I am. When I get that feeling, someone is looking at me. I look up and make eye contact with the work truck guy. He quickly looks away just as I hear the gas click off. I get back out to finish and don't think anything else about it. I hop back in my car and get ready to go to work. At this point, I probably had about five minutes left, which would have been plenty considering the proximity. I press the start button. Click. Click, click. Shit, I thought, as I did it again, only to hear that same sound. What do you know? My car won't start. The battery's dead. And for the second time that morning, I thought of my dad and his advice. If I would have just let it warm up, I wouldn't be having this problem right now. I try for a third time, hoping it's the charm, but it's no use. The guy in the work truck notices at this point. He starts to make his way toward me, so I step out of my car. He asks me if I'm having car trouble, and I tell him I think my battery's dead. He tells me that he can help me, but he doesn't have jumper cables in this particular truck. He does, however, only work right down the road. He's on one of the bridge crews, and he has a set there. He says he'll run to get them and come right back. I tell him that he doesn't have to do that, 
but he says he doesn't mind at all. I think about it for a second. My husband's at home, already asleep at this point. He works third shift, and I don't want to wake him up if there's no need. And my dad's already at his job. I remember thinking that he probably has a kid my age somewhere, one who he would hope someone would help in this type of situation one day. He's probably just a father type trying to help, so I say okay and thanked him for his help. He said no problem, that he'd be back in a couple of minutes and left to get the jumper cables. As I'm waiting, I called my boss to let her know what was going on, that I would be in as soon as possible. She offers to send someone out there to help, but I tell her about the work truck guy and that I'll call her back if this doesn't work. By the time I hang up, he's back with the cables. We get my car started back up again. We let it run for a few minutes and make small talk. That's of little importance, like typical strangers do when they're trying to fill the silence. It's during this time he asks me if I'm a nurse. Immediately I'm alarmed because I'm not wearing any scrubs. I think he could see the shock on my face because he quickly said that he noticed my license plate when he was pulling back in. I laugh in relief and slight embarrassment as I remembered my license plate is in fact one of the state-issued nursing ones. I reply that yes, I am a nurse and that I'm actually running late for work. He asks if I work at a hospital up the road, to which I reply no, I don't. Now he's the one that looks confused because where else would a nurse work? right? I don't want to give too much away, and I feel a bit uncomfortable with the questions, but I don't want to be rude. So I say, oh, uh, I work at a facility not too far from here, and I leave it at that. I mention again how I'm running late, and he unhooks the jumper cables. I thank him again, and we both get in our vehicles and drive away. I let him pull out first, and then I proceed to take a roundabout way to work, just in case he's watching. I felt kind of silly, but you never know, right? I finally get to work and I jump straight into the training. I honestly didn't think about what happened that morning again, except here and there when my co-workers asked a few questions in the break room during lunch. The long day finally comes to an end, and we all head out. As I'm walking towards my car, I see a piece of paper shoved down into the driver's side window. I stand there and look at it for a second thinking of the guy from that morning, and then glance around the parking lot. I don't see anything unusual, and remind myself that he didn't know where I worked. I laugh at myself for being paranoid, because it's probably a note from my best friend. She works at the hospital a few blocks over. As I'm sure you can guess, the note wasn't from her. It was from the work truck guy that morning. I don't remember it all word for word, but most of it I know I'll never forget. It made my skin crawl and thoroughly freaked me the fuck out. It listed his phone number at the top with an arrow pointing to it that said, Call soon, love. He said that he felt we had this connection, one of two souls, and that he wanted to continue getting to know me, that he knew the reason why he was at the gas pump in front of me that morning was that so he could find me because the Lord knows he has been searching for me for so many years now that he couldn't let me slip away. We just couldn't ignore fate like that. No, not when it had been made as clear as it was that morning. I dropped the piece of paper like it was on fire. I felt my heart drop with all the panic and paranoia that came after reading it. I was so freaked out that I immediately called my mom, my dad, and my husband. I didn't want to drive home. What if he followed me? Did he not see my wedding ring? How did he even find out where I worked? He literally had to have driven through about 20 other medical facility parking lots just to find my car, because I watched him drive off in the other direction. I never saw him turn around in my rear view. Trust me, I was watching. My work building is kind of hard to find too, with it being off the road on a side street, especially for a man that lived a couple hours north of here as he told me earlier during our small talk. He wouldn't have been familiar with the surrounding area enough just to come upon my car like that. I didn't walk in or out of work by myself for months after that, not until well after that bridge was finished. It's always nighttime when I arrive to work, and for part of the year when I leave. 
so there was no way in hell that I was going to walk across that dark parking lot by myself. I've never seen him again, but that hasn't stopped me from feeling like someone is watching me at random times. That type of paranoia just kind of sticks with you. If only I had just listened to my dad's advice and let my damn car warm up. But that's a mistake I have not, and will not, ever make again. I can guarantee it. When I was five, my family attended a church with two stories. Downstairs were the nursery and Sunday school rooms. Upstairs was the main church room where the service was held, as well as some offices, a kitchen, and a library. The main doors opened onto a stairway, connecting the two levels. After Sunday school, kids would either continue playing downstairs until their parents came to get them, or, if they were old enough and impatient to go home like me, could go find their parents upstairs and try to convince them to stop talking and leave. My mom would spend what felt like hours talking to people after service, so sometimes I'd go up and down the stairs a couple of times, up to ask if we could leave, back down to play when she said not yet, repeat again maybe ten minutes later. One Sunday during one of my trips up the stairs, there was an elderly couple standing outside the glass door, smiling and waving at me. I remember thinking maybe they'd been locked out somehow and wanted to come in, which was a silly thing to think since the doors were never locked during the hours the church was open. Wanting to be helpful, I went and opened the door and told them that they could come in. It turns out they did not want to come in, and instead told me they were my grandparents, that they were there to pick me up. That confused me as I was familiar with both sets of my grandparents, and these people were not either. I told them that no, they were not my grandparents. At that point I was thinking they had me just confused for another kid and I said so. They then quickly stated that they meant they were my grandparents, that we hadn't met since I was a baby so I wouldn't remember them. They said my parents asked them to drive me home since they were busy. Even if I hadn't been smart enough to realize that they could just come in if they wanted, that at least seemed odd to me, and even as they protested it wasn't necessary, I said I was going to go ask my parents and headed upstairs. My mom was still talking to a group of other churchgoers, but after literally tugging on her sleeve for probably a minute, I was able to get her attention and announce loudly that my grandparents were there to pick me up, and if I was supposed to go with them. She looked confused, then concerned, and then told me that my grandparents were not there to pick me up since they all were dead. That pretty quickly put a stop to the discussion about raising money for stained glass windows or whatever. My mom and some other adults went back with me to the door, but the couple was no longer there. Since I really couldn't describe them any better than old, white hair, looked friendly but not my grandparents. It was just sort of uneasily put down to them mistaking me for someone else. From then on, despite my impatience to leave, I stayed downstairs until my parents came and got me. I remember being concerned about it for a while, but my mom would discourage discussing it, saying that they just made a mistake. It is possible that that's all it was, but I've always remembered that it felt wrong how insistent they were that they were there to pick me up. To be completely honest, men never usually hit on me or approach me at all. This is because I'm a very large woman. It is weird when they do. It has only happened twice in the last six or seven years. The first of those times was okay, but it still was a bit uncomfortable since I was in the elevator in my apartment building with a complete stranger. He kept asking me out for coffee. I know I'm not attractive, so I never believe people when they act like I am. I'm also not looking to date. The second time, however, just happened recently. After work, I took the bus to the grocery store. It's a few minutes in the opposite direction from my apartment, 
but they have some pretty good deals, so I like to go there at least once per month. As I was just starting to walk away from the bulk foods area, I heard someone say, Hey, there were other people in the area, so I figured this person was trying to get the attention of a deli or bakery employee nearby. I saw him out of the corner of my eye, but paid him no attention. I walked off to continue my shopping. I had used a phone in the store that automatically rings up a taxi company to call my ride. I left and walked off to the side where the benches are to wait for my taxi. A few people walked behind the bench as they also left. Then one stopped and said, Hello? I still paid no attention. The only person I talked to was my sister, and she was back at our apartment. He came a bit closer, cleared his throat, and said, Excuse me. I turned. It was the guy. It was then that I realized he'd been trying to get my attention inside the store earlier. Oh, hello. I smile. I really am anxious out in public, but I am decent at faking friendliness. Do you live around here? No, I'm just waiting for my ride home. Ah, you know, I live just over there. He pointed at the townhouse complex across the street. I can give you a ride if you like. Well, that was fast and forward. Well, thanks, but that's all right. I already called my ride and it's on its way. Are you certain they're coming? Because it is no problem to drive you. I assured him that my ride was for sure on the way. He kept trying over and over to get me to come with him, despite my polite refusals. He offered to put his phone number in my phone so I could call him any time, day or night, and he would come pick me up. Well... That's creepy. I told him the truth and said that I didn't have a cell phone. He immediately challenged that by asking how I called for a ride there. I said that there's a phone inside the store that I used. He chuckled and asked, Are you worried that if I gave you a ride, your husband would kill me? Husband? Yeah, right. I'm 35 and have never even had a boyfriend. Oh, he might. He can get like that sometimes. Better if I just take my cab when it arrives, I lied. Well, you don't have to tell him that I gave you a ride. That wouldn't be very honest of me. Besides, the folks at the taxi company already know who I am, so I can't just no-show them, I said to him. Which is true. I've been irregular for the past six years. They know me by voice now. He then asked where I'm from. I said that I'm from this general area. He then said that he was from Africa. I asked which country. He told me, then started talking about being from a tribe, and how tribes would fight each other for things and whatnot. I was just praying that my cab would be there soon. I kept turning to check. Finally, it arrived. I stood up and said, Looks like my ride is here. He said that it was nice to talk to me as I was putting my bags in the car. I hopped in the cab, thanked the cabbie for finally saving me, and then we were off. That guy must have offered me a ride at least a dozen times, but that wasn't the end of it. As I was getting my stuff out of the cab upon arriving at the complex, that man drove past me. He doesn't live here too. He followed me. I don't know what he hoped to accomplish since the buildings are secure, and he doesn't know my first name, let alone my last, which is the only name listed beside the buzzer. I hustled into the building. My girlfriend and I took some time out to do some backpacking and travel the world. We went to some incredible places and met some interesting people, but our most interesting story is probably this one. As I said, we went all over. Myanmar, Bolivia, Mexico. Many places that have some unsafe reputations. However, we are both pretty good at reading people and staying out of trouble, so we've never had any major incidents. We were on a fairly tight budget at this point in our journey, as we had recently been to Japan and wanted to chill for a bit before finding some work in Vietnam. We decided to volunteer on a Cambodian island, Koh Rong Sam Lam. It's a bit of a luxury island full of resorts that we couldn't normally afford to stay at, so it seemed like a good gig. I worked behind the bar at this resort, and my girlfriend worked in the restaurant. 
In return, we got to sleep in the dorm and our own meals for free. The manager told me that since I was working behind the bar and Scottish, an English guy who lived on the island would likely come and see me, and that his name was Dog. It didn't take long for this to take place. A fairly old guy in his late 50s or early 60s came into the bar. He was quite tall and still powerfully built, and he was accompanied by a massive Rottweiler, which he quickly told me was also called Dog. We had a bit of a laugh, taking the piss out of each other. He was making fun of me being Scottish, and I was making fun of him going by the name Dog and being English. I noticed he was always wearing wife beaters, which said, Dog's Offshore Bar, and had a picture of his dog, the Rottweiler, on it. I got to know more about Dog the Man. He used to work in construction and offshore, so being as I did as well, we had quite a bit to talk about, and heaps of opportunity to talk, as he usually arrived for his first beer at 7am. He was clearly an alcoholic, but he never struck me as a bad person early on. Just a sadly complicated one. Like when you talk to someone who's homeless. Anyone who's ever been to Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, or any Southeast Asian country will understand how rare it is to see a dog that's not some kind of street mutt or tiny pet. Dog's huge dog would stand out even in Europe, however. Even for a Rottweiler, it was huge. Massively muscular with a metal chin to give some semblance of control if it was to kick off. I really liked dogs, so I was quite interested in what this huge dog was doing on an island. I always made sure to have some water out for it. It was friendly enough, but never left his owner's side, and seemed to be a working dog in terms of its intensity. It was clearly a guard dog. It turned out the dog was actually a Finnish drug dealer's dog, and Dog the Man had bought him. He told me the dog had an attack command and he kept him primed by using it often on other island dogs. He told me it had killed multiple dogs this way. I didn't believe this at first, but there was an island dog the manager would often leave food out for, and this dog would come near the bar, usually when dog's monster dog wasn't about that night. He must have been hungry enough to brave it, and dog hissed the command. The Rottweiler was bounded for the island dog, knocking over chairs and all sorts until he was called off. It was pretty scary. One night I was sat at the bar talking with Dog about his job. I would be taken on soon at a digital marketing company. I was in talks with the CEO of this company. At the time it was for a digital marketing job in which I would work from home or coffee shops, updating and improving websites. He said it sounded made up and that the company was likely some kind of con to get my bank details. I told him that it was a real company and that I had googled it. He was really drunk at this point, and the restaurant was now closed. My girlfriend joined us and we were all having a beer at the bar. He told my girlfriend how I believed everything I read online and how I shouldn't do that. He said people publish all kinds of made-up shit on there. I asked what he was referring to, and he said, Never Google me. So I said, How could I Google you? Your name is Dog. If I googled you, I would just see a picture of an Alsatian. But then I remembered those Topsy War. Dog's offshore bar. So I told him, I'm going to google you. And I was laughing. He was getting quite annoyed. But at this point, other than owning a weaponized canine, I thought he was pretty harmless. I was wrong. I began reading out loud the interesting things I found out about his bar and other related stories. One of particular interest was about a conviction. The joking and laughing stopped, and I quickly stopped reading out loud. I looked quickly to my girlfriend, and I could see the smile leave her face. She realized we were drinking with a killer. It turned out this guy had murdered his Thai wife, and then had been briefly in prison before paying bail. He then fled the country before the trial. He had stabbed her. His alibi to the police was that he couldn't have killed her because he was having sex with a prostitute on the beach at the time. He told us that he had been framed, that his wife's ex was in the police, and that he had killed her for moving on. I was nodding along to everything he said, trying my best to show I agreed with him, whilst making sure the machete I used to open the coconuts for cocktails was in easy reach. 
He told us how hard it was being one of the few white guys in a Thai prison. How he had to attack guards to get into solitary confinement, and then they beat him mercilessly. He told us that they used to leave Shanks in his room and put him in the yard with the sex offenders for him to kill. He told us that he had killed before he went to prison, and that he killed when he was inside, but he did not kill his wife. His wife was a prostitute he met while trafficking women from Thailand to Singapore on his boat. The same one he used to flee Thailand after his arrest and set up his bar. Dogs Offshore Bar with the tagline, Dogs Welcome, Wives Must Be Kept on Leashes or Under Control. We both acted like we believed him and eventually he left. The whole night, however, I was waiting next door for him and his dog to come for us. I even propped a bin up against the door, so anyone coming in would knock it over, and we would maybe have a chance to react. I nearly attacked my friend when he came in, it was so fucked. We quickly decided to leave after this, and only saw a dog once more. My girlfriend was opening a can of coconut milk for a curry, and he came by and jokingly asked if she needed a knife, and he patted his back pocket. The guy is known as Mick the Palm or make the dog if you want to google this. If you google dog's offshore bar, you'll see what I did. He was living in a tent on the island with his dog keeping watch while he slept. I'm not sure if he's still there now. It's hard for me to write this. It started in 2014 and it happened in my home country of Sweden. When I went to an art school for a summer course as a form of daily activity, the people at this school were some of the worst people I have ever met, and that included me because I was kind of a thrash back then. I was 21 years old and had little experience of the real world. I had gone two extra years of schooling because of switching majors and taking an extra year on my second choice, so I was basically on my first year of independence. I also have a light form of autism and didn't receive schooling until I was 12, which made me mentally develop a bit more slowly during high school. Basically, I was a 21-year-old with very little experience in life. The people I met at the art school were not, let's say, the highest of achievers. They were some of the meanest and most terrible people I have ever met. They treated each other and me awfully as well as the teachers, but I was quite a little shit too. In fact, I feel like being around those people also made me worse. What started the stalking was an incident involving acrylic paint. It was going to be thrown away, so some of us took some of the paint so it wouldn't go to waste, and I finally took the remaining paint. Well, Anna showed up, and this is how she introduced herself. My art teacher was pushing these big tables on a trolley through the narrow passageway of the art hall, and Anna dressed in expensive designer clothes, stood in her way. So my art teacher, not fearing anything, screams, move it. Anna snaps towards her with this crazy look in her eyes and shouts, excuse me, do you know who I am? I'm a famous woman. My art teacher, not impressed, responds with, okay famous woman, move it. That was how we learned of Anna, the famous artist. She then proceeded to have all the terrible people of my class schmooze over her and treat her like a celebrity, but her real reason for being there was because of her paint. So the great hunt began. I was roped into it, and my initial plan was just to give her her paint back so she could be off. Except during the hunt, I got these terrifying red flags. She kept sniffing the paint of other people to see if any were hers. Apparently she had poured some kind of oil into the paint so she could sniff her way to where they were. During the hunt, she admitted that she'd been put into treatment for the criminally insane because she had stalked a previous schoolmate that she thought had stolen paint from her. She even showed a CCTV video of her old schoolmate pulling a suitcase behind her, saying that's where she had the paint that she stole. I asked her how she got the video, and she said that her dad had connections with the local government, which had gotten the videotape from one of the local government cameras. During this time, she even showed me the court document which she had saved as a PDF on her phone. She also admitted that she'd been sending messages to a famous artist in Urubro because a voice from heaven told her to do it, and that he was destined to help her with her career. 
Anna also thought that staring wide-eyed made her more attractive, like the kind of stare where you can't see any of the eyelids at all. So while she was saying all of this, she had this crazy-eyed look on her face. I was terrified of her and couldn't figure out a way of handing back the paint, so she ended up threatening to have the principal fired if she couldn't search every room for the paint. And when she did find all of her paint, she put it in one of the school's rooms and said that she would pick it up when she wanted to. She said that she would come every year to the art exhibit to check if her paint was still there and that she would sue the school if she found it missing. What a crazy person. End of story, right? How I wish. About two years later, I enrolled in a one-year basic art program at the school. I had completely forgotten about this crazy person. At one point, we were cleaning out the art rooms, and her paint was brought up again. It would again be thrown away. Me, not remembering that crazy, famous artist, took a nice crimson bottle for myself while others took some of the not ruined color for themselves. Then, as we all tried to continue with our lives, the crazy lady one day returned and started sniffing all the colors. I didn't recognize her at all, and had forgotten how dangerously deranged she was. I had even forgotten that I took that crimson color from her paint, so when she started interrogating me for why the paint smelled like hers, I didn't know what to say. She also smelled her paint at some other girl's table and was harassing her as well. Thinking that this was all more fuss than it was worth, I threw away the crimson paint, and that's when everything went to hell, and crazy-eyed Anna became my stalker. When she found out that I had thrown away the paint, she became convinced that I had re-enrolled at the art school, specifically to steal her paint. She started convincing a bunch of gullible people that this was true, and then harassment followed. It started with a physical attack. I was painting alone in the evening, minding my own business, when this huge brute ran into me, tackled me to the floor, and hit and kicked me. While this was happening, crazy-eyed Anna was fake crying in the corner, but I could see her when I was on the floor. How she went from fake crying to gleefully smiling as I was being kicked and hit. Another girl she had recruited picked up and smashed my phone, breaking it. As the guy stormed off and the second girl followed, I stumbled onto my feet and asked Anna why she had done this. The answer she gave me made me realize what kind of person she was. So you can know that I can hurt you if I want. That was the answer she gave me. I later asked the brute why he'd attacked me and he said that he hated people who stole. I had bruised my ribs but was not allowed to go to the hospital. The principal didn't want to get involved, and since my phone was broken, I couldn't call for an ambulance. It took so long to get to the hospital that the outside signs of abuse had healed. During this time, crazy-eyed Anna started wearing a crimson jacket wherever she went. I asked her why she was wearing it, and also said she looked pretty, thinking that talking nicely to her would start a friendly conversation to maybe smooth everything over. Well... Anna is not like normal people, and certainly does not think like normal people. Her response was that she wanted me to think of her every time I saw this color. She said that she had seen it work in a movie. She then said, I am more beautiful than you will ever be. Wherever she went, she had a horde of schmoozers around her, all thinking she was some kind of famous and fancy artist. But eventually, she had to leave the school and I thought I had peace. Except she one day suddenly showed up and gleefully presented me with the school's Russian exchange student. This student had been sitting at my table every day for weeks, and I never paid it any mind because, well, why would I? She was allowed to sit there. But this is when crazy-eyed Anna drops the bombshell that this exchange student was A, not a real exchange student, and B, she had been putting her phone on the table each mealtime while having it on speaker with Anna, who, on the other end, was silently listening in on my conversations. I remember when she first told me this, how I didn't believe it. I didn't believe, and a part of me still had a hard time realizing the lengths this woman was going to were real, but it was what she said next that terrified me most. She said, I know about the secret messages behind your words. I know what you are up to. 
I heard a voice from above that told me it was my mission in life to keep an eye on you and to make sure you behave. The abuse at school escalated quickly after this. I was harassed and cornered in every classroom. I was chased around the school and at the same time, I got no help. It escalated into happening one late weekend night. I was sitting in the school's texture room when a guy suddenly burst in and started running towards me, screaming. What makes you think you can sit here? He did not go to this school. I jumped out of a window and started running towards my door. I managed to call the emergency number. I screamed out that I needed help and where I was. I ran towards my door, but another guy was waiting for me there. So I ran towards the head building. But a third guy was waiting for me there too. They cornered me, and I remember how scared I was. I thought I was going to die. But then, a light of hope, blue and red lights from the road. I was saved. I remember how happy I was to see the police officer. Everything would finally be over. And then, he walked up to the girl who orchestrated all of it, Malin. He greeted her like a friend, and I knew. I knew in that moment that he wouldn't save me. I screamed for help, and he ignored me. She told him that there was no issue here. He said he was looking forward to seeing her around town. And then he left. He left me. He just drove away. The last thing I remember are the back lights of that police car driving away. I woke up the next morning, laying on the ground with a huge bump on the side of my head. I don't know what happened. Malin claims they never touched me, and I just passed out when one of the guys grabbed me. I know better. I know the pain I felt and the huge bump on the side of my head. I called the emergency number again and I asked for an ambulance. At this time, because of the abuse, I had memory loss and couldn't quite tell the dispatcher what the issue was. But I made a mistake. I told her I'd called the day previous and that the police officer just left me. She got mad. Really, really mad. She told me that I was slandering her co-worker and to only call if I actually needed help. And then she hung up. I was alone again with no one, not a single person on my side. I tried to make a police report against Anna and Malin, but the officer had heard about me and they deleted my report. It was during this time that I had enough and I thought about ending my own life. So I was forcefully put in the mental health ward. The stalking didn't stop. Crazy-eyed Anna had a friend of hers be committed so she could come into the ward as a visitor in order to harass me. When I tried to go to art school again, she had people she had threatened join the same program so they could keep an eye on me. At home, she would have another guy she had threatened to park outside my house a few times a week in order to scare me. During this time, she would also have stolen things from me. Things like shoes, gloves, and that kind of thing. According to the people doing the stealing, this was because she had watched a movie where someone steals items and then puts them back to make someone go insane from the harassment. Crazy Eyed Anna would call me a few times a year, lying about being a data collector to get private information out of me. Because she lived in a big city far away at the time, she constantly forced others to do the stalking for her. Most of them had at one point been given drugs, and then she would get them to do whatever she wanted by threatening to report them to the police if they didn't. Others she just bribed with money or charmed. I've gone for hour-long bus rides where someone admits to being there for her sake. Most people are afraid of her because she won't leave them alone, and she will do to them what she does to me if they don't say yes to her. One girl was roped into standing all dressed in red outside the supermarket. Another girl was also roped into sitting in her car outside my house for a few hours a few days a week, all because of the fear of this woman. I learned from a cousin of hers that she affords all this because she won an art prize for half a million Swedish kroner at one point. That's the reason she thinks she's famous. I also learned that most of her biological family has cut contact with her because she has been doing this since she was a teenager. And yet, even with that information, no one would listen. When I tell people what she had done to me, 
People call me the crazy one. I have no history of delusions or making up tales, yet it was so much easier for people to think I am crazy. I've even been forcefully medicated at some point with psychosis medication that baffled doctors lamented over not working. Not even my family believes me. Something that is forever barred how much trust I can put into the relationship between us. I asked her once why she was doing all of this, and she said, to punish you. I asked her for how long I would need to be punished, and she answered, for as long as I want. At one point, I even considered killing her. I'm the kind of person who catches flies alive in a cup and lets them out the window. I've never harmed another human being. I've never been violent, yet at one point, I felt so desperate for freedom that I would take prison rather than being haunted by Crazy Idana anymore. I was more afraid of her than prison. Then, it stopped. It just stopped. Still a year later, I don't know why it stopped. Nothing in her history tells me that she would stop so willingly. So I'm convinced that either she has run out of people to threaten into doing her bidding, or something has happened to her. It is possible that one of those people finally reported her and actually got taken seriously. I don't know. Even so, I can't feel relief. Not yet. I'm still afraid it will start again, and I have given up all hope of being taken seriously by the police. I'm in my 20s, and my partner just asked me what my cousin is like, since they've only met briefly. I told him some fun stories from our childhood, and then tried to find some words to describe her character, and one of the first ones was paranoid, but then I stopped to ask myself why I think of her as paranoid, and I suddenly remembered a childhood memory I had completely forgotten. When I was about 10 and she was about 12, I went to her house for a sleepover. I arrived in the early afternoon and we swapped Goosebumps books and listened to The Three Investigators. We then decided to grab a snack for a movie we wanted to see on TV later. Her mom, my aunt, gave us ten bucks and sent us on our way to a nearby supermarket before it got dark. The area she lived in was near a big intersection outside of the city, with big chain supermarkets and department stores people only ever got to by car. We bought our candy and crossed the main road to go back to the quiet residential district. She noticed a tall man in a yellow t-shirt following us across the road. Unless he also lived in one of the few houses, a slim chance, he had no reason to be there. She told me how she saw him in the shop and how he had followed us across the street. She panicked a bit and told me to walk faster. I did, even though I thought she was overreacting. After all, we both were always reading spooky stories. I was sure they must have gotten into her head. He also picked up his pace and followed us for several streets before we arrived at her house and rang the doorbell, and then he hurried in the other direction. I was a very naive child, and all I had ever been told about stranger danger was to not get into a car with someone who offers you candy. I was not worried in the slightest. I didn't see why she was freaked out at all. When we got to bed that night, she said something like, Now he knows where I live. I'm so scared. What if he comes here again tonight? I said to her, Then do what? Murder us. Why would someone do that? He doesn't even know us. I completely forgot about the whole thing, but I started to think of her as paranoid. She probably thinks of me as naive. So this happened to me in December of 2018. Just a quick disclaimer, I was on medication at the time that makes me very, very spaced out. I can't remember most days when I'm on it. For some background, I'm a young female, short blonde hair, 5 foot 6, petite, but still some curves. It's normal for me to get attention while I'm out since I do dress quite out there. 
I'm really into fashion and colors, so it is hard to miss me. So this starts off when I had just gotten off the train to go to my bank branch. I had misplaced my credit card and needed to pick one up. If I can remember correctly, I was wearing these bright green thigh-high heels and I guess a red dress, but that's blurry. I was unfamiliar with the area and didn't know where the bank branch was in the shopping center, so I called up my friend if they were 100% sure they had a bank there. That's when I noticed him. He was bald wearing casual clothes and on the phone staring at me. I thought nothing of it, and I eventually found the bank. I went inside and got what I needed. Naturally, I tested my card with the ATMs outside, and that's when I saw the same guy waiting outside the bank looking at me again. This wasn't strange to me. I didn't think anything of it. I walked to the other end of the shopping center so I can catch the bus home. I didn't know the bus timetable, and I couldn't look it up as I have a shitty iPhone 6, and the battery is complete garbage. I just thought I'd conserve the battery for music. I didn't notice that the guy was following me until he sat down right next to me at the bus stop, weirdly close. He was not talking on the phone anymore, and he started a conversation with me. I never assumed the worst, so I think he's going to ask me a question about the bus timetable or directions. He introduced himself. I can't remember his name, but very quickly he switched and asked me very oddly specific questions. Questions such as, How old are you? Do you have a boyfriend? How much do you weigh? How tall are you? How many friends do you have? What is your family life like? Are you healthy? Where do you hang out with friends? Where are you headed? I told him where I was headed. I know, stupid but he told me he was headed in the opposite direction, complete opposite. Between the questions that I answered truthfully, because I couldn't really avoid the questions, he would make comments about my appearance. He said, I've never seen a prettier girl than you. You don't find too many people who dress so uniquely. I was literally messaging my boyfriend, telling him what was going on, until of course my phone ran out. Eventually, he continues the conversation with more questions. He said nothing about himself, despite me asking the same questions. He just ignored everything. My bus rolls up. I stand up, say thanks and goodbye, and he stands up as well and follows me onto the bus. He was going the complete opposite direction of where he was heading. I sat down, silently panicking, but nothing too bad. The medication I was on at the time made me extremely tired and chill, so it wasn't like a panic attack. He sat down in the seat behind me, not talking to me anymore. Eventually about five minutes pass, and it's my stop now. It's a popular stop due to the cluster of apartments, but I kept seated until the very last second because something was off. I got off and he wasn't able to follow me. I looked at the bus as it drove past me and he had this unfriendly look on his face, looking directly at me through the windows. It may not be as creepy as other people's, but I believe I was possibly being interviewed for something nefarious. It's far-fetched, but I really do believe something was insanely off. He wasn't asking normal questions, and he followed me on my bus, despite heading in a different direction. If he was into me, you'd think he'd ask for my number or something, I was visiting my six-year-old nephew in California and decided to go play at the park. This is not the first time I brought him to the same park. When we arrived, there were a couple of kids with their parents playing at the playground. My nephew then decided to run and climb a tree far away from the playground, so I followed him and helped him sit on a fairly low branch. He was happy. Then I just heard this voice asking if they can ask a question. I didn't know it was directed at me so I didn't pay it any mind. And then the person started walking towards us with her hand in their pocket. It was a woman in her late 20s to early 30s, wearing sweatpants and a hoodie with a backpack on. She then shouted a series of questions to which I was indifferent, until she said to, put your hands where I can see them. Seeing that we were alone at the far side of the park, 
and that there is no police car nearby to at least confirm that she's an officer. I grabbed my nephew, who didn't want to be carried away, and headed towards the playground where there were people. She followed us aggressively, asking, Can I just ask you a question? Is he your brother? Hey, why are you holding him like that? I just answered, He's my nephew, and we are fine. I was panicking. I'm a short guy, foreign to the States, and my nephew is starting to have a meltdown. Her hand is still in her pocket, and I've seen enough crime movies. So sorry, no, you cannot ask me a question. I have no idea what was going on, but my gut feeling told me to get away ASAP. When she asked me if the person at the bench were my parents, I told her yes so she'd go away. Finally, we're at the playground and the woman was still there. She shouted at the couple sitting on the bench that I was not responsive to her questions and that they may need to call 911 on me. The couple responded that they'll watch us. I told the couple that the kid is in the spectrum and I'm his uncle and that woman has been staring at us and was creepy. The wife told me that she understands and she has a neighbor on the spectrum. I don't know if I'm overreacting, but I was very scared after. We played at the swings for a bit more just to show everyone that he really was my nephew. I then told my nephew it's bath time, so we can walk home. I made sure to lock the doors when we got home, just in case she followed us. I was so creeped out. Was I overreacting, or was what happened harmless? This is not an encounter per se, as I have never actually talked to this man. For a bit of background, I live on an island, and my backyard ends in a golf course. I only live with my mom and two dogs. Back in August of 2021, I saw this man. He looked to be in his late 50s or early 60s, walking on the golf course. He had no golf gear, no golf cart, not even in golf clothing. All of a sudden, he walks into my backyard and starts snooping around. It looked like he was trying to get the lay of the land. It kept happening for a while, but then stopped for a bit. Then it happened again for a while, and then stopped until recently. I caught him doing it again. When all this first started happening, I thought he was just a golfer retrieving a ball that was hit into my backyard. I quickly realized that this was not the case. Then I thought he must be a part of the golf course's staff. That was not the case either, because he was not in the uniform that the staff wear. Sometimes he even gets really close to the house, which makes me very nervous. This is a grown man I absolutely do not know, and he's not a golfer. It's really off-putting because I'm a minor only living with my mom. He looks like he's getting the lay of the land, scoping out potential places he could enter the house. When I see him, I always make sure to stare at him making it known that he is not welcome in my yard for no reason, and certainly not in my house. He occasionally catches my stare and quickly walks away, looking very guilty. I'm a guy living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this long enough to realize what happens when you post about stuff on the internet. Whether it's a good trail, an abandoned mine, ghost, or whatever it may be, people come flocking and with a lot of trash and loud music. Anyway, this particular trail, I was taking an 8 mile loop through a canyon. Pretty simple, in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but a last minute cancel on his part left me on my own. So, with a packed bag and a car ready to go, I decided to go on my own, not leaving the house on time and some trouble navigating rough forest roads. I didn't arrive to the trailhead until around 5.45, which for those of you who don't backpack, this is a very big no-no. I had about a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot and it was getting dark fast. I figured if I moved quick enough, I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own, 
with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anything else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary, especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually, it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get a camp set up. With only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast, I ended up in a less than ideal spot but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but definitely not recently. My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood and I got the fire going. I got my tarp set up and cracked open a can of chili mac I had brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating it. I was feeling good. My camp was set up and my food was on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike in had almost gone away, but it was still there. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain to you how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees, with a trail about 30 feet to my left. When you're in the woods and you have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it, and everything on the edge of that circle and past it are pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire, eating my dinner, when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock, and I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and towards the area where I had seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and brush, I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned the tree line that surrounded me searching for what or whoever had thrown that rock. Not daring to stray too far from my fire, that in hindsight offered me a false sense of security. And after sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to convince myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or it had fallen from a tree. I went to sleep that night, not expecting the pure terror that was about to unfold. I woke to the sound of rustling leaves, Barely inaudible if you weren't listening for them, but they were there. Still in a sleepy daze, I listened as the rustling of the leaves got harder to hear, as I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I had fallen asleep, but the more I looked, the more scared I got as I came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of my tarp and looked around. I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been there more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight, laying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of the few moments in my life where I've almost shit my pants. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me, past the tree line in the woods. I hurriedly slipped my boots on clutching my knife in the other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options, stay here and wait out the night, or attempt the three mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured that whatever or whoever was out here with me was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was on the trail without a light, so I decided to stay at the camp and wait out the night there. Eventually it came back. I could hear it walking through the woods. It was far off, but I could hear it. It sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes it would walk too far away and I would lose the sound of its steps. But then an hour later, maybe two, it would return, still faint as ever. This went on for three or four hours. I listened to the steps get closer and closer until they were about seven feet away from me. At this point the fire had gotten very small as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped and everything went totally silent. I sat there still for two hours, clutching a knife in my hand and prayed that I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. I packed my things and sped walked the three miles back down the trail I had taken. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted it. I jumped in and drove, 
and I didn't stop until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I stopped at a gas station in Apache Junction to buy a Red Bull, but mostly just to see or talk to another person. As I exited the store, I was able to read what was written in the dust on the back window of my car. It said, Sleep well. A lot of weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this is the weirdest and scariest by far, so I thought I'd share it. There is a seriously deranged person living in the Superstition Mountains. Do yourself a favor and stay as far away from those mountains as you can. I am an avid hiker, and when I can make the hours plus long drives up to the mountains, I enjoy nice hikes near my home. This one particular hike near my home is five miles in different directions, like a goosebumps book of sorts for hiking. You can only see the trees and the greenery on one hike, or a massive waterfall on another, follow the river on another, or see the abandoned and dilapidated mills from decades ago. I went to the waterfall this time and it was about two and a half miles in. I sat and did some work, enjoying the serenity. When I was ready to leave, I looked around and saw a family near me. I packed my things back in my day pack as they left. I am a major people hater. I prefer to hike in areas where there are no people for miles. I chose to go a different way back to the trailhead than the way I came, because I didn't want to run into this family for the next two and a half miles. I checked my map on my cell phone, and I found a route I could take back that seemed remote enough. I immediately noticed that this trail was not man-made, but just probably what was left after some flooding. It was going upriver anyway from the waterfall, and I was so close to the river, all I had to do was walk out onto a bent tree and I could touch the water. It was a very thin trail, not big enough for people to walk side by side, and it was covered in thick roots. I enjoyed this. It was peaceful. I passed some girls who had hooked up hammocks to read in about 20 feet to my right after I hiked this path for a little while, and I had nothing but the sound of a slow-flowing river to my left, until I heard lots of footsteps coming from behind me. I didn't want to deal with people behind me, so I stepped out onto a tree that hung over the river. I waited for them to pass. It was that damn family from the waterfall. I could have sworn they went the complete opposite direction, but whatever. I waited a few minutes before I started walking again, and I didn't want to run into them. Pretty soon, their voices disappeared in the distance. I was able to go back to enjoying the peace and beauty around me. I hiked for another five minutes or so when I had to turn a sharp corner around a boulder at a major bend in the river. This man, the father, was standing there on the other side, crouched down like he wanted to scare me. I screamed and he laughed. I got really angry and I noticed that his family was nowhere near us. I yelled, what the fuck is wrong with you? I didn't bother controlling my anger at being snuck up on by some stupid human. He wouldn't stop laughing. I realized that I was dealing with an idiot or a psychopath. I didn't want to deal with either, so I turned around and booked it. I could hear him behind me following. He wasn't a very big man. He stood about five foot six and was around 180 to 200 pounds, but he was keeping pace about 20 feet behind me. Let me tell you that this path is not for running. I very nearly went sideways into the river a few times, but this gave me a few ideas too. The routes I could mostly handle. I knew the terrain and the park pretty well. As long as I focused on my quickly placed steps around the thick root system and keeping my balance, I could make it. I was running back towards the waterfall, where surely there would be people around. It was a straight shot. But then, I remembered the hammock girls. I remembered that they were slightly hidden, and if I picked up the speed, the guy behind me would miss me because of the natural curves of this path. I sprinted on the trail and burst into the hammock girls' area. I sputtered out a quick and quiet explanation, man following me. They hid me behind the lowest hammock. It took us maybe five to ten seconds max to get set up. 
The three of us watched as this guy ran past not too long after I was safely hidden. I stayed with the girls for another few minutes, just to be safe. I explained the situation, catching my breath. I then went back the way I came from, up river. I did not want to run into this guy again. And you think it's over? No. As I, again, hiked up river on the trail, my original remote path back to the trailhead, I tried to calm myself down. I couldn't get my mind to stop thinking I was being followed. I just tried to hurry and get out of there as fast as I could. I turned a sharp right at the boulder that the man was hiding behind before and kept pushing through the rough trail. I tried to focus on the sound of the river that was still on my left, but I couldn't get the sound of my heart out of my ears. The sound of my pounding heart morphed into the sound of footsteps in an instant. I realized I was being followed again. I looked back, and guess who? This damn father again. I got mad as hell. I stopped and turned around. I yelled at him to stop following me. I screamed bloody murder at him. I yelled profanities, threw a damn pine cone at him. He smiled a toothy grin and kept walking slowly towards me as it bounced off his shoulder. He wasn't faced by any of it. He just kept smiling as if he and I were old friends. What he did not know is that I am an army combat veteran and a domestic violence survivor. I have PTSD from both, and I have skills that many don't have. This guy chose the wrong bitch to fuck with that day. I had had enough. I already hate people enough. But this guy was just crossing a million lines. So I charged at him. He finally wiped that stupid look off his face. I was seeing red at that point. Because I will not be made to feel unsafe in the only place I felt safe since I got divorced and went to war. Seriously. Fuck that guy. I ran directly at him. I knocked him down with the full force of my body crashing into him. I screamed at him as I hit him blindly. I grabbed his hair and the waistband of the back of his pants and started dragging him to the edge of the trail. He was the one yelling at me this time. Every time he fought back, I gave him a swift kick. I gave him several explanations for why his behavior was so stupid and then I unceremoniously kicked and pushed him into the river. I told him to cool off in the water and not to come out until I was gone. I turned back in the direction I'd been walking before, and decided that I need to take another detour, just to be safe by getting away from him, and also to get away from people. I knew there was a trail parallel-ish to the one that I was on to my right. I looked around for a clear place to climb up the steep hill, which was mostly granite and moss and ivy. I hadn't planned on impromptu climbing that day, but whatever. I found a spot and started climbing until I got scared out of my wits by three guys just sitting in the middle of this hill on a very small, mossy flat spot, all smoking weed. They were completely hidden. Once I caught my breath again, I asked if they heard me screaming, and they said that they did, but that they thought I had covered it. I rolled my eyes and told them to kick anyone down that hill that tried to follow me, and I continued on. It took me a while to go the two and a half miles back to the trailhead that day because I kept looking back, taking detours and hiding randomly. But when I did, I called the cops and alerted the park ranger about the guy. I don't know any other details on that. The cop laughed and said, good for you, when I told him what I did. I honestly doubt they did much because I never heard back. I have not been back to that place since, sadly. I just want to state before I finish this that I don't agree with any violence, but I wasn't getting out of there without it. I just want to hike in peace, and I would absolutely prefer it if I could do it alone and safely. Also, thank Cheez-Its for those hammock girls. And if that man is listening to this, fuck off, you creep. When I was probably 13, my family and I were on our way home from a Wednesday night church service. My mom was in the driver's seat and I was behind her in the back. My five-year-old brother was in the middle and my ten-year-old sister was on his other side. We were just down the road from the church but it was a country road and late 
so there was no light and no one else around on the road. We were just coming up to our turn when all of a sudden a car comes swerving from our turning spot. This little car was taking the turn so fast that they came into our lane and almost hit us. We swerved as they tried to get into their own lane before we collided. Unfortunately for them, they overcorrected and their car flipped and landed on the driver's side door in the ditch. My mom of course hits the brakes and immediately jumps out of the car to go help whoever was in there. She got about three steps away from our car and stopped dead in her tracks. My sister and I are sitting there with our mouths hanging wide open, having no clue what to do. All I could think is, this isn't actually happening to us. This kind of stuff only happens in the movies, but why isn't my mom going to help the person? It was summer, so we all had our windows halfway down. I heard a person start yelling help from the inside and my mom starts moving again to help him, but for some reason she stops again in the center of the road. Another car flies up behind us, and the guy doesn't hesitate to jump out. He runs straight up to the crash to help. The man gets to the car and starts prying the passenger door open so the guy inside can get out. I can see my mom, who wants to run and help, but it's like she can't move from that spot. The good Samaritan that pulled up behind us is able to get the door popped open, the guy from inside crawls out the door and gets into a frog-like crouching position on top of the car. At this point, my mom starts taking shuffle steps back to the car. When I look back at the guy, he has this crazy look on his face. He looks directly at our car and my mom and launches himself off the top of the car and hits the guy who was helping him. He starts running for our car at the same time my mom turns and runs for our car. He must have known he couldn't get there before my mom did because he changed directions and moves to the car behind us. My mom jumps in and locks our doors just as the guy jumps in the empty driver's seat of the car behind us. He slams on the gas before he has even closed the door and almost hits us a second time before taking off. The next thing we know, the guy who was just carjacked runs up to my mom's window and starts screaming and knocking on it. My mom is of course shaken and doesn't want to roll down the window so she settles for cracking it so she can understand what he is saying. He's yelling at us to call 911 because his phone was in the car, along with his girlfriend. So of course my mom starts searching for her cell phone, but because she's so frantic from what just happened, she can't seem to find it. So I take a break from keeping my little brother and sister calm and dial 911 on my phone and hand it to her. While she's explaining what happened to the 911 operator, we hear a woman scream down the road. The man that was at our window takes off running, and a few minutes later, comes back with a severely scraped up woman in his arms that turned out to be his girlfriend. My mom unlocks the door at this point, and he sets her in the passenger seat while we waited for the cops. The girlfriend told us that he noticed her while he was speeding off. He tried to hit her, but she scratched and punched at him while trying to plead with him to stop the car. He kept coming at her, though and finally rolled down the window and pushed her out going about 60. The cops finally show up and talk to all of us to get our stories. While talking to one officer, he told my mom that the man had shot and killed a man behind some apartment complex. That's why he was driving so fast and trying to get away. When we finally got to go home, we were all told to go to bed, but of course I wouldn't be able to sleep that night. I went downstairs to talk to my mom. I worked up the courage to ask her why she stopped running to the car when the other guy didn't. She told me she had such a strong feeling that she should stay in her car with us that it was almost like she could hear it. When she heard him start yelling for help, she ran to help him again. But just like the last time, she got the overwhelming feeling not to go to the car. To this day, I wonder what would have happened if my mom hadn't listened to that feeling. The man could have easily overpowered her and gotten to the car if she had been any further away. I should also mention that the man was caught that night trying to steal a new car. He'd obviously ditched the car he stole from behind us. So the thing that really helped him get convicted was that when the woman was fighting him off, she grabbed the wrap off his head before falling out. She didn't know she did till the police got there and found it by where she was pushed out. He did go to jail but I was never informed of how long or anything else.
and honestly, I never cared to ask. So I was around seven at the time, and it was the summer of 2011. I live in a pretty small village in France, where everyone knows each other and trusts each other. My parents were working all afternoon, and before going to work, they would drop me and my little sister off at our grandparents' house. Our cousin would also join so we could play and watch movies. It was a summer vacation, and as usual, with my cousin and my sister, both about three years younger than me, we took our bikes and went out to ride around where my grandparents were living. There was a field very near where we would always go, and a large place in front of it that served as parking for those who lived nearby. The place wasn't isolated. We had the order to get back home at 8pm from our grandma, because that's the time where our parents would come fetch us. While we were at the place, I remember there was a woman playing with her son in front of her house with a water gun and a red car parked in front of her house. I know this car wasn't a car from someone around, because I know that village very well, but I thought nothing of it. There was a guy sitting in the car during the whole time we were there with our bikes. That was the only thing I thought was weird. So anyway, after we finished eating at around 7pm, we begged our grandma to go out riding the bikes again. After lots of hugs and negotiations, she accepted, but she told us to be careful because it was getting dark, and we were to not follow or accept anything from a stranger. So we went out again. We got back to where we had been all afternoon before, but it was only my cousin, little sister, and I. I'm gonna be honest here, but for some reason I was so nervous that my stomach was hurting. I was almost crying. I didn't know why at the time and I thought I was afraid of vomiting because my stomach was hurting, so that's why I was nervous. At that age, vomit was my absolute phobia. Now that I'm older, I can only think that what I actually was feeling was anxiety. So, while my sister and cousin were talking and riding together, I was just sitting on my bike, trying not to cry and watching them. We stayed here for a while, and as usual, we didn't watch the hour. My grandma was used to us coming back late though, but we would get scolded every time. Then, the red car appeared again, except this time, there were now three guys in it. They all had lots of muscles and seemed to be in their thirties. They stopped by my little sister and cousin, and being the older one, I quickly approached to see what they wanted. I was, and still am, a really shy person, so I didn't tell them to leave us alone, because at that point, Something was just off, and I wanted to leave. The red car stops, and the guy that was sitting behind gets out, all smiling and appearing innocent. He said to us, Hey, I know where you live. We can give you a ride home. He was talking to us like we were babies. First, big red flag. I politely tell him that no, we're fine, and that we're about to go back to our grandparents' house anyway. He became angry, and that was the second red flag. He told us that he knew our grandparents, and that he was here to bring us back to them. At that point I was thinking, why would he bring us back in his car when their house is literally five minutes away? I asked him how he could bring us if we had bikes, and besides, there were only two seats free in his car. He became even more angry and told us to just get in the car. She'll sit on my lap. At that point, I don't really know. I'm thinking that maybe it's true, and he's getting impatient because we're already late. Maybe he had something else to do after bringing us back, but at the same time, I just had the word run in my head. So luckily this ends well, because it turns out we were late by a lot. Our grandmother had sent our grandfather to get us. When he arrived, he asked the guy what they were doing there. They just answered they were checking how we were and left. I told my grandpa what had happened, and I can promise you, I've never seen him so enraged before. He called them all the insults of the world and called the police right when we got home. That's when a seven-year-old me understood what the fuck actually happened. I was terrified of going out for so long, and now it's okay, 
but I'm still so anxious about being outside, even if I am with someone. Sadly, I don't know what happened next. I don't know if these guys were ever found, and I don't know if they tried kidnapping other kids. I don't know anything. I'm a 28-year-old female, and this just happened to me. I'm sure I will not be able to sleep. My boyfriend is not answering the phone, and I need to get this out. My company organized an event for the clients and staff at a luxury hotel. Everyone partied, and I got into my room at about 3.27 in the morning. Fifteen minutes ago, a guy entered my room with a bottle of water. It woke me up, and I was really scared. He says someone called from my room to order a bottle of sparkling water. So basically, I'm half naked in my bed. He comes closer to me at the level of the table, apologizing for the inconvenience. But he is still here, and I kid you not, he starts talking to me, saying how he's going to be in trouble and that kind of thing. How someone called, and he's so sorry, and the others got in the hotel super drunk, and it must have been a mistake. I swear he was standing really close to my bed for about five minutes. I was so shocked and I was just saying, no, no, it's okay. I just got scared, really, it's no problem. Just go. Well, he says he doesn't see me well, asks my name. Twice, he says. Well, so, uh, I guess I wish you a good night then. He kisses me on the cheek. He left after the longest minutes, saying he was really sorry and how he would appreciate that I don't tell anyone. After a short period, the phone in the room rang. I wasn't sure if I should be scared. Was he just confused by the mistake? I was so scared I couldn't think right. My heart was racing. After work, my co-worker and I walked downtown to the park. Her bus picks her up there and I'm meeting friends shortly for a concert. So we sat on a ledge and were chatting about work drama. The whole time we were there, a man had been about 10 feet away. He looked to be talking on the phone. After a few minutes, he starts meandering closer. My coworker pulled the mace out of her pocket and had it in her hand ready. He takes a few steps closer and stomps on the ground about a foot from us. And then he says, Why are you scared? My friend shoots back, because you're trying to scare us. He starts talking about how he would like to beat the shit out of stupid bitches. We didn't feel safe leaving. I was sure he'd follow us. He kept saying stuff like that and circling around behind us. We took the chance to get up and walk into a nearby Sephora. Huge massive props to their staff. They told us to stay as long as needed, and if he came in, to tell security immediately. We wandered around for a minute, but he was still clearly outside watching us. Finally, the manager offered to walk us out. She put herself between us and him, waited for my friend to get on her bus, and for me to get across the street for safety. Thank God for the Sephora staff. First, let me set up some background to make the flow of this story much smoother. This happened almost 19 years ago. I was nearly 13 years old and I was being raised by my grandparents. We lived in a little tourist town in Florida. They had problems with their daughters as adults and they wanted to do everything they could to make sure that I didn't turn out the same way. A do-over, if you will. So needless to say, they were very strict. My aunt was having a good period. She had her stuff together. We were all very close. My aunt understood what it was like to be raised under a glass dome, metaphorically speaking. They raised her too, after all. So being as she was my only aunt, she made sure that the time we spent together was always super cool. I would stay over Saturday nights. We would go and hang out at the pier, and she would let me hang out with my middle school boyfriend, who would always find ways to get to wherever I was. My grandparents had no idea of any of these activities, of course. I was just spending quality time with my aunt and giving them a break. It was nice that I had a younger female figure since my mom wasn't around. One night, when we were out having fun, my aunt meets this guy and they really hit it off. 
He was very nice and introduced himself to me. He went by the name JR and at first was a kind and charming talker. They exchanged numbers after hanging out a while and then we went home and went to bed. They ended up going out a bit more and my aunt really liked JR. He took her over to his home and introduced her to his father and showed her around his land. He lived out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. I've lived in this town for 30 years and I still to this day couldn't tell you where it is. I was only there once. He was teaching my aunt how to shoot a gun. I remember her shoulder rocking back with the impact of the shot and it surprising her. He had these weird flamenco dancing shoes in his closet. It was all seemingly harmless. I mean everyone has their quirks. About 10 days, maybe 2 weeks later, we were again at the pier out by the payphones talking about what to do that night and what to get for dinner. JR and my aunt were in the late 20s to early 30s and as much as she loved me, I imagine there were times that I got in the way. Well anyway, we were at the pier and he's talking about how he has these painkillers. He offered me one. I declined of course and told him I had a high tolerance to pain anyway. I didn't need that stuff. He then, with a huge smile, asks me if he can see for himself, assuring me he won't really hurt me, that he's just trying to have fun. This bastard twists my arm behind my back until I hear a pop. I start to cry and he laughs and says, Oh, sweetheart, I was only playing. You said you had a high tolerance. I guess I was stronger than I thought I was being. I'm sorry. No need to ruin the good time we're all having. I go in the private peer office, which my granddad managed, crying. My aunt comes in and lets me know that she thinks it's fucked up too, and that she talked to him about it. She goes back outside and he asks her what she's up to that night. She tells him that she isn't sure if I'm staying over because with what had just happened, I was whining about going home. I was pissed that she didn't deck him right there for hurting me. Well, he tells her that she should meet him under the sunset bridge at 2am on the other side of town. He says that the stars are beautiful and you can listen and hear the fish. He tells her he would love to see it with her and they can dance under the moon. We were all from a fishing family and lived in a fishing town, so fish activities under the bridge late at night wasn't necessarily something that threw up a red flag. If it's dark and late, there won't be people there hogging all the fish. She tells him maybe and we leave. I decide to spend the night after all, later sneaking in if she will pick up my boyfriend Charlie. She calls him when she gets home and says that she can come, but she will have me with her. He groans and says, fine, all right, I guess she can come too, maybe she will get tired and sleep in the car. About an hour later, after she called JR the first time I ask her about Charlie and she agrees, she sits down with me and hugs me and touches my face, lovingly apologizing for what happened with my arm. My aunt was an amazing woman and I love her very much. She then calls him again and tells him not to worry. She's picking up Charlie so I will have my own entertainment and they can have their time. He goes into a rage and starts sputtering and cussing about how it's too complicated now and he just wanted an intimate meeting with her, not a damn family reunion. He went on about how he didn't want to have to babysit a 13-year-old kid and her 14-year-old boyfriend. He hangs up after calling her a crazy bitch. She bewilderingly hangs up the phone and tells me what happened. We go about our night with pizza rolls and playstation and things are fine. He calls her a few more times and drives by the house for a couple of weeks, but my aunt was having none of it. After a while, he left our lives just as swiftly as he came. The whole affair lasted only a month, if even that. Three weeks, maybe. And all in all, it wasn't the craziest experience she has had with the man. JR was soon forgotten and we went about our business. Flash forward two years later. I'm almost out of middle school. My aunt had moved to a city about 40 miles away. I still lived with my grandparents. They were still strict, but as they had gotten older, so had I. I knew a few ways around the rules. One day my friend Frank and I missed the bus home from school and called our good high school friend Darla to pick us up and take us home after riding a bit. She had this big, beautiful red truck and I would ride around in the cab of it loving the freedom and the wind. We were smoking cigarettes and laughing, listening to the radio. 
The time I would have spent on the bus before my stop was just enough time to hit up the taco drive through We cruised down the road a bit before heading back to Frank and I's separate houses. He lived just down the road. We had a lot of fun that day. She dropped me off first. My grandparents came outside. They were heavily confused at the sight of an unknown vehicle, and even more so when they saw I had gotten out of it. After letting her be the one to explain she was older, cooler, and more responsible, my grandparents thanked her for being kind enough to take me home. They said how lucky I was that she just happened to be there to help me get home. The things we do to our parents, huh? That was the last time we ever saw my friend. She didn't show up for work for five days. I can't speak for everyone but I assume she just ran away. Darla's parents were going through a nasty divorce. The dad had a hot new girlfriend, and the mother was very bitter about it. Rightfully so, I guess. It was embarrassing for all of the kids. Her truck wasn't left behind. I figured she got tired of her parents acting like infants and took off. I missed her, but she was in a whole other league of freedom and coolness. 16 is a whole different level than 14 especially when you're in different schools. I wished her well, maybe even a bit envious that she got out of this town and I was still here. I hadn't heard anything for two weeks about her, when at about nine at night, my grandparents got a call to turn on the news. Darla's body was found out in the woods. She'd been strangled to death and just left out there. I don't even know for how long. I was devastated. I was so joyful that I had that last experience with her, but I was so saddened and horrified. She was so young, barely older than myself. She was about to be 17 in just a short time. It was a very sad time for our town. The good and the bad news is that they caught the guy that had done it. He confessed after some very incriminating evidence. And during his questioning, also confessed to killing his girlfriend who had been missing for about 8 years and also his father, staging his death to look like a suicide by hanging. When they showed his mugshot on the screen and said his name, I swear I almost passed out. There, clear as day on the screen, staring back at me, was a picture of J.R. I had no idea they even knew each other, and I can't even imagine what would have happened if we'd gone under that bridge that night. Investigation Discovery Channel did a piece on it a couple of years back, I was shocked to see it on the TV. The memories came rushing back and I decided to write them all down. I have a newfound appreciation of life now that I'm old enough to understand just how close I could have come to being killed. My aunt lived on to make some awesome new memories with me. I have a beautiful life with my husband and three boys. That most likely wouldn't have happened if things had gone differently that night. Alright, so check this out. I apologize for the length of this story. It's the most terrifying thing that I've ever experienced. This happened four years ago when my boyfriend and I were still sort of fresh into our relationship. My sister had recommended me a snorkeling trip for a fun thing to do with him. It was this quarry surrounded by a campground that's filled in with water and it's known for its crystal clear water and its diving. There's apparently a helicopter and a school bus that people dive down into the water to see. My boyfriend and I decided to go camping for the night. While we were checking in, we separately both got a bad feeling about the place, but we'd kept it to ourselves until after we left. So at first, it was a really good time. We snorkeled in the shallowish area of the quarry, and although the depth of the water was a bit uncanny, I was still enjoying myself. The water is 65 feet deep, so once you had swam out of the shallow area, it immediately dropped off and it was pitch black. This is actually where I realized I'm terrified of water. Besides the dark, deep water while you were swimming, there's something very scary about a lake that's perfectly still. I assume because it's a quarry, the water doesn't have a current. My boyfriend and I are winding down our night and we're back at our campsite. We're camping in a grassy patch down a hill from the road. Our tent is pitched in a wooded area that our campsite is extended to, and just across the green is a campsite that looks well lived in, 
but our neighbors were out. We're making hot dogs over the fire when our neighbors get back. It's nighttime now, and they immediately go to sleep. I'd say 20 to 30 minutes after they get back is when things started to become spooky. My boyfriend and I were chatting when we noticed a dark figure watching us from just up the hill. Because of the shadow of the fire, we couldn't actually make out the characteristics of the figure, but we knew he was staring directly at us, almost hiding behind our neighbor's truck. He had watched us for what felt like forever until he started walking down the road again. We both watched him in dead silence, watching him walk behind trees. The same ones connected to our campsite, but that also went in between us and him. I anticipated each time that I'd see him walk forward out from behind a tree. It was a good four or five he came out from. It wasn't until after seeing this I noticed he had stopped walking, or maybe he was still behind a tree. I was totally freaked out. Where did he go? I watched my boyfriend looking at what happened and thinking the same thing, but he had shrugged it off and I naively did too. We actually ended up forgetting about it and went to the quarry later that night. It was beautiful seeing the stars reflected against the water, but the deep, now all black water was terrifying to say the least. We walked back to our campsite, we laid in our tent, and we smoked a joint. I soon began to feel an uneasy feeling which I was trying to ignore, telling myself it's because I was just high. After some silence between us, my boyfriend says to me, do you feel like we're being watched? I said, why would you say that? Half joking, but full serious that I was scared. My boyfriend wanted to get out from the tent, so we're standing by my car and I got this stupid idea that being in the middle of the field that's in the middle of the campground is the safest place for us. My logic being if someone was going to come up at us, at least we'd be able to see them. So we're in the middle of this field when we see a similar looking shadow figure from earlier staring at us. He must have been about 20 yards away. We both notice him while walking and he's walking in the same direction that we are. We change directions and so does he. We tell one another if we change again and he does too, then we're just going to book it to my car. When we change, he follows, and we book it to my car. I watched him from my seat as he slowly walked back into the darkness while staring in our direction. My boyfriend at this point says, let's get out of here. I agree, but all of our camping gear is still outside. We quietly get our things together, not trying to freak the other one out. The weirdest part of this story, in my opinion, is the next part. My headlights weren't working, and there was a weird fog over my windshield that didn't go away no matter what we did. We had to drive out of the woods with only our low beams and a strange fog over the window. We could barely see, but we got out of there. And weirdly enough, the fog went away right as soon as we got to the gas station. We got home around 1 a.m., and I told my father the story the next day, and he said he's glad that we got out of there or else we could have been murdered. Two people have died at this campground while snorkeling, which I didn't find out until after I got back. My boyfriend and I think it was either a person trying to kill us or a Wendigo. We've kind of settled on the Wendigo because what happened was just so unexplainable to us. It was a few years ago. I was home alone at night in my bedroom. I was just chilling on my bed and I started to say, As it was in the summer, I left the door of my balcony wide open to let the fresh air in. Then for some reason I heard some noises coming from outside. It was as if someone walked into the garden. I wasn't immediately sure at the time if it was my cat or my parents coming home. Until I turned my head to the balcony door. I saw a pair of hands of some guy trying to climb my balcony. I panicked after seeing it and yelled, Is there someone there? Then the guy fell off and said, Oh sorry, it's just that me and my friends heard you singing and we thought you were in danger. So I decided to check if everything was okay. And then he left. I still don't know who that was. Maybe since the house next to ours was used as a vacation lodging, 
The guy and his friend probably just booked a house for a few days, but I can't be really sure. And still, if he was truly worried, then why did he try to climb my balcony instead of simply knocking on the front door? I used to frequent a relatively popular 11 and a half mile hiking trail. The lot that this trail is on is only about 50 or so acres, so the trail winds back and forth in order to fit. One day I was hiking, and this particular day was very nice. The weather was good, and I hadn't seen a lot of people. At one point, about 10 feet off my trail, I could see where I was going parallel to the same trail as it turned and snaked back about a mile ahead. I noticed that by that section of the trail, there was a fallen tree with three people sitting on it, a man, a woman, and a boy. This by itself wouldn't have been unusual as it's one of the most popular trails in the area, but the problem was they were sitting completely still and completely silent. Their backs were to me and they seemed to be staring straight ahead almost as if they were entranced. I was very unsettled, as this is obviously unusual behavior. I kept walking, but being as unsettled by it as I was, I looked back and was startled to find that they were gone. I stopped in my tracks, listening, but hearing nothing. And I'll tell you why this startled me. Any outdoorsman will tell you that sound travels in the woods. Sound becomes entrapped by the canopy and funneled through the trees. If somebody steps a hundred feet away, you're likely going to hear it. And I, having been raised in the woods, have ears attuned to such sounds. Yet those three people were able to move without me hearing a thing. I dismissed it. Maybe my mind was preoccupied and I just hadn't heard them. So I turned back around to keep walking and ahead of me on my section of trail, there they were, with their backs to me. I saw them silently walk away over a hill, and then I never saw them again. So now, not only had I failed to hear them, but I failed to see them walk past me, and I don't know how. I immediately called up my buddy. I told him the children of the corn were out at Swayback, and I kept him on the phone so he could send help, if he heard me get hit by a pitchfork or something. There's a possibility that I'm remembering details inaccurately, so what happened in reality might have much been less uncanny, but even still, this experience bugs me to this day. For a bit of background, I'm a 24-year-old female. I live with my roommate, who's a 23-year-old female. We live in an apartment in the suburbs of Atlanta. As you may know, Atlanta is dangerous and crime-riddled right now, so we have a ring peephole camera and a digital lock on our front door for safety. Now onto the story. About three months ago, the sweet family from across the hall moved out, and we got a new neighbor. His name is David, and let's just say he's interesting. When we first saw him moving in, we were a bit taken aback by the sheer amount of stuff he was trying to fit into his one-bedroom apartment. All of it was anime merch and Star Wars memorabilia. Definitely gives me hoarder vibes, but it's not my business, I guess. When the moving trucks left and a few days had passed, my roommate and I knocked on his door to give him a welcome to the neighborhood gift basket. It had some baked goods, dog treats and bags for his dog, and seasonal candles. Apparently, this was not the correct thing to do. After that day, David got creepy. It started out innocent enough. He would come to the door whenever he heard me or my roommate coming or going to have a quick chat. Or he would come over regularly to ask for salt or sugar or toilet paper. Sometimes he would ask if we could come over and watch his dog. But within the past two weeks, things have really escalated. Two weekends ago, we were out pretty late partying at the bars near Brave Stadium. We ended up getting home at around 3am, only to find David sitting at the top of the stairs waiting for us. He acted all upset, asked us where we had been, 
He then requested that we tell him if we're planning to be out past midnight. I laughed in his face and he called me a mindless Stacy. He also asked for access to our ring camera so we could make sure we're safe. We laughed at him again and went into our apartments. Here's the scary part. We checked the ring the next morning. He sat outside of his apartment staring at our door for the rest of the night. When we saw that, we contacted the complex to let them know that he was acting crazy. They told us to contact the police, and so we did. The police told us to contact them if he made any threats, but since we lived in a shared space, they couldn't do anything until he entered our apartment or threatened us. I assume the complex said something to him, because he left us alone for the next five days or so. This week, he's out of control. He's constantly sitting outside of our apartment. My roommate has started leaving for work an hour earlier, so that she doesn't have to cross paths with him. I cannot leave the apartment during the day, because he's constantly outside waiting for me. He's asked me out, left love letters on our door, on our cars, and in our mailbox. I told him once that I wasn't interested, and he told me that he would end himself if I didn't go on a date with him. Of course, I don't have that in writing, so the police won't do shit. He has also put up a ring doorbell of his own so he can track all of our movements. He will leave really creepy sexual notes when we're gone so that we find them when we come back. So what do we do? I'm a court clerk. I work for my local courthouse. I work in the clerk of courts, both in the office and in court. On Friday, the 4th of February, 2022, I was in the office at my desk. I also will assist with customers who come into our office, who have questions on certain types of filings. I'm the backup coverage specifically for our records window. In my state, we are considered public records. Anyone can come in and request copies from any case unless it's juvenile, confidential, or sealed by court. I was asked to cover the records desk from 4 to 4.30 p.m. last Friday, so our records clerk could leave a little early. No problem. I have no issues helping out when I can. Around 4.15, we had a frequent flyer, as we have so dubbed them. This man comes in frequently to get copies out of his case. I should really note the way my office is set up. It is a bit important. We are set up kind of like the DMV. You have to come into the main entrance of security, go down a long hallway, and it opens up into a lobby. There are elevators straight ahead. The DA's office is to the left, and the COC is to the right. You have to open up a separate set of doors into our little lobby. There's a counter with windows, and it's in an L shape. The records window is around the corner, tucked in the back. There are also three public terminals where any member of the public can use to research cases in my county. So back to the man. We'll call him Joe. Joe has an open family case. He comes in probably once a week to get copies out of his family case. I don't really know what he's doing. It's really none of my business. He came up to my window somewhere around the 4.15 to 4.20 mark. Said he requested some documents. When documents are requested from the public terminal, they go to a queue, which I then go into and select them to print. I went into the queue glanced down at the documents and asked, Did you have 11 pages? He said yes, so I selected and printed. I wrote him a little slip out with a number of copies and his total load. I gave him the slip, directed him to go back to window 405 for payment, and would meet him up there. I went to grab the copies off the printer, which jammed, messed with that for a minute, counted the pages and took them to the cashier. I then went back to my counter to help the next person in line, the next customer was easy. Her records were prepaid and printed. After the second customer, it was 425. My coworker asked me if I wanted to go thrifting for clothes at Plato's Closet after work, and my answer was, fuck yes, let's go. Right as we're discussing this, I am in view of the records window, but not at it. I saw that Joe had returned to my counter. I went up to the counter and asked how I could help him. He stated, you must be new. I'm not new. I've been at my job for almost four years and in the legal field for almost ten. I replied, No, I'm not. 
How can I help you? He then made a comment about a paperweight I was using. It was a gift from my niece. A painted rock from a three-year-old. That's a fancy paperweight you have there. Sir, what can I do for you? You gave me the wrong case. No, sir. I printed off what was in the queue, so you don't need these four pages. I tossed the four pages and then adjusted his slip. Seven pages total. I sent him back to the cashier. At this point, it's 4.30. It's Friday and we're closed. I left and headed to Plato's closet. It took me about 15 minutes to drive over there. I sat in my car for a few minutes and then went inside. I beat my coworker there. I started browsing, and a couple of minutes later, my coworker arrived, stating she got caught behind a train. So we start shopping and chatting. For some reason, I looked at the door, and when it opened, there was Joe. Now I knew it was Joe because he wears that dumb sock monkey hat. I saw him and got my coworker's attention. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? I said to her, so I pulled her into an aisle and we ducked down. She's short and I'm tall, and I wear heels a lot. I could watch his dumb hat around the store. He immediately went to the back of the store. He looked like he was rubbernecking the whole area. So he goes to the back of the store, grabs a pair of shoes, glances at them, and continues rubbernecking. I continued to watch him as he moved. We moved opposite. We were legitimately hiding behind the clothing rack. He moved around the perimeter of the store, continuing to rubberneck, looking for something or someone. So he leaves and we freak out. We check the parking lot to make sure he's gone. We try and shake it off and chalk it up to coincidence. And then, I realized we were talking about it, literally right in front of him. And my co-worker, she's not quiet. She gets scolded on a weekly basis for her loud, carrying voice. I told the cashiers what happened. We ended up leaving like an hour later. The next day, I felt uneasy about it. I called my boss and told her what happened. I told her I was going to call the police. I called the non-emergency number and left a message with dispatch. I got a call from an officer a few hours later and explained what happened. He said to get Joe's name. Dispatch told me he would call me back on Wednesday when he was back on duty. I got Joe's name and called the officer back on Monday. I left him a voicemail. Monday was fine. Tuesday I was out of the office. But Wednesday, Joe came back Wednesday. He came at 4.20pm to file documents into his case. He took 20 minutes to file two affidavits and a motion. It should have been like a minute, maybe two because he needed something notarized. He left and I had a bad feeling. I called the officer and told him what happened. The officer said if he comes back Thursday to call, and they would come down and talk to him. The police department is across the street from the courthouse. Thursday rolls around, no Joe, until 4.25. He beelined it for the computer in the corner. I messaged my boss. We had already put into place a safety plan. The sheriff's deputies who work security were notified. Three deputies followed him into my office. I called the police department. Two officers came down and they questioned him. He admitted to being at Plato's closet. He was shopping for his two young daughters. They don't fit into clothes at Plato's yet. Plato's has a sister store, once upon a child. Those kids don't really fit there either. So he had a receipt in his car for once upon a child for 5.07 p.m. He denied hearing my conversation with my coworker. He stated he left my office at 4.15ish and took his children shopping for clothes. He did not have his children with him at the courthouse or Plato's. He also asked the officer immediately and unprompted, Did she call you? He also believed his ex-wife was setting him up. So because my office is a public office, and he has made arguably legitimate reasons to come into my office, there's nothing the officers can do. They issued him an oral warning and put him on standby. The kicker is, he could opt into his case electronically but he made a big deal about not being able to opt in a few months ago. We told him if he's having issues, call the court support line and they would be able to remedy the situation. Instead, he chooses to come in and pay the $1.25 per page instead of a one-time $20 fee. Apparently, he also paid that. If you weren't already freaked out, last year, 
His roommate filed a restraining order against him, followed by his roommate's girlfriend alleging sexual harassment. I won't go into details. Let's just say it's more than messy. He is also filing extremely high-level types of documents for representing himself. Over a week later, I was in court all day. I came down to my desk around 4 or 5 p.m. He came in at 4.10 p.m. I left while he was still at my office. What am I supposed to do? The officers can't do anything. I need another incident outside my office to file a restraining order. I've ordered home security. I've signed up for self-defense classes. I'm purchasing mace and looking into handguns. I don't know what else to do. I'm a 23-year-old female. I live at a funeral home owned and run by my dad. I live in the apartment upstairs and do some side work for my dad, but I don't work for the funeral home. Since I live here, though, I tend to interact with a lot of people who are here for funeral-related things and whatnot. I represent my dad when I'm speaking to someone here, so I'm always nice and helpful. I had a couple of crazy people I had to deal with, but nothing like this. This was in mid-March sometime because it was right at the beginning of the whole COVID takeover. I had gone to pick up some food for my family at around 6pm. Unless there is a service, the employees are usually gone, and I believe it was a Saturday as well. So I pull into my parking lot, and as I park, a car drives by me going towards the entrance side. It was a dark SUV and there are so many people who work here who have similar cars. I couldn't see from that far who it was but I gave a quick wave thinking it was someone I knew. Bad idea. So the car stops and the guy gets out. Like I said, I'm used to having to help people and tell them where to pick things up or drop things off. So this guy gets out and comes towards my car. I roll my window down a bit, expecting just to say hello and tell him that no one is here working. He comes over to my window and starts leering in, peering into my car which was a red flag as it was very intrusive. So this guy basically had his head in my car and it creeped me out. But before anything else, his eyes scared the shit out of me. He was very, very pale, with bright red hair and his eyes were literally the craziest and scariest eyes I've ever seen. It was chilling. I don't know if he was on drugs or just crazy, but I'm already uncomfortable at this point. So he starts to talk to me and asks me if I work here, blah, blah, blah. I tell him no, no one is working and to please call in the morning. He could speak to someone then. I thought that would be it, but it was not even close. This man came to bring an application to my father to work for the funeral home. He was apparently in IT or something, but had studied in bombing and also volunteered for the Red Cross. He was talking a mile a minute and I was so incredibly uncomfortable, but even more so when he started to tell me about certain embalming techniques he studied, and that included hanging cadavers by their feet and other insane sick stuff. He had absolutely no experience in embalming though. He cornered me in my car for 15 minutes and just rambled. I told him several times, please just call in the morning. I really can't help you. So now I'm sitting there in my car, with this insane man outside of it. I also had my food on my seat. He was looking into my car, so he saw it. You would think he would take a hint. At some point I messaged my husband and said, Come outside now. Thank God he actually saw my text and came out. So he comes up to this guy and says, Can I help you? So the guy starts cornering my husband as well. This guy had absolutely no idea what personal space was, and my husband kept backing up and he would move in closer every time. I took an opportunity to grab the food and get out since he was outside. When I got out, he started telling my husband and I, the virus is going around and there's going to be bodies piling up. They're going to need extra help here when there are hundreds of dead bodies. It almost seemed like he was excited at the thought. He had a resume with him. I told him multiple times to please bring it by in the morning. I didn't want to touch anything he had, but he forced it into my husband's hands. I went to the stairs and gave my husband a concerned look and motioned for him to come in. 
This guy made me so extremely nervous. I didn't want my husband out there any longer, but this man was almost impossible to walk away from. He didn't understand that it was done. So eventually we got away from this freak and got inside. I immediately called my dad to explain what had happened and warn him of this guy. I told my dad I've never felt more uncomfortable in my life and that there was something seriously wrong with this guy. I wanted to warn him that he was probably going to be back the next day. And guess what? He came back. A couple days later, mid-morning, I'm upstairs in my apartment and there are several employees in the office upstairs. I hear someone ring the doorbell once, twice three times. He then proceeded to ring non-stop for 15 minutes. They assumed it was him and didn't answer. I went out to see what was wrong with the doorbell. They knew it was him apparently because he had called earlier and wanted to talk to my dad and one of the employees told him we weren't hiring but he insisted on talking to my dad so he came by. Then after the doorbell went off for several minutes the phone started ringing off the hook. Next, he was going around to all the windows and pounding on them relentlessly. I had told them how crazy he was, but I was glad they could now see what I meant and that I wasn't overreacting. Eventually, my older brother went down. The man cornered my brother the same way and would not let him leave and end the conversation. We were all just thinking what is wrong with this guy. My dad did not want to talk to him, but he would not give up. The next day, he comes back again. The same thing happened, banging on the windows and ringing the bell, calling incessantly. Eventually my dad's secretary answered the phone and put him in his place. They told him if he ever called again, they would call the cops. The best part is that every time he showed up, he showed up in full top to bottom biker gear, spandex, helmet and knee pads, even though he apparently lived a few streets over. This guy was absolutely nuts. I'm so thankful he hasn't come back. We all make dumb decisions in life, but in this case, I was stupid, very stupid. I arranged to meet a guy off Tinder, but because of my heightened anxiety about driving, I arranged for him to pick me up outside of my place. I had been talking to him for a few weeks at least, but that is not redeemable and I know that. The choice I made on this day could have ended me, but thankfully I'm still around to tell the tale. The guy picked me up in his car and told me he planned to take us out for sushi. I love sushi, so I thought, great. He put the name of the restaurant into his GPS and we were off, making pleasant conversation on the way there, until until I started seeing woods when I looked out the window. I felt very confused. We were supposed to be going into town, not into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. Fear hit me hard then. He said to me, I swear the GPS is taking me through here. I didn't choose this path. Please just get me back to civilization, I said. My eyes were wide and I must have looked like a deer in headlights. His face was really apprehensive so he must have known that I was scared completely shitless. Oh my god, I thought to myself. I should have just conquered my anxiety about driving and met him somewhere in public. Or better yet, not met with this guy at all. What the fuck was I thinking? I'm gonna get murdered here in these woods. I kept checking my phone to see if I could assist him with the GPS, and that's when he said those spine-chilling words. There's no signal out here. I remember just thinking to myself to try to look calm. Don't let him think you suspect he's going to do something. But man, did I feel terrified. The tips of my fingers were cold while I was simultaneously sweating. If he was going to kill me, part of me wanted him to get it over with so I wouldn't be left in anticipation. His forehead was perspiring. He kept saying, I swear I'm not doing this. I'm trying to get us back en route to the sushi place. I replied to him, I don't care about sushi anymore. Get us to a gas station, anywhere with people at this point. He then said to me, I don't have a shovel or a weapon in my trunk or anything, if that's what you're thinking. That did little to calm my nerves. We finally reached the restaurant after what felt like an eternity. 
I'd never been so scared in my life. I didn't have much of an appetite, and I was physically trembling when we arrived. But I figured, he didn't kill me when he had the chance, so I guess it was safe now to continue on with our day. I already planned on taking an Uber home because I didn't want to go through that experience again. I was shocked out of my mind when he then asked, So, when do you think we'll have sex? I nearly choked on a piece of sashimi. What? I didn't know where this was coming from, and I didn't know how he could ask me something like that on a first date. He literally just saw me pale as a ghost just moments ago. You know, like how long will you make me wait for sex? A day, a week, a month. I stared at him, dumbfounded. I couldn't respond because I was utterly speechless in that moment. Well, I can't wait a whole month, I'm telling you now, he said. I didn't say anything, and the rest of the date was insanely awkward. I said goodbye as I took my Uber home, and only seconds after my driver pulled out of the restaurant parking lot, he texted me to say he doesn't think it would work out, because he needs a girl with a higher libido. I didn't argue. I just messaged back a simple, okay, ready to be done with this man. When the Uber driver drove me home, he didn't take me through the wilderness pathway of a potential murder site. He took me home through the streets, other cars, lights, the sweetest scene to my immense relief. I couldn't help but wonder why my date had to take me through an hour drive through the wilderness just to get to a restaurant that took my Uber driver 15 minutes to get me home from. The whole thing was chilling. I don't know if my date planned on anything sinister or if it was an honest mistake, but I am glad I made it out alive. I learned a tough lesson that night, one that I should have already known, but that I foolishly ignored for some reason. Don't let strangers from dating apps pick you up in their cars. So, it was a rite of passage, as a youth, to jump off a cliff. One summer my town was offering a bus ride on certain days for kids to pay three dollars and they could spend the entire day swimming at the beach in Delta Lake in upstate New York. So my friend and I decided to go, but our main goal was to leave the beach area and go over to the cliffs of Delta Lake. This was our perfect chance to have the thrill of cliff jumping and live to tell about it. So once we were dropped off, we hatched a plan to leave the beach area, swim across an inlet, climb the hill to the nearby road, and walk to the cliffs took about 30 minutes to get there. Once there, there were about a dozen people watching others jump and enjoying the day. Eventually it was our turn to make our way down to the jump off point. I won the bet with my friend on seeing who would jump first. So the guy in front of me jumps, creates a big splash, and then comes up to the surface faking like he's unconscious and face down. He eventually moves out of the way and I can begin my descent to the cliff's edge. As I'm nearing the ledge, I hear screaming. I look down and see the body come up from the water in exactly the same manner as the previous jumper, face down, not moving. Eventually, you could see his muscle striations because his skin was gone. Eventually, the body turns over in the water and is actually facing up, arms out of the water and a crevice in his face. At that point, I just realized what was down there, and I climbed back up to safety. When I get back to the top, all I recall was a lady running in circles screaming the whole time about what she had just saw. The event was surreal. Needless to say, my friend and I never did jump off those cliffs. We went back to the beach area and went home feeling bummed out for not jumping off the cliffs, but scared at what we just witnessed. This happened in the mid-1970s, and my friend and I were probably 11 or 12 years old. This is still vivid in my memory to this day.
I started working part-time at a local gas station convenience store over the summer of 2016, just to earn some extra cash while attending college. When I was hired, I was informed that female employees were never scheduled to work overnight shifts. I was relieved to hear that. I wasn't so much worried about my safety, but I was concerned about getting enough sleep before classes. It wasn't long before I found myself dreading the days I had to work though, as the job turned out to be much more difficult than I'd anticipated. We were always short-staffed, which forced us to multitask between running cash registers, preparing food, keeping eyes on the pumps, cleaning, stocking, and all that. To make matters worse, the two women who managed the place were awful in every way. I frequently found myself biting my tongue and talking myself out of quitting. I was especially on edge when they cut our 15-minute break down to 10 minutes, as I never seemed to find enough time to use the restroom and smoke a cigarette fast enough. But it wasn't until several annoying encounters with a regular, James, that I finally started to break. James was younger than me, maybe late teens or early twenties. He thought he owned the place. Perhaps being the grandson of one of the managers gave him a sense of entitlement to fuck with people there. The first time I met James, he approached the counter to purchase some chewing tobacco. As I was ringing him up, I asked to see his ID. He told me who he was related to but I politely asked to see his ID again because I was new. Another employee overheard our conversation and assured me he was old enough, so I went ahead and rang him up. Staring at me intently the whole time, he looked down at my name tag and said, Mindy, that's a pretty name. I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his dick, but he continued talking to me asking several personal questions. He wanted to know where I live, what my last name was, whether or not I had a boyfriend, and other intrusive questions. Meanwhile, a long line had formed behind him, and not trying to be rude, I said something along the lines of, Sorry, there's a line behind you. I casually motioned for the next customer to move up, but James didn't leave. He simply stepped to the side and continued talking to me, watching me as I rang up each customer. It was immediately uncomfortable and unsettling for me, but I did my best just to pretend like I wasn't bothered, even when his persistence escalated and another co-worker told him to leave me alone. James soon began to make more appearances after that, the second time being with his girlfriend and another male friend by his side. Yes, he had a girlfriend. I was very confused when he started flirting with me again, but this time, it was right in front of her. But oddly enough, she didn't say a word. I just brushed it off and played along assuming he's just the goof that my co-worker said he was. But when he sat in a booth with his sidekicks at the back of the store, I could still feel his eyes burning a hole right through me. Over time, I got more suspicious of James. I would witness him do and say countless things to hurt others. I knew that he was annoying, and I had learned to brush it off as an all-in-good-fun type of humor like everyone else did. But when I caught him making fun of another co-worker to her face, all I could feel was anger toward him. I removed her from the situation by taking her place at the register. I could tell she was very hurt and embarrassed by his comments. And by doing so, it was apparent to James that I didn't approve. He would continue to cruelly harass this poor girl, and even some of the customers who came in. But trying to make him stop was like scolding a child. I didn't lash out at him though. I just began to ignore him. James then started playing these head games with me while I was working. He would take soda and candy and walk outside without paying for it. And then he would come back in the store saying he forgot to pay. He knew he'd always get his way with it because his granny was the manager. By this point, it wouldn't surprise me if he really was stealing gas and food from the store. There was something very dark and strange lurking behind his goofball facade. I avoided him like the plague though it was nearly impossible to do at times. Then one day, while I was working alone with another co-worker, we were very busy with tasks as usual, when lo and behold, James walked in by himself. I muttered under my breath, pain in the ass, and I walked straight back into the freezer to finish what I was working on earlier. And then he followed me inside the freezer. I didn't know he was there until he walked up right behind me, he asked why I didn't greet him anymore, 
Startled, I jumped and quickly turned around, grabbing my chest and asking him what the hell he was doing back there. He laughed as I told him I was busy and reminded him that only employees could be in this area. He ignored everything I said. He instead proceeded to ask me personal questions, just like he did the day I first met him. You never told me where you live, he said. I'm curious about you. I just want to know. Tell me where you live. He was moving closer and closer toward me, literally backing me up to the corner of the freezer. Are you afraid of me, Mindy? He asked. I tried to push past him, telling him to move, but he kept stepping in front of me to block my way out. Not until you answer me, he said. I started calling out for my coworker who showed up and gave him hell for being in the freezer. I was finally able to push past James and I made my way to the front counter, where I looked at the clock and saw that it was my time to go home. I gathered my things and punched out as quickly as I could, but James followed me out to the parking lot. I swiftly got into my car, but James had managed to grab the top of my door before I was able to shut it. Come on, just let me see your ID, he persisted. I repeatedly told him no before I found myself practically begging him to let go of my door so I could go home. He then grinned at me and said, Do not make me follow you, Mindy. Chills ran down my spine. Knowing how bold of a person he was, and considering the fact he literally just cornered me in the freezer only minutes ago, I highly expected him to follow through. Threatened by visions of what my drive home might soon look like, I became angry. I looked at him dead on before shouting, let go of my fucking door and stay away from me. I then grabbed the door handle and ripped the door shut as hard as I could. He tried yanking on the door handle from the outside to open it, but luckily I'd locked the doors in time. He then continued to knock on my window, asking to see my ID, but I started my car and backed away from him. I turned the wheels and hightailed it out of there, while well, he just stood there and watched me speed off. I was never so glad to get away from him, but I was paranoid the whole way home, thinking he could possibly catch me up on the road, even though I never saw his vehicle behind me. I would end up quitting the job after this, but I didn't care that my hiring manager was pissed about it. I had had enough of everything. Dealing with James was the last straw. I didn't bother explaining anything to my manager, because it was apparent to me that James was probably never held accountable for anything he ever did wrong in his life, and he likely never would be. I never saw him again after that, and I hope I never do either. James was a jerk, a clown, a joker, but he was also borderline psychotic. I'm a 27-year-old female, and at the time this occurred, I was a senior in high school, angsty and steadily into partying. For this story, I'm going to hide her identity solely due to the rules on Reddit. Let's call her Kay. Kay almost cost me my life, and I never want to see her again. A little backstory on Kay. She had grown up privileged, given anything she ever wanted. Her parents adopted her five cousins, and this was when she started to rebel. Her parents, well off, started to pay less attention to her, so Kay had all the freedom in the world. At the time the incident occurred, Kay was 18, and I had just turned 18. We were headed to a kickback at these guys' house. Nothing more than a little weed was expected. Now, I had my share in smoking weed, popping pills here and there. I had just tried ecstasy the summer prior. However, I was planning on staying sober. She picked me up, and we stopped to buy cigs at a gas station. I bought a fountain drink, one with a straw and everything. This is crucial for later in the story. We arrive at the apartment, and everyone is smoking, including Kay, but I declined. She would always say shit about how she never wanted to get high alone, complained about how I never got as high as her, so I obliged, and I cleared the bong off her hit, not even taking a full hit. She asked for a drink of my soda, and I handed it to her. 
She had it for a good minute. I had my head turned, talking to someone at the kickback. When I looked back at Kay, she was messing with my straw. I didn't think much of it, and she handed it back to me. Within about 30 minutes or so, I started to feel intensely high, to the point that I needed to escape from the group. I go out front to smoke a cigarette, only to find that I couldn't stand up, so I laid on the front porch. Then all of these dark thoughts flashed across my mind. I felt so sick, like my stomach was being torn open. I couldn't stand up. I had to crawl to the bushes to throw up. I thought to myself, all of this off clearing a bong? So I laid back on the porch. The apartment was located on a busy street in the city I live in. I also thought about running into the traffic, because I felt like I was dying. So I gave myself two options. I could run into the traffic, have a car hit me, and end this horrible pain I was in, or I could get some help, maybe flag someone down. My mind wasn't in the right state. I knew nobody at the kickback would take me seriously. I knew something was terribly wrong. I thought about calling my mum. I must have dialed her number and hung up like five different times. Finally, I called and told her what had happened and that I didn't know why I was so high. Nobody else was feeling the way I felt. What seemed like an eternity later, Kay came outside looking for me. As I'm puking my guts out into the bushes, she asked me if I want to go get some food. I asked her if she was fucking serious. She laughed as I puked. What I didn't know is that my mother had called my older brother to pick me up, since he lived close to where I was. He showed up with a machete ran inside and threatened people. He didn't know who gave me what. It wasn't until I got home that my brother took a look at one of my eyes and noticed how dilated my pupils were, so they rushed me into ER, after more puking of course. My memory there is a bit fuzzy. I just remember asking my sister-in-law if I was going to die and telling her that I was scared. They ended up sedating me due to the fact that I was yelling and threatening the nurses. Totally out of character for me. They did a tox screen, drug test, and found MDMA. The drug found in ecstasy, along with other drugs in my system. I'm assuming the other drugs were the ones used to make up the ecstasy. Now, this is all frightening and everything. However, what I found out a few days later shocked me to my core. Kay said, Kay had been to a house party the next night. Somebody there had said she was passing out free ecstasy to four different people. Of those four people, three had grand mal seizures and had to be taken to the ER by ambulance. I'm assuming that whatever ecstasy she used was a bad batch. Remember when she asked to have a drink of my soda? I assume this is when she dropped the pill inside and it dissolved. She probably crushed it beforehand or something. I have no clue, but at this time in my life, I hadn't done drugs for quite a while, especially not ecstasy. Kay also went on to tell people that I was the one who slipped her the drug, and that she had to go to the hospital. She is a pathological liar, and has had to go to therapy for a long time for mental disorders. All of this happened because she wanted me to be high like her. I could have committed suicide because I wasn't in the right frame of mind. It still affects me to this day. I know it sounds cliche, but I have a hard time trusting people with this experience among other things. I don't like sharing drinks with my friends. I get scared when I go out to a bar or club, fearing the worst. I mean, if my own friend had done this to me, what's stopping a stranger? So I always guard my drink, no matter what. It was a lovely day, yesterday to be exact. My wife turns to me around six-ish and says, Hey, I'm craving a McFlurry. Can we go to McDonald's? Now, mind you, I'm a bit blazed. Not totally stoned but enough to be relaxed and still sane of mind. I didn't want to go, 
but with my wife's puppy eyes, I simply couldn't resist. So off we go. A bit of backstory about my car, because it is important. I drive a small, green box car with somewhere around 7 to 10 stickers on it. Mostly they're video game and anime themed, but I have two that are vitally important to this story. Mrs. and Mrs. and... Sorry I missed church, I was practicing witchcraft and becoming a lesbian. I'm fairly certain these two stickers are the reason for this story. So we pull into the drive-thru. We order our McFlurries and wait. By this point, we're still at the speaker and waiting for the cars to move up. In comes Staring Lady. The Staring Lady pulls in behind us in a white Nissan Frontier, and I notice her staring at my stickers. I know she is because she leans over her steering wheel to get a better look. I'm very much used to this, and it is kind of the reason I put them there. Nine times out of ten, I get a laugh or a smile, sometimes a few pictures. Whether it's because it's cringy or because they don't like it, I don't care. I made someone smile. Anyways, after she stares at my car for a few minutes, I see her back up and start to pull around. I pay no mind. The line is still at a standstill, so I think she got fed up with waiting. It wasn't until my wife says, uh, is that lady staring, that I even noticed what was going on. This lady straight up luigi does. She slowly drove around the cement barrier between drive through and pass through and stared as she drove past. Whatever. Crazy lady, right? Well, she parks in one of those spots near the entrance and idles there. My wife says, wouldn't it be funny if she followed us? I laugh. Of course it would, because she's crazy enough to do that during the day. Fifteen minutes pass. We paid for our food, now we're waiting for the ice cream. And guess what? The lady is still sitting there. We finally get our ice cream, and at this point, she's been idling at that spot for nearly twenty minutes. I, trying to reason with the matter, say, well maybe she ordered her food and forgot, so she just went around and parked. Sure. Wrong again. As soon as I pull out of the drive-thru, she puts her truck in reverse and starts to follow us. Naturally, I start blurting. Jesus, you've got to be kidding me. There's no way. As soon as the guy in front of me waiting for traffic to clear moved, I floored it right behind her, and she was right on my tail. I'm panicking. Who does this in broad daylight in front of dozens of people and cameras? So my driving instincts kicked in. I've got the love of my life with me and our baby boy, Atlas, our two-year-old Dutch Shepherd. No way am I letting some crazy bitch drive us off the road because she's a homophobic bigot. Not happening. I do a quick turn onto a side street. She follows suit, I floor it, and she floors it. And damn me if a red light doesn't cut us off. Thankfully another car pulled into the turn lane beside me, so we had two cars between us. As soon as the light turned green, I floored it again. This time, I cut in front of the two cars that were in front of her. I quickly turned onto the main road that the other two cars had been heading towards. I knew if I just got out of line of sight, I'd be in the clear. Thankfully, I was right. I turned onto the main road, glanced in the rearview mirror, and noticed that the car behind me was taking his sweet time turning. Perfect. I take another left onto a random side road, then another left, and parked in someone's driveway. We sat there for roughly ten minutes while we tried not to cry as our adrenaline melted away, along with our McFlurries. Crazy McDonald staring lady, please get some help. It was Christmas time. My wife and I were staying at her childhood home, where her mother now lived, all alone. Well, not if you include the cats. The house was on a quiet cul-de-sac in the suburbs. If you're picturing freshly mowed lawns, American flags, and empty sidewalks, you're picturing it right. It's a single-story home with an attached garage out front. The garage has two doorways, apart from the electric garage door, of course. One leads to the garden and backyard. This had an old doggy door from their days with dear old Max, R.I.P. Max. 
that they covered with a piece of nailed in wood that had always made me slightly uncomfortable before, but I figured it had been that way for years, so what's the worst that could happen? The second door leads to the kitchen, hollow core. It could stop a mouse, but not much else. Definitely not something that wanted in, or someone. We were asleep in my wife's childhood bedroom at the front of the house, 3 a.m. I was in that deep, dark, recess of sleep. You know, you're in the diving bell, and you're submerged hundreds of meters below the surface in black water, protected from the real world by miles of nothingness. Then I heard it, the scream. What are you doing? It was my mother-in-law's voice echoing down the hallway, to me, lost in a sea of sleep. It sounded like a jet engine roaring past my eardrum. What happened next happened in a matter of seconds. But about that scream, even though I was dead asleep, I heard enough of it to sense an urgency behind it. It wasn't an, oh, you scared me type of scream. It was different, and I knew it, not consciously. But my lizard brain, that piece we all retained from our primitive ancestors, knew something was wrong. I watch and read a fair amount of true crime, and this scream awakened that horrible fear. The one that says, this can't really be happening to me, can it? Honestly, in that second of the night, it sounded like someone was about to be murdered. You ever wonder if you're a fight or flight type of individual? I always have. I came to know something about myself after this night. I'm a fighter. I leaped out of bed, growled, yes, growled, in the manliest voice I could muster, I'm gonna kill you, motherfucker, and took off running. I tore open the bedroom door and I ran into the hallway. There at the end, I saw my mother-in-law, nightgown on, look of utter shock on her face, standing still. We make eye contact. As I continue towards her, she turns her head, looks directly into the kitchen. I hurry past her and round the corner into the kitchen. The hollow core door is obliterated, shards everywhere. I look through the open frame and see the electric garage door is open. I push ahead. As I run into the garage, I hear it the sound of someone hopping into a running car just out of view. Just as I make it onto the driveway, I see a car peeling out from the sidewalk adjacent to the house. But the adrenaline is still pumping. And who am I to say no to adrenaline? So like an idiot, I run barefoot after the car. I give a good go, but I'm no Michael Johnson. And even he couldn't catch a speeding car. It soon vanishes down the street, and I'm left all alone. The police showed up within three minutes, which, I have to say, makes me feel a lot more at ease with my mother-in-law living there. They took our statements. My mother-in-law said that she heard a noise, the hollow core door being smashed in, and walked into the kitchen where she encountered a burglar. A small framed woman. The police theorized that she was working as part of a team. Her job was to squeeze through the doggy door, kick in the hollow core, and then open the electric garage door for her accomplice. According to the police, the burglars most likely thought that nobody was home. Fortunately, my mother-in-law must have caught her off guard and scared her. In addition to my manly growl, of course. But it feels good to know that everyone was safe, and to learn that I guess I've got a little fight in me. And for the record, we bought the heaviest goddamn wooden door you've ever seen to replace that hollow core. I'd like to see a mouse try and get through that. I'd lived in the same apartment complex for two years. And across from me was my neighbor Sam. He seemed like a normal guy and a single father of three. Over the two years I lived there, we'd engaged in small talk many times. I believed he was a nice person. 
He felt like a father figure since he was twice my age and always seemed willing to help out if I needed it. Last summer, my region experienced an insane heat wave that we simply didn't have the infrastructure to deal with. It's common for apartments and homes in general in the northern US to not have AC. Temperatures were aiming to reach over 100 degrees, and without AC, we all would have had to prepare to basically endure 90 plus degrees heat in our homes with no relief. I had purchased a portable AC unit, and me being from the southern US, I didn't have the slightest clue how to set it up, and all online advice was only useful for windows that slid vertically. I had a unique dilemma, given that my window slides open horizontally. After struggling with the AC vent for a while, I decided to knock on my neighbor's door for help. That turned out to be a big mistake. After leaving my apartment, he started sending me text messages that made me feel quite uneasy. The first message was something along the lines of, I could tell we were nervous around each other. I'm shy. What are you up to tonight? I was honestly grossed out and disturbed by that, because it seemed delusional. I wasn't nervous around him at all, because I'm simply not attracted to him. Yet in his mind, I was nervous. I did not reply. He proceeded to text me and call me every day. He was even leaving me voicemail. He blew me a kiss in one of the voice messages. I was starting to get scared because normal people don't continue to call and text someone that's not responding to them. Yet this guy would not leave me alone. I figured if he was this unhinged, then outright rejecting him and telling him I wasn't interested could possibly be dangerous. So I continued to ignore him. If I was coming home at night, I always had a friend on the phone with me, just in case I bumped into him. I was becoming so on edge by all the unwanted contact. I called my cousin, who is a lawyer. I told him everything that was going on. He asked for my neighbor's full name. After looking him up, he found out my neighbor was convicted of sexual assault. He'd been in prison for five years. He was also able to find out that my neighbor had been arrested back in 1988 for armed burglary. These are just the times he's been caught. I searched for a new apartment and the ones with the earliest vacancies would be three weeks out. I had to wait. I went to the leasing office of my then current apartment, and I told them everything that was going on. I opted to break my lease and move out as soon as possible as a new apartment was available. I'm so grateful I had a male friend over this particular night. The vent for my portable AC had fallen out of the window. I was fiddling with it and trying to get it to sit tight like it was before. While doing so, I get another text. It was my neighbor. It said, I see you. You're looking really good today. Would you like some help? Upon reading that, I realized he must have been outside and watching me in my window. I was shaking with fear. My friend saw how scared I was, and when I told him what had happened, he went downstairs to confront Sam. My friend was pretending to be my boyfriend. He told him to stop texting me. I was so shaken up, I called out of work and booked the next flight to my home state so I could wait the remaining three weeks out at my best friend's apartment, far away from my creepy neighbor. I wasn't even going to allow for any possibility for things to escalate further. Fast forward three weeks. I had hired movers to get my stuff out of my old apartment. I was cleaning out the fridge and the neighbor and I ended up coincidentally leaving our apartments at the same time. When we made eye contact, he licked his lips. That was the last time I saw him, and I'm so glad I moved forward. Remember, kids, stranger danger. If you don't know him, don't give him the time of day. This was about 15 years ago. My parents went out for a nice dinner for their anniversary and decided I was old enough and responsible enough to be left alone for a few hours on a weeknight. I was almost nine and we owned a fairly protective dog at the time, so it all seemed fine. They leave, tell me to lock up and call if anything happens. I do so and proceed to party around the house like a rock star. Cause man, I had the whole damn house to myself. I could do whatever I wanted. Halfway through a Sailor Moon marathon, I get a knock on the door. 
I'm confused as I'll get out, because it's only been about two hours, and they said they wouldn't be back until around ten anyway. I guess my mom left something she needed, again, and swung by to grab it. My front door is a system of two locks, a super old, wooden thick door. Outside of that, a screen door. My dog is raising hell at the front door. I just pull her back to calm her down. She had a tendency to be reactive to most noises. Well, it is not my mom at the door. It was some middle-aged man I've never met in my life. My dog is now basically feral, so I keep the screen door firmly closed and a hand on her collar as I ask the man what he wants. He starts with this weird convoluted story about how he has two young twin daughters, how they got into a fight and that one of them ran away. Now this man then claims that he believes his daughters are hiding in my house, and he would like to come in to look for her. I tell him no such girl is here, and why does he think she would be in here in the first place? He goes on into a long story about how this was the house they first lived in, and how it's the one she was born in. He said it was like a safe place for her, as it's most likely the place she would run away to, as it was the only other place she knows. So I kind of felt weird since I opened the door and this dude's story hasn't been helping his cause. But now I know something shitty is going down. I, in no uncertain terms, inform the guy that he must have the wrong house because this house was built and has been lived in by my family since its construction. My dad was born in that house and after my mom and dad told his parents that they were pregnant with my older sister, they gave it to him as a present to begin their family. He must be mistaken, because I know all this to be fact. Hell, there were pictures less than 10 feet away from me on my wall of my dad and uncle playing in the front yard in the late 70s. By now, my dog is growling like crazy, and this guy is getting kind of agitated. He insists I don't know what I'm talking about, that if I would just give him a few minutes to search for his daughter, he would be on his way. The latch on the screen door was broken. I was putting all my strength at the time and holding my dog from the door. He opens the screen door with one hand, and with the other, he reaches for my closest arm. My crazy cocker goes fucking ballistic. She uses all of her strength to lunge at him, gets a hold of his hand, and bites down. Now this man is yelling and confused. He pushes back against the door and slams it shut to get my dog off of him. Sadie gets pushed back indoors, but is still raging. I quickly slam the front door, lock it, and chain it shut. I run around the house and make sure all the other doors and windows are locked. I then hunker down in the bathroom, hyperventilating. I wait about 15 minutes until Sadie's growling has calmed down. I check outside. No man or his car. Both are long gone. I call my parents and tell them they need to come home right now. When they got home, I recount the whole story. My dad goes to check the front door and sure enough, on the screen door jam inside of the house is a large smear of blood. Sadie was treated like a queen and we got a whole steak for her to eat on that weekend. So at 9.30 one night, I get a knock on my door. My boyfriend was at work and I was not expecting company especially so late at night. I turn down my music and realize the door's not locked. Instantly, I'm terrified. I'm only four foot ten, so I had to prop myself up the wall to look through the people. I carefully and quietly lock the door. I was more pounding. The man outside my door is no one I recognize. He looks disgruntled, dirty, and quite frankly, frightening. He was short and stocky and looked angry. He grew frustrated knowing I just turned my music down. He heard me lock the door and started calling out, Ma'am, followed with more knocking and then saying, Excuse me, ma'am. How did he know I was a woman? I look around the room and see my blinds were open. I realize he must have been watching me vacuum. Thankfully, my neighbors right across the street from me opened their doors. The husband asked, Excuse me, who are you and what are you doing? Startled. The creep fumbles and says, Oh, good evening, sir. I was just going to offer my carpet cleaning services to her. The husband says, That's great. She doesn't want it. You need to leave right now. The creep promptly left. 
Afterwards, I called the police and my boyfriend. I closed up my blinds and texted the neighbors to thank them for scaring him away. I paid extra to live on the top floor, but it seems this creep was watching me from below. This was an experience I had alongside my best friend forever in high school. This was about 2006, maybe 2007, in rural upstate New York. We met in third grade and are still friends to this day. We are both 27 now, but let me give you some background information. My friend B and I became instant friends when we met in third grade. We were inseparable. We frequented each other's home so much, her mom actually set up her guest room as my room. I had toys, clothes, pictures. I mean, everything I needed was there. I was family. Pictures of B and I hung on the walls of the home owned by her very proud mother, Shelly. Shelly always wanted two daughters and loved me so much that she considered me her second daughter. Now let's move on to the meat of the story. Again, this incident took place when B and I were sophomores in high school. Her mother was divorced and dated a few different men meeting some off sites like eHarmony. She had been speaking to a man for a few weeks, gushing about how manly and charming he was. She was really excited and always showed us their profiles before she decided to go on a date with one of these men. She would always say, I need my daughter's stamps of approval. One night, she called us to her room and showed us this man she'd been talking all about. His profile was simple as one would imagine for a middle-aged man in 2007 on eHarmony. The headline read, Looking for a Strong Mother. The word strong was all capital. I made a joke about his odd placement for caps and just how strange a way to start out, but we moved forward. It also told of his metalwork background, his love of cold steel, and his work in a foundry that kept his icy heart just warm enough. I was honest and told her it sounded off, but he was handsome, sporting black, well-groomed hair, a beard, strong jaw, ice blue eyes, and a relatively fit body for a 40-something year old male. I did stress on the weird vibe, then B joked how Shelley always picked out the antisocial ones. We laughed, knowing this wasn't wrong. Shelley's brought some weird stories home, but what do you expect meeting men online? We told her to go for it. So they planned on dinner. It was a haul for him, about a two hour drive. He was driving to our location, where they would then take one car into town. B and I helped Shelly pick out her outfit, helped her with her hair and makeup, and then went back upstairs so she could have some time to herself before the long night. We headed up the stairs where B and I were painting a wall in her room, just listening to music and cutting up. He just let himself in the house like no big deal and just came up the stairs without saying a word. No knocking, no doorbell, the dogs didn't bark, nothing. So we get spooked, jump, then scream and shit our pants a bit when we hear a man start talking behind us. We don't know how long he had been in the house. We don't know how long he stood behind us without speaking. But when he did speak, we shook. Well, well, well. I didn't know I was getting a two-for-one deal, he said in a gravelly low voice. He chuckled as we stood there in shock of the stranger in our room. He sauntered over to us like a man on a Sunday walk. The smell of cigarettes filled the room, as if Rod Serling himself was standing in the corner explaining our situation to the audience for our own personal episode of The Twilight Zone. Right then I noticed how much this guy looked like the guy in the picture Shelley showed us. Except he had salt and pepper hair, not jet black. His eyes were not icy blue, but black. Not brown. Black. It looked like this guy was 100% pupil. Are you? I was interrupted by Shelly, shouting. Who got hurt? She must have thought we were horsing around and one of us got hurt. This was normal for us because we goofed around a lot. She was jolted at the sight of this man blocking her from us. He turned around just as soon as she reached the top of the stairs and held his arms out and said, in a way less low tone than he used earlier, Shelly, you look beautiful. I knocked and no one answered. I hope it's okay I let myself in. 
These are your girls. They're beautiful, like their mommy. I'll never forget how he said mommy. It felt dirty. B and I both side-eyed each other and stepped down off our stepladders. We were both very in tune with each other. If I felt weird, I knew she did, and we both felt the odd air of the room. Shelley glanced away from him and at us, but we were both behind him, looking at her with wide eyes, kind of shaking our heads side to side in disbelief. Shelley looked back to him. This exchange only took a few seconds, but seemed like an eternity. She forced a smile at him and said, Oh, I'm sorry. Next time just ring the bell. I'll come open the door. He nodded and walked towards her with open arms. He hugged her like they'd been the oldest of friends. She looked at us as they hugged. She just kind of rolled her eyes to show us what she thought of his excuse. She proceeded to tell him that it was not appropriate as she let him down the stairs. We heard him apologize over and over. B and I instantly ran over to our phones. We agreed to text her mom what he had just said to us so we could tell her without him knowing. We hit send and about 10 minutes later, we hear footsteps up the stairs. It was Shelly and she shut the door behind her. She asked us if we were okay, hugged us and told us she was sorry he made us feel uncomfortable. She explained to us that he said we reminded him of his girls and didn't mean to scare us. We nodded and then she said they were leaving for their date. We hugged her, said to be safe and we would see her soon. As she headed down the stairs, B and I looked at each other. We both knew that something wasn't right, but we were speechless from the good scare we received from this dark man just 15 minutes prior. We heard them walking and talking headed towards the front door a few minutes later. Shelley shouted up the stairs that she loved us. We yelled back that we loved her too, and then the door shut. We instantly started talking over each other, saying the same things. B spoke over me saying he laid that charm on so thick as soon as he saw mom. B exclaimed further, and did you not see his eyes? What the fuck was that? He looks so much like the guy from the pictures, but not exactly. We both concurred on our feelings about the stranger, his scent, his demeanor, and his voice. He was like something out of a classic Stranger Danger advert. Again, we agreed to text Shelley how we felt. She thanked us and told us it seemed to be going well, and she would let us know that she was safe every hour. B and I just were freaked out, and even more so that Shelley was not. It was like a weird spell he cast on her. It was odd, but we wanted to think the best for Shelley as she was excited about this guy. She messaged us every hour until she got home. Her last message said, I'm okay, but officially freaked out and coming home now. I'll be home soon. We got freaked out and paced around until we saw headlights pull into the driveway. It had been about five hours since she left, and about an hour since the last text. We were inside with the lights off, watching through the side window, trying not to be seen when the motion sensor light flooded the yard, and light fell onto the driveway. Our truck flew into the driveway, the passenger side door flung open before the truck was at full stop, and Shelley's feet were on the pavement just as fast. She waved at the driver and kind of jogged the door wide-eyed. She reached the front door, turned, and waved the truck off. She had her house key ready in the hand she wasn't waving with. She unlocked the door and slid inside the safety of the house. Keep the lights off. Let's go upstairs, Shelley said as she locked the two deadbolts and the chain, not once looking at us. We headed up the stairs behind her. We went into B's room and looked out the window down to the truck still parked out front with the lights on and the engine running. As we all stared at the truck, Shelley told us of the ordeal she went through. Long story short, he had made reservations at the wrong restaurant, so he suggested they go buy some food and have a picnic-style dinner at a local park. Shelley didn't do well outdoors. She was an office woman, so she declined. However, he had just drove so long to get here, and then he hit her with, you kind of owe me. Shelley said that made her feel bad, knowing he drove two hours. So when he mentioned that he had a vacation home that he could cook for her at, that was close by, she agreed. She said they got to the house and it was nice enough. Log cabin near Bethel, New York. 
only about 35 minutes from our town. Shelley said he kept talking about how easy it was to get her alone. He also kept saying he liked strong mommies because they have such fight. But she caved. This made her skin crawl. This wasn't the man she thought it was. This also wasn't the man in the picture. And Shelley started to slowly realize this. Shelley then said she asked for a ride home due to her feeling ill. He wasn't the happiest, but he complied and stopped cooking. He started looking for the keys she knew he had in his pocket. He then started asking her about our girls, referring to myself and B. This freaked Shelley out so bad, she said she was going to get someone to get her, and he didn't like that. He found his keys instantly. Once they were out of the house and in the truck, the truck wouldn't start, so they had to move to his work truck. Shelly was visibly shaken and wouldn't take her eyes off the truck in the driveway as she spilled the story out post-haste. She said there was a garage that he said they had to walk to around the house to hop into the work truck. She felt she had no choice but to play it cool and just agree to go. She hopped out and walked around the house, and there indeed was another garage with a truck in it. It was the same truck that we were all currently staring at, just sitting in the driveway. It smelled like bleach and metal, she whispered. She told us on the way home he just kept asking about us. What did we do that she didn't like? What got us spankings? What were the naughty things we got in trouble for? What would she do without us? And the one question to scare you out of your pants as a parent. Would you sacrifice yourself for our girls? Shelley said she stared at him in awe and disbelief. And then he just laughed. She got more and more concerned as she noticed her surroundings in the back of the truck she was riding home in. There were what she thought were chains in a bucket sitting on a desk that was drilled into the floor, a duffel bag and very large metal objects she wasn't sure of. This is when he started to pull out pictures on his little flip phone that he had of us. He must have found Shelly's Facebook. He took pictures of our pictures and had them on his phone waving it around and telling Shelly what a good, strong mommy she had been to us, and she should be proud of what she had accomplished. By this time, they were pulling into the driveway, and Shelly was done with his shit. She was just about finished when we saw the truck lights turn off. Shelly immediately picked up the phone and dialed the sheriff. She told him quickly there was an unwelcome person outside of our home. Being in such a small town, the sheriff not only went to school and graduated with Shelley, but only lived three doors down. Just as we see this guy getting out of his truck with a duffel bag, we saw the sheriff whip up behind him. This man panicked and threw his duffel bag into his truck and tried to back into the sheriff to get out. When he realized he was blocked from the rear, he went through the yard. We could not believe our eyes. The truck peeled out, taking some lawn with it. The sheriff came to the door to check on us. He told us he had units down the road waiting for him. We all shared a good collective cry and rejoiced in our safety. It did, however, create some paranoia issues in the next couple of weeks due to the fact we didn't know how long he was in the house when he decided to let himself in. Did he put cameras anywhere? Did he mess with food in the house to hurt someone? I mean, it was bad, but we worked through it. We never heard anything about him getting caught and we did occasionally receive eerie messages on Facebook, two of which we knew were him, but we put that out of our minds. We haven't heard anything from or about him since about three months after the incident, when the last message was received. It's been quite a few years since the incident, but we still talk about it when we can. This happened about 8 years ago in my local supermarket. I'm a female and at the time I was 36. I was in queue to pay. It's a Saturday morning, super busy and I'm second in line. In front of me at the till is a family of three. Mom, dad and daughter. Mom and dad are unpacking the trolley and the daughter sitting in the trolley seat facing me. Behind me are two men and they are making me uncomfortable, standing way too close to me. You know when you feel someone before you see them. It was like that. 
I was facing the daughter and she looked super uncomfortable, making herself smaller and kept looking over her shoulder to dad. I turn around and these men are waving and smiling, trying to get her attention. Then one of the guys reaches around me and touches her foot. He did it in such a familiar way that I thought he must have known the family. She flinched away and he does it again. She quietly says daddy. Daddy swings around and says in a booming voice, something along the lines of, what the hell dude, don't touch my daughter. This weirdo says, but we want to be friends. The father replies, I don't know you, back off. I realize they don't know each other at all and instantly go into mommy mode. The father goes back to unpacking the trolley and I put myself between those two guys and the daughter, completely blocking access. Believe it or not, he tries to get her attention again. So I say, really loudly, you are so lucky that you have such a brave and strong daddy. Look how he's protecting you from these bad men. The dad looks at me and we have a silent conversation with our eyes. They pack up and leave quickly. I thought it was over. The girl is safe. As I'm unpacking my trolley, I suddenly notice that one of the men has moved around and is standing at the end of the till. He's staring at me with pure malice. The other guy was standing behind me in the queue, my trolley between us. I won't lie, in that moment I felt intimidated, terrified. I'm not a small woman, I'm tallish with very broad shoulders and quite strong. Anyway, in my trolley is 15 kilograms of dog food. My adrenaline is pumping, I need to show these guys I'm not an easy target. I make eye contact with the aggressor at the end of the till, and I lift this bag of dog food up like it's a roll of toilet paper. My facial expression doesn't change. No strain, no tension, just deep and dark. He keeps eye contact with me. Now I'm angry. The fear is gone. I pay and he blocks my exit from the till. I then bump him light with my trolley. He laughs menacingly and moves out of the way. I decide not to go straight to my car. I walk around the mall for a bit and every time I turn around, they are there, now with an additional guy. They are not even hiding the fact that they're following me. The one guy makes a motion of cutting my neck. Fuck this. I start making my way to the security desk. When I get there and turn around, they're gone. I tell security everything. They recommend I let the supermarket know as well and give them my till number so they can review the security tape above the till. A guard escorted me to my car. I drove the long way, checking my rearview mirror constantly. I never saw them again, but to be honest, I stopped going to that supermarket, partly because of that, but mainly because their prices aren't competitive, and my dogs become fussy eaters. A few months ago, I was home alone at around 3pm. I was sitting in my living room watching TV when I hear a knock on my door. I go to my bedroom to look out the window. I'm looking around and I see a guy dressed in a suit. He's backed up about 10 feet from my front door. He notices me and with a huge smile on his face, he's just waving. He stands there and waves with that creepy smile on his face for about 30 to 45 seconds before then walking away. He doesn't get in his car, just walks down the street to God knows where. This was a bit off-putting to me, and I was a bit freaked out since I was alone, but I just go back to watching TV. Almost exactly three hours later, at 6pm, he knocks on the door, backs up and just waves. Then again, three hours later at 9pm, he does the same thing. Every time I just ignored him, but I was debating to either call the police or open the door with my metal bat in hand and tell him to piss off. I was wondering if he would show up again at midnight, but he didn't, thank God. I don't know what this guy was up to, but it was weird nonetheless. When I was younger, my nanny Sarah told me the story. It stuck with me vividly all these years. Sarah was a teenager in the 60s, and she was with her mom visiting family out in the country. They were staying in a house with Sarah's uncle, 
aunt and two cousins. One summer night, Sarah and her cousins were out late drinking beer. They started their drive home around 1 a.m. They were about 30 minutes away from the house, going straight along the rural road that went on for miles. It was pitch black, no street lights, and they were about 10 minutes away from the house when they noticed a truck was behind them. At first, they thought nothing of it, but the truck continued to get closer and closer until it was right on their tail. Sarah and her cousins began freaking out and driving faster, but so did the truck. Then it turned on its brights. Sarah told me they just kept driving faster and faster, but the truck kept following them. It was so bright, they could barely see. Finally, they got to the house and turned onto the dirt road it was on, a bad decision they were about to realize. The dirt road only had one access point to the road they were coming from. As soon as Sarah and her cousins pulled in towards the house, the truck pulled into the driveway and swerved sideways. It was now blocking the only exit. Three men slowly got out of the car, holding large objects that Sarah couldn't quite make out. At this point, it was nearly 1.30 a.m. when Sarah heard her mother screaming from the house, Sarah, run. Sarah and her cousins bolted it into the house, slamming the door shut and locking it behind them. Only moments later, the doorknob began rattling and the men began banging on the door. The men began walking around the house, trying to get into every window they could find. After about 30 harrowing minutes, they seemingly gave up. I guess they didn't have a phone at the time, so they had no way to call for help. I guess the biggest question Sarah had was why was her mom awake in the middle of the night, and how was she outside at just the right time? She had no way of knowing Sarah was in trouble. Sarah's mom said she had a dream that something bad was going to happen to Sarah. She woke up in a sweat with a terrible feeling. She then went outside to see if their car was back, to see if they made it home safe, and that's when they pulled in to the driveway. So when I was in high school, it was my senior year. I was 5 foot 3 and about 95 pounds. I was at the park down the street from my house waiting for the school bus. Usually my boyfriend who was already graduated would drive me to school, but he was busy. Well, there was usually a few of us girls there waiting, but on this day, I was the only one. So I sat at a bench and had one headphone in and one out so I could listen to my surroundings. I have always been cautious of what's going on around me. As I waited, a black Honda pulled up and I immediately noticed it. I kept an eye on it as I had a bad feeling about it. I wasn't making it obvious that I was watching it because I didn't want to look too crazy, but after a few minutes, two big men got out. I immediately messaged my boyfriend that I was at the park and these guys were creeping me out. Of course he didn't text back, so I copy pasted the same text to my cousin who was home and winding down from a night shift. I wanted someone to know the car make and color, plus it was two men. I didn't get any responses. When they got out of their car, they started to walk towards me, so I got up from the bench and walked towards the street because the bus was supposed to be there any minute. The driver ended up being a bit late. As I stood by the street, these men walked up to me and I could feel the bad energy. One guy said hello as the other guy stood there staring me down. I just did a small smile and a nod then looked away. The first guy asked how old I was. I didn't respond. I could tell the second guy was getting mad that I wasn't feeding into it. The first guy kept asking me yes or no questions like do you have a boyfriend, do you live close, do you do drugs, we have some, do you want some, and then the second guy asked me if I knew what the black market was. I felt a cold rush go over my body and I got the chills. The second guy who was quiet the whole time started to tell me they just got back from Russia. But the way he said it was so scary, almost intimidating. I knew they were from somewhere else because they had strong accents, but I couldn't pinpoint the place. They kept telling me to go to their car because they have drugs. I said no thank you. Trust me, I wasn't a straight edge in high school, but I wasn't stupid either. I would never get into somebody's car that I didn't know. And the first guy asked if I had a car. 
I said no and that my bus was almost there. By some sort of miracle, the bus rounded the corner and the guys backed off. They had been inching closer and closer as they asked me questions. But before the bus got me, the first guy handed me a card and said he has a car in shop and that I should call him sometime if I needed anything. He even stated he would give me a free car. The card looked shifty and I didn't want to grab it, but I knew I needed the number on it to report it. So I took it and they walked off super fast. Finally, the bus stopped and picked me up. As soon as I got on, I started to cry. I had a complete meltdown. It was like all the adrenaline was keeping my mind and body aware and focused while these men were there. But as soon as I was safe, my mind and body gave out. Thankfully, there weren't many people on the bus, so the driver calmed me down before we took off. I explained to her what happened. When she looked around for the car, they were gone. She said she saw one of them around me, but thought I knew them because it was so close to me. The driver called into her dispatch saying there was an incident so that they could notify the school. She continued to pick all the other students up, but when we got to the school, she walked me into the office. I was absolutely terrified to be alone. The principal came out and so did campus security. They were so sweet and gentle with me as they brought me back into the principal's office. Both were men and they proceeded to ask me questions about the men, their car, and the questions the creeps had asked me. I cried the whole time. Then I pulled out the card the guy gave me and passed it to the principal. He looked at the security and said he was going to call it and act like my dad. So he did. It was on speaker and guy number one answered. I knew his voice as if it was burned into my brain. It took everything in me not to have a panic attack. The principal asked the guy if he could get him a car at a good price, and the guy played dumb. The principal said his daughter gave him the card. As soon as he said that, the guy hung up. They tried calling again, and the phone was shut off, then eventually disconnected. I could see a shift in the principal and security as soon as the phone clicked. The security got on his phone and called the police. They had them come to the school. It was as if they finally knew it was real. Like my crazy story wasn't made up. The principal excused himself and the security guard. They talked for a minute in the hall. I could hear everything they were saying. They said, She's lucky to be alive. This is serious. We need to call her parents to come get her. When the police got there, they came into the office that I was sitting in. They asked me for the story again in front of the principal and security guard. I felt like they wanted to see if I was being 100% honest. So I obliged. The officers were straight up with me. They said it sounded like they were watching us girls at the park because they chose the one day that one of us were alone. He also said the card was being used as bait to get me to go where they wanted. I felt sick. I couldn't breathe. The school called my aunt, but she didn't pick up. The only person that picked up first was my boyfriend. One of the officers talked to him as the other finally got a hold of my aunt. My boyfriend ended up picking me up and taking me home. I cried the whole time there. When I got there, my grandma, uncle, aunt, mom, and cousins were all out front. The women were all in tears and the men were livid, but they were worried for me. A week later, some girl at another local high school was saved by other students. She was being dragged into a black Honda by two guys. The other kid stood up and grabbed her and pulled her out of the car. The principal called me into his office and that's how I found out. They also had the same officers there and had me choose two guys out of a picture lineup. I pointed them out fast. They were caught. It was, in fact, those two guys that tried grabbing the girl, a freshman girl. I felt worried for her, sad that she went through worse than I did, and I almost felt free again. Still scared, but not looking over my shoulder as often. I couldn't believe they were caught. After that, my family teamed up to drive me to school for the rest of the year, and my boyfriend, now ex, also took me in some days. I am thankful to be alive and well, and I'm even more thankful that that girl was also saved by the courageous kids at her high school. A 
about five to six years ago, I was working at a gas station and I ran into a girl I recognized from high school. She was with her boyfriend, who was a regular in the store. I distinctly remembered him because he wore the really cool looking horn rimmed glasses. We get to talking and I ask him if he wanted to get together and smoke a bit. He agreed and said he'd wait for me after dropping off his girlfriend. So end of the shift comes and he's outside waiting. He tells me he knows a really cool smoke spot. I follow him in my car to said smoke spot and we end up in a gravel lot surrounded by various RVs and trailers. I didn't think much of it because it seemed pretty safe and out of the way from police. We smoke a bit and afterwards he invited me to his place and since I was pretty baked I said screw it, why not? This man leads me to a really dark neighborhood and takes me to a house that he enters from the basement and leads into a nice room except for the fact it had nothing but a bed and a TV. Did I mention there was plastic sheets around the TV and near the bed? The hair stood on the back of my neck like I was in danger and when he asked me if I wanted to sit on the bed I politely declined and said it was about time for me to go home. He then asks me if I wanted to smoke another blunt before heading out. And being the young fiend that I was, I said alright, but I also insisted on being outside. He invited me to his car to roll up and smoke. Now I was already on edge, and when this guy turns the radio on, he turns on some music from the early 1900s. The type of shit you hear in serial killer movies. He starts going on and on about how it's his favorite music. I asked him if he was going to roll up or not, because I was really only there to smoke before I left, and he still hadn't started, so he pulls out the wrap and pulls out a knife. The second I saw the handle, I bolted. I'm talking fast as I've ever run back to my car. I locked the doors and turned on the ignition before he could even get out of the car. I screeched my wheels peeling out of that neighborhood. I never spoke to him again. I swear I met a serial killer that night, and I just barely managed to get away. I was coming into my basement apartment at 7.30pm. I left at 10.30. As I left, I noticed a biscuit on each end of my door placed perfectly parallel to each other. It was like one of those rectangular biscuits, and it was placed on each end of the door. I'm really confused and my basement entrance is on the side of the house. No one really comes by here. It makes no sense. I don't know if I should be concerned or if it's just a weird coincidence. I found out the same thing happened to other neighbors on the street as well, and we believe it's a burglar, Casey. This is a story my mom told me from when I was only two years old. My family has a small acreage in the Canadian prairies. It's not too far out from the city but far enough that it was rare to have unexpected visitors. At the time, we had some sheep and chickens, but it wasn't a huge farm. It was just my mom, my dad, and my sister and I. My sister was only five years older than me, so only seven at the time. We also had a sweet dog named Maggie. My parents have always said she was the best farm dog we ever had. She was some sort of Bouvier cross with shaggy black hair, and she was very sweet with animals and kids. She never barked or got upset without a very good reason, much unlike our last pup who would bark at the wind. My dad was out of town this particular night, probably visiting my grandpa in his town down south. My mom was alone with just us little guys, and Maggie was sleeping soundly in the porch. My mom woke up in the middle of the night to Maggie growling. My mom's a pretty light sleeper, so it doesn't take much to wake her up, but this was very unusual behavior for Maggie. My mom thought it was probably an animal, so she took a peek outside. Sometimes coyotes or large bucks would upset Maggie, so that was the most likely explanation. However, this was not the case that night. Our farm is right adjacent to the highway, and there is a long, unlit lane that leads into our yard. It wasn't obvious at first, but my mom saw a dark vehicle slowly creeping down the lane. The car's headlights were shut off, and we didn't have a lot of light in the yard. My mom's stomach immediately sunk. Anyone with good intentions wouldn't shut off their headlights. She also had two little kids in the house that she had to protect. She watched them slowly creep into the yard. I don't know how many there were, 
but at least a couple of guys got out of the vehicle and headed towards the shop where my dad keeps his tools and tractor and that kind of thing. At the time, there was a big power panel on the side that controlled all the electricity to the yard lights in the house. They opened it up and started going through it, evidently trying to figure out how to shut the power off. God knows what their intentions were. Luckily, my family has a hunting rifle. My mom grew up on a farm, so she knows her way around a gun. So rifle in hand, she quietly propped open the door just enough to stick the barrel out. She fired a few warning shots in the guy's direction. They freaked out and hopped back in their vehicle, reversing all the way down the lane so she couldn't see their license plate. I honestly have no idea what these guys' plans were, maybe just to rob us, but the idea with people pulling into the yard with no headlights and shutting off the power is unsettling. Either way, I'm extremely grateful for our sweet Maggie and badass mom for keeping us safe. This incident happened about five years ago. This is a story that I never really tell anyone because most people are either uncomfortable hearing it or make well-meaning comments about what I should have done in the situation without really understanding how differently your mind works when you're experiencing absolute panic. But you guys seem to get it. So here's my story. I was living in a relatively nice apartment in downtown Memphis, working as an ophthalmic technician. I arrived home from work at my usual time, around 4.30pm, unlocked my door and went inside. I set my phone, wallet and keys on the kitchen island, hearing my heavy metal front door swing shut loudly behind me, and I began taking care of some errands around the house. Having grown up in a small town, it was a habit for me not to lock my door during the day, especially when I knew my husband would be home soon anyway. I've never forgotten to lock my door once in the five years since this day. I walked through the bathroom and into my large walk-in closet and began hanging up the laundry I'd started earlier in the day before work. My front door opened and I smiled with surprise. My husband was home a bit early and I happily called out to him. I'm in here, love. I was met with silence. I slowly began to feel the sinking feeling of something is wrong crawl up my spine. I tried to shake it off, thinking my husband simply hadn't heard me. I walked out into the living room kitchen area. Standing on the other side of my kitchen island was a complete stranger. He was a male, older than me. I would estimate 50s, but it's hard for me to recall exact facial features or details from this moment. He was just standing there, staring at me. No ski mask, no weapon. He was just watching me. I wondered if he maybe walked into the wrong apartment and was going to apologize and leave. But as he continued to stare, I realized I needed to do something other than just gape at this stranger in my house. I stood taller, puffed up my chest in an attempt to look more threatening, and used a loud, clear voice, telling him to get out of my apartment, that he had no business being here. He completely ignored me like I hadn't spoken. Then he began to pick up my things. My cell phone, my keys, my wallet. He picked them up methodically and put them in his own pockets. That's when it truly hit me that this person was dangerous. I was naive enough to believe this was all a mistake until that moment. I darted forward toward the only other device I had that would allow me to get help, my computer. I had to take a few steps closer to the intruder in order to reach it, but I still had about 12 to 15 feet between us. I knew I could grab it and run before he could reach me. As I picked it up and turned to run, I saw him start to move after me. I sprinted back toward the bathroom because it was the only place I could go and put two locked doors between us, my bathroom door and the closet door. I slammed and locked the first door, and within seconds I could hear him messing with it, trying to open it. I ran into the closet and locked that door too, opening my computer and getting on Facebook Messenger to contact my husband. I sent message after message pleading with him to call 911, telling him that there was an intruder in the apartment. He got the messages within minutes and assured me that he had a dispatcher on the phone, that he was leaving work himself to try and get to me if he could. I waited and waited. The bathroom door opened. The intruder came inside. 
He moved to the closet door and started trying to break that door down too. Here's the part where people usually start giving me advice on how I should have acted, but all I can tell you is that I was frozen. With fear. With shock. I don't know, but I didn't scream or cry or even search for a weapon in that dark closet. I didn't brace the door or try to hold it closed. I just kneeled on my chest and waited to die because I just knew that's what was going to happen. People like to tell me that I lived in an apartment. Surely if I screamed, someone would have heard and come to help me. Surely that there was something heavy enough in my closet to use to defend myself. Hell, even the laptop would have heard if I swung it at someone. Why didn't I do anything? I don't really have an answer for that. But the closet door miraculously held. I heard frustrated footsteps go back out into the living area of my apartment. I heard things breaking, bottles shattering my drawers and refrigerator and cabinets being flung open as things were torn out of them. I continued to sit in that closet, silently crying, wanting to leave but feeling that death was inevitable. I feel awful about my selfishness in that moment, but I messaged my mom, who lived a 15 hours drive away, and told her what was happening. I desperately wanted comfort. I wanted to tell her how much I loved her. I'm not a parent. But I can only imagine the fear and helplessness I put her through, knowing her daughter was in danger and that there was nothing she could do to help. She messaged me constantly, begging me to keep replying. I told her I would as long as I could, but I also told her to tell my brothers I loved them, to help my husband through whatever happened next if it ended badly for me. The intruder started messing with the closet door again, mumbling disjointed words that I couldn't really distinguish. I remember hoping that the police would get to the apartment before my husband, and he wouldn't be the one to find me in whatever state the invader left me in. The front door opened again, and it was my husband, shouting for me. The intruder walked out toward the living room kitchen area. I opened the door, darted from the closet to find my husband on the ground with him, pinning him in place. The man kept mumbling and at times yelling, but he never really put up much resistance. This entire part is a blur for me. I remember feeling like the room was spinning, filled with fear, mostly for my husband at this point. Eventually the police found the apartment. It took them about 25 minutes to arrive, which still blows my mind. I know time seems to move slowly during scary situations, so I thought it was less than that. But from the time my husband dialed 911 to the time the officers arrived, it was 25 excruciating minutes. This isn't intended to bash them in any way. It just always seemed like this was an unusually long response time for a home invasion. They got my things back from the man and took him out of my apartment. I numbly went through the process of filing a police report, telling them what happened. One of the officers commented that I should really keep my door locked at all times. I remember feeling like he was being insensitive at the time or blaming me for what happened, but later recognized his words were coming from experience. I'm sure he's seen the situation end differently for other women. Within 30 minutes, the scariest incident of my life was over, but I've carried the fear, the violation, the anxiety of having someone intrude into my space for years. It happened to me once. It could happen again. If this or something similar happened to you, and you're struggling with the aftermath of it, the sleepless nights, the laying awake listening for sounds of forced entry, the nightmares, the constant checking and rechecking your locks. This is what eventually helped me. A year after this took place, my husband and I moved to the Midwest for his job. We selected a safe town with a nice apartment complex. We chose a third floor apartment with only one point of entry. I looked up every statistic on crime for the neighborhood, finding that an isolated incident of car theft was the only thing reported in decades. I still couldn't sleep at night. It was definitely better than staying in the same apartment in Memphis, but my husband often worked night shifts now. I simply couldn't continue being terrified to sleep at night. I realized that my biggest fear was that something could happen again, but that if it did, I was just as unprepared now as I was then. I hadn't changed anything. I knew I would likely freeze up again and leave my life up to being able to hide well enough or having a door hold long enough to save me, and that was unacceptable. I walked into a martial arts school with an excellent self-defense program, 
I introduced myself and started taking classes. At first, I was a bit quiet, hiding in the back of the room and generally keeping to myself. My instructor, who was both incredibly kind and incredibly insightful, slowly built up my confidence and brought me out of my bubble of fear. After several months of training, I finally shared my reason for taking classes with him. He's worked with me tirelessly to give me the ability to protect myself in any environment. I've been training for years now, and the difference it's made in every aspect of my life is unbelievable. That meek, quiet girl that waited to die in her closet doesn't exist. I am confident. I am strong. I am worthy of living and protecting myself in my home. I no longer am ashamed of how I handled the situation I was in, but I also understand what steps I can take to ensure I'm safe. It wasn't easy and it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth it. I recognize this might not be an option or solution for everyone. Your experience is valid. And however you decide to cope with your own story is the right choice for you. This is how I happen to do it. And it's all worked out well for me. Thank you again for listening. Stay safe out there. For a bit of quick backstory, I work at a gas station on a main route. We see a lot of travelers passing through. Only one person works each shift, and it's a 24-hour store. We are short-staffed, so I agreed to an overnight. I'm a female, by the way. I work in a state that's always had self-serve gas stations. So this guy comes in, and I ask if he needed any help. He says no. He's getting gas at the pump, but needs to use the bathroom. I go back to work on whatever invoices we got yesterday. The guy uses the bathroom and then goes back outside. About five to seven minutes later, he comes back inside and tells me he's confused about the pump. He directly says, you might have to come outside to help me. Customers don't often say this. They usually complain that it's not working, so I'm already feeling weird about this guy. I shake it off because he looks like a nerd and I don't really feel afraid of him. I look at the register to see what error it came up with for his pump, and there's no errors. The register didn't even say it was in use. Even if someone tries to pay and nothing's wrong with their payment, it will at least say, payment or loyalty timed out. But it had no sign of him trying to use it before asking me for help. I ask him if he just wants to pay inside. He agrees. He goes to get his wallet out of his car and then pays $10. I give him his receipt and he says, Can you help me? I don't understand the machine. I say, we aren't really allowed to leave the store during overnight shifts, as it's just me here and it's not safe to go outside. He proceeds to say, I don't understand what it's asking me. I need help. I'm not scary. I tell him again that I can't go outside. It's a store policy for the overnight shift. I say, it's not that you're scary. I just can't go outside. I would have to tell a little old lady asking for help at this hour the same thing. That is true. We can't even take out the trash during overnights. He starts to walk away from the register counter now, but then again stops at the door and asks me one last time to come outside and help him. I'm pretty annoyed at this point. I've said no twice now. I'm not going, so stop asking. I finally say in a super annoyed tone, Okay, all you need to do is 1. Pick up the nozzle. 2. Select fuel grate button. And 3. Put it in your tank and squeeze the handle. I'm not going outside. And he finally goes back to the car and the register tells me he had no trouble pumping gas. His plates seem like they were from the state I work in. This kind of thing would make me suspicious usually, but the fact that he originally opted for me to go outside instead of bringing money inside at 3am is weird. Along with how he didn't bother to use the pump before he came inside to ask for help. Claiming it wasn't working, and him not taking my first no for an answer. No means no. This wasn't an encounter with a person, but something I found with my kid in the woods. Hair. Like 20 inches of human hair in the campfire ring. I spotted it right away because it was so unusual to see. 
It wasn't burnt, but carefully put under three or four medium-sized rocks. I moved the rocks and used a big stick to investigate, hoping I wouldn't see scalp or skin included, hoping it was a wig and someone thought it would be funny. No. Blonde hair with a washed-out blue dye about halfway through it. I tried to turn it over using the stick as much as I could, making sure it wasn't attached to scalp or worse. And it smelled rotten, like decay. It was the absolute creepiest shit I've come across in the woods. So unsettling that I did report it to the sheriff's department, because I felt someone with authority should know. I talked to a deputy and sent him the pictures we took, with the detailed instructions to get to the campsite. There's been no follow-up so far, but it totally ruined our Sunday drive. I don't know if someone was shaving their head and howling at the moon in the woods or what, but it was disturbing for sure. This happened to me a few years ago in springtime. I was geocaching by myself, as I usually do. I had chosen one that was along a long, abandoned and ripped up railway, near some residences and a converted factory. Basically, this pathway ran between the two of them. It was still pretty wooded, and you couldn't see the houses or much of the factory from the path. I found the cache and signed it, cleaned it up a bit, and put it back. It was a pretty bright late spring day, maybe late April to early May. As I stepped from the brushy area the cache was in back onto the path, I looked to my right, where I had come from, and saw a man coming toward me. He was carrying a rifle and was about 200 feet away. Luckily, he was looking off to the side and didn't see me, so I stepped back off the path and around a large bush that the cache was hidden behind. I was, at this point, about 15 to 20 feet away from the path. I waited and watched the area of the path I could see. He walked by, looking from left to right, not fast or slow, just walking. He held the rifle in his left hand. He didn't see me because I was somewhat behind the bush and back. I waited what I felt like was long enough to let him get a ways down the path before cautiously emerging. Looking in the direction he'd gone to assure he was no longer in sight, I ran in the opposite direction to my car. I know it definitely was not any type of hunting season, because my ex was a hunter, so I know when they are, and it was far too close to the houses to shoot a fire on. But it hasn't stopped me from caching alone though. It was about 2000 or 2001. My best friend and I were 12 to 13 years old. We lived in a small town in rural Minnesota of about 2,000 people. Out of our friend group, her and I were the only two that lived out in the country, so we understood the boredom that could ensue, but also the fun things that would come out of it. And exploring the woods, running around in the cornfields, creating forts, exploring the abandoned house on our property, that kind of thing, and it was a really fun time for us. One day, we decided to take our bikes and ride down some gravel roads. Her little brother tagged along. We were riding along, laughing, probably picking on her brother, when we see an old shack in one of the cornfields. The corn wasn't fully grown, so we were able to see most of it. We decided to explore it, because why not? I'm now 33, so bear with my memory. I don't remember much about the outside, but I do remember what I saw inside, and it still gives me the creeps to this day. We peered inside, and the first thing I noticed were posters on the wall of the room. They were on every wall. There was a different person on every poster, and they looked angry. Some held guns pointed right at you. Some were pointing their finger, and it felt like they were pointing right at us, with their eyes trained on us. In the center of the floor was a perfectly painted red circle. My friend and I remembers a star in the middle, but her brother just remembers a circle. As we're staring at this creepy scene, I feel like we're being watched, and not by the posters. I look to my right across the gravel road and into the cornfield across from us. Standing in the middle of the field is a man. He's just watching us. He's not waving his arms or yelling at us, just watching. I alert my friends and we look at him together. I awkwardly wave and he continues to just stand there. He didn't wave back. 
We are sufficiently creeped out, so we just jump on our bikes to get away. We are on gravel, which isn't easy to bike on, so it's taking us a while to get going. We bike away, and I repeatedly turn around to see if he's still there. And he still is, watching us. He barely moved, and only turned his body slightly to angle in our direction, so he could keep watching us. I still can't get over how he just appeared in the middle of a field like that. Recently, I've been thinking of this. So my friend, her brother, and I started a group chat. We all shared what we remembered, and they basically said everything I did. What I don't know was that they went back the next day, and everything was gone, even the red paint on the floor. A week later, whoever owned it donated it to the fire department to be burned down. I don't know what was going on in that shack. Some thoughts have been weird rituals, target practice for some weird militia guy, or just some weird creepy guy who has poor taste and decor. Whatever it was, it still haunts me to this day. This happened close to 20 years ago. I was visiting my parents at their house for a week sometime in the late spring to early summer. One morning, my mom woke me up and asked me to come out to the front yard to look at something. Her tone tipped me off to the fact that she was unnerved by whatever it was she found. She was standing at the end of our sidewalk when I joined her, where she pointed to something where the sidewalk abutted the driveway. Is that what I think it is? It was a trail of dried blood. I could see a few spatters of blood trailing out into the unpaved driveway, but they were hard to discern against the reddish clay and the sand of the driveway. I soon lost the trail. Although the general trajectory was toward the road in front of the house, the other end of the trail led down where the sidewalk turned to run toward the gate between the house and the garage. Enough blood had been lost for there to be large splotches visible on the Liriope that borders the sidewalk, as well as on the small patch of lawn between the sidewalk and the north side of the house. The trail led to the holly hedge that grows next to the house. Some of the branches on one of the bushes were bent and broken. The leaves smeared with blood, as was the side of the house behind the holly bush, and there was a sizable stain on the soil beneath it. The ivy on the fence next to the bush was also spattered, with some leaves entirely coated with blood. For context, my parents' house is in a small town. The house and garage are separate structures, with an ivy-coated chain-link fence running between the house and garage to separate the front yard from the back. The lot faces the main north-south road through the town, while behind the lot is a street that runs north between their lot and the neighbor's house. Then it makes a sharp turn to the west, away from my parents' yard. Following that street leads you to another neighborhood on the right, while the left side of the street is bordered by a heavily wooded area that eventually connects with a large swathe of mostly unpopulated forest and swamp. For the amount of blood by the holly, we judged that someone had been hidden there for a while. Some of the ivy was pulled away from the fence between the house and garage, so it was clear this person had climbed over the fence. From there, the trail became much more clear as it went across the concrete patio between the house and garage. There's a window AC unit sticking out from the window just past the fence. And on the other side of it, there was much more blood drying in a pool on the patio, as well as more smears higher up on the wall of the house. Again, it looked like the person had hidden there for a while behind the AC unit. And by this point, we were certain that it was a person and not an animal, partly because of the sheer amount of blood and partly because the smears on the side of the house were higher up, as if a person had leaned against the house with blood on their hands or upper body. The trail then picked up again, but with smaller spatters as if they had managed to control the bleeding somewhat. The track went across the patio out into the backyard, where it was difficult to follow through the grass. At the far back fence, some of the honeysuckle vines that grew over the fence had been pulled, and the fence itself was bent, as if someone had climbed over it there. And again, there were some smears of blood on the vine. From there, the trail ran out into the street behind my parents' house, where it became nearly impossible to follow. It was pretty clear that someone had been injured and was trying to hide, which implied that someone else had caused the injury and was looking for them. Whatever the injury was, 
It must have been fairly serious because they lost quite a bit of blood in my parents' yard alone. They had come down the driveway from the main road and they clearly knew they could cut through the yard to reach the back street in the neighborhood of the forest beyond. My dad asked the night security at the local school if he'd heard anything on the police scanners that night about anything weird going on, but the guard hadn't heard anything. My mom told me a few days later that the neighbor who lives on the street behind them told her that he'd had insomnia that night. He heard someone running down the street at 3 a.m. He'd also seen a dark truck make several slow passes up and down the street, I'd asked my parents if they wanted to call the police to report whatever this was. They were both in their late 60s at the time, and I worried about them being alone while there were creepy things, presumably that were involving violence, that were clearly going on right outside their house. My mom declined, not only because there was nothing the police could do, but also because she was worried the police might have been involved somehow with what happened. The local cops had a reputation for being corrupt so she didn't want to have any sort of involvement. So, I took the hose and scrub brush and did my best to wash away any traces of whatever it was that had happened the previous night. Needless to say, I did not sleep well for the remainder of that trip home, nor on subsequent visits. It was kind of like being in a house in a slasher film, not the house where actual violence takes place, but the one down the street where the hero or heroine of the movie runs and hides outside whilst being pursued by the killer. We were the neighbors that found out the next morning, off screen, that something bad was happening just outside while they slept. Definitely a creepy feeling, and much closer than I ever want to be to that kind of situation. I have two stories, so here's the first one. For some context, my boyfriend's family farms on both sides of Iowa and Missouri border since they live fairly close to the state line. They have corn, soybeans, and beef cattle on pasture. I particularly love the cattle because I love getting to jump in the ranger and ride around the pasture with my boyfriend to check on the cows. We do this almost every night in the spring, summer, and fall to make sure they are healthy, not injured, account for the calves make sure they have enough grass, and look to see if there are any holes or breaks in the fences. In the wintertime, they get moved to a lot with a covered shed to protect them from the elements, so they are not on the pasture and we have to feed them hay. Anyway, in the mid-2000s, my father-in-law was out in the wooded area of the cattle pasture. The trees are quite dense here, and it often serves as a great deer hunting spot in the late fall to winter once the cows have been moved into the winter lot. He was setting up trail cameras in the woods to watch deer in preparation for hunting season that fall. After some time, he came back out to get the card out of the camera to see if there were any bucks roaming around. When he took a look at some of the pictures, he saw that there had been an unusual man back there. Trespassers aren't all that uncommon, and it's often just an annoyance rather than cause for concern. There was no way to tell who it was, so he just forgot about it. A few days later, he went back to hang the camera back up in the tree. When my father-in-law went back a second time, about a week later to get the camera to see the pictures, someone had dug three makeshift graves in the back corner of the pasture. And at the head of each grave was a wooden cross with a first name on it. He unfortunately didn't catch the man on the trail camera, but he did alert the police about the situation. I think based on the names on the crosses, the police had an idea of who it could have been. The rural Midwest is smaller than you think for being so vast. My father-in-law wasn't really sure of what came of that, and he never asked much into it. But if he hadn't discovered those graves in the pasture and told the police, they might have been filled. And now on to the second story. My father-in-law had some farms in Missouri that were bordered by the Missouri River. The Missouri River flows down through the Dakotas, along the Iowa-Nebraska border, and then at Kansas City, it takes a turn and divides the state of Missouri in two until it reaches Mississippi. One spring in the late 1990s, he was out in a field next to the Missouri River, planting some corn. This was before all the current high-tech tools that farmers have at their disposal now. He thought that his planter was having some issues, so he jumped out to check to see if something was broken. When he got out of the tractor, 
he noticed a really strange smell. A bad smell. If you know anything about farming, planting season is fast-paced time to try to beat the weather, and he was more concerned about getting his crop planted than investigating. He just assumed it was a dead deer washed up in the river, and he continued on until he thought the planter was having problems again a few hours later. This time, he was on the end of the field closer to the river. The smell was stronger and unlike anything he had experienced before. They continued on that day working until one of the hired men asked if anyone noticed the bizarre smell coming from the river. My father-in-law said he had, and wondered to them if it was a dead deer, but usually deer didn't smell quite like this. One of the hired men wandered across the field to the edge of the river to get a closer look. At the bottom, he saw what he thought was an animal tangled in the branches washed up by the river. Looking closer, he realized it was a person. They immediately called the police. It turns out, it was a missing woman who was a known prostitute from Kansas City. She made it this far downstream. I cannot find the exact article or name. I don't even know if the police ever told my father-in-law her name, even though they briefly questioned him. But I do know there are a few articles of a woman being found in the river east of Kansas City in the late 1990s. This took place when I was about 14 to 15 years old. I would stay over at my best friend's house constantly. She's an only child and her mom would let us do anything, including leave their place by ourselves at one or two in the morning. I am surprised we're alive because we were very trusting. We were get into a car with a group of teenage boys we just met trusting. So one night we were hanging out at a guy's house. The plan originally was that we were going to stay the night there. His grandma ended up getting angry at him and told everyone to leave. It was about 1am and we had no other option than to walk to our house. We decided to cut through a used car dealership. The security guy spotted us and said we were trespassing. He asked us why we were out so late and where were we going. After hearing about what happened, he said, If a cop stops you, they won't believe that. You'll probably just get into trouble. We didn't have cell phones yet, so we asked if we could use his phone to call someone. My friend's mom is going through a rough patch financially, and she didn't have phone service. My mother would have killed us if we tried to call her, so we told them we have no one. The security guy offers to pay for us to stay in a motel for the night. This man was probably 30 to 35 years old. My friend was 14, and I was 15. Stupidly, we accepted his offer. So we both get into the back seat of his car, when he says, One of you could sit up front. So my best friend promptly jumps in the back, leaving me to sit up front. We stopped by his back, then he headed to the nearest motel. The entire drive there, he was telling us that he was a war vet and got injured on tour, telling us he would kill for a massage. He asked if any of us were any good at massaging people, and we said no, not really. We finally get to the motel. This guy parks and tells us to stay in the car, but not before he takes his handgun out of the holster and puts it in the glove box directly in front of me and locks it. He then goes to the office to pay for the room. He ended up asking if he could come up with us, and if we could give him a massage as a thank you. We said no and booked it up the stairs. We dead bolted the door the second we got in there. We definitely didn't sleep that night. We were too creeped out. As soon as the sun came up, we got out of there. We walked a good hour and a half back to my friend's place. Twelve years later, I'm 26, just browsing Facebook, and I saw a news article about an army vet being arrested for abducting and assaulting two teenage girls. It was the same bald-headed security guy that picked me and my friend up. It was a very unsettling feeling, thinking of what could have happened. I don't remember how old I was, just that I was small enough to fit in the front baby seat of a grocery cart. That had put us in the very late 90s or early 2000s. I was grocery shopping with my mom at Costco. For those who don't know the chain, it's basically a huge warehouse where everything is sold in bulk. Food, 
clothes, books. It's basically a Walmart. But if Walmart sold cereal boxes in counts of threes or frozen dinners by the dozen, my mom has a habit of pulling a grocery cart down the one side of the aisle in stores and then walking the length of the shelves, picking what she wants, and then coming back to the cart, dumping whatever she has in the basket. I don't get why she does it, but hey, moms do weird things. So I may be four or five, sitting in the front basket playing with my Game Boy Color. When she pulls over next to a fruit display in Costco, she tells me she's going to look at the different deals and to sit tight. I wasn't a very fidgety kid, so I said okay. She is gone for a couple of minutes. I'm absorbed in Pokemon. I don't really notice her walk up until the cart starts moving. Being a kid, I instinctively trust that she's the one pushing the cart. I was wrong. After a moment or two, I catch out of the corner of my vision her red nails. This is a problem because my mom never paints her nails and never ever wears them long. I look up. The lady pushing the cart is a bit older than my mother. Same curly black hair, but it was pulled into a ponytail at the nape of her neck. I still remember she had tanned Italian-type skin with thick red lips, a heavy coat of eyeliner, and brown eyes. She was pretty skinny, her teeth were yellow, and she smelled like, what I didn't realize until later, bad B.O. This wasn't my mom, and I said so very loudly. She laughed and looked around and pushed the cart a little faster. I said it again and she looked me dead in the eyes and said, Oh sweetie. What game are you playing? I am your mom. So the way Costco is set up, at least ours, is that in the produce area instead of the aisles, they're more like islands. There are large square setups that you can see the entire length of the produce section if you walk in that area. So of course, I can see my actual mother a few displays away. As loud as I could, I remember yelling, Mom, and watching her head whip around to look at me right as this lady is trying to cover my mouth with her hand. I don't know if she decided then I wasn't worth it, because I was so noisy, or if it was looking at my mother charging from a few displays over, but this woman squeezed her hand around my little face once and then booked it. My mom comes running up to me and starts asking me a million questions at once. My little brain thinks all of a sudden that I'm in trouble for using my outdoor voice inside. She looks mad, but I start to cry. By the time she calmed me down, the lady was already gone, and reporting her to the head of security did shit. The store never found her inside, and the security cam footage showed her leaving, but never with anyone else. I don't know why she picked me, or what it would have been for, but I'm just glad my real mom ended up scaring her away and that nothing became of it. This night took place a few years ago, while my father and I were living in a small rural town in Alberta. I was fairly new in this town and didn't know anybody but my dad and co-workers. I had found a job as a key holder in a liquor store that closed every night at 2am. My store was located in between a pharmacy and a grocery store, a place well lit where I felt safe most nights, not knowing yet that this town was actually known for its drug problems and random creeps. This particular night, my coworker and I had been working late. We needed to finish unloading the pallets of liquor since we had another shipment coming in the next morning. At the end of the night, around 3.30 a.m., I told my coworker that she could leave and that I was going to take care of closing down the store. That meant counting the till and cleaning up, as she was exhausted and that I had the keys for the store anyway. After she left, I quickly finished my tasks, took all my stuff, and called my father. At the time, I didn't have a car, and my dad would come pick me up every night and bring me back home, which was maybe about 5-10 to 10 minutes drive to my workplace. I have an amazing father. In return, I always made sure to be ready and wait outside the store for his arrival. I didn't want him to have to wait for me, because I knew he didn't have much time left to sleep since he had work in the morning. I got ready to get out of the store, set out the security system and locked the door behind me. Now you have to understand that I wasn't supposed to finish this late at night, and that once the alarm system was on, I couldn't go back inside because the regional manager would receive a security call if I opened the door, and the alarm would automatically start to ring. 
I didn't have the code to shut it off since I never worked the morning shift yet. The store policy mentioned that if you forgot something inside, you'd have to wait until the next day to get it back. As I was waiting for my dad, standing in front of the store, I heard some noises coming from my left. It sounded like someone was breathing loudly. The pharmacy that was right next to my store had these big red columns in the front of the entrance. I thought the noise was coming from around these columns. I looked to my left but didn't see anything, so I brushed it off thinking it was probably the wind or just my very tired self imagining stuff. It was almost 4am after all. I had worked really hard that evening. After a few minutes, I heard the noise again. I started getting nervous. It was definitely coming from my left. And this time, I knew that it was not in my head. At that moment, I noticed movement. I realized I was not alone. A few meters away, on my left, someone was crouched down behind one of the columns. I could not see his face. Only his hands holding one side of the column while he was slowly moving his head to look in my direction. I was terrified, completely paralyzed with fear. I knew my father couldn't be very far away from the store at this point, so I grabbed my phone to call him. My dad answered and I told him to hurry up. I explained someone was hiding next to me and that I was petrified. My dad told me he was going as fast as he could and told me to grab the keys and get inside the store. I was trying to find them inside my bag, but I was panicking too much. My hands were shaking and I just couldn't find the keys for the life of me. I felt completely horrified when I realized that the man had stood up, still hiding behind one of the columns, only a few meters away from me. My voice filled with fear. I asked my dad where he was. He shouted that he was almost there. I started to slowly move towards the grocery store that was on my right, never turning my back to him. The very tall and imposing man looked at me again, but this time, he got out of his hiding spot and started to walk in my direction with the biggest smile on his face. I can still recall thinking that this was it. I was going to die. I was trying to decide if I should start running for my life or if it was better to face and fight him if need be. But suddenly, I heard a big noise coming from my right. I turned around and saw my dad driving as fast as he possibly could into the parking lot, honking and turning on his high beams, I believed to startle the man. My feet finally decided to move. I ran as fast as I could and jumped inside of my dad's pickup. Tears were coming out of my eyes. I watched this man looking straight up at us and slowly waving at my father for what felt like an eternity. But in reality, it was a few seconds. The creepy man started walking closer to us, and as he got closer, my father finally got a good look at the man and said, Oh my god, girl, I guess you haven't met Peter yet. I didn't understand. My dad started laughing, tears coming out of his eyes while I looked at him, still in complete shock. To me, there was absolutely nothing funny at that moment. A few seconds before, I thought my dad wouldn't get there fast enough that I was going to be murdered right there in front of my workplace. My father waved back at him and we drove off slowly. On our way home, he explained that Peter was a very nice man, but he had a cognitive disability. He said that Peter lived in town and that every morning he would sit inside the Tim Hortons that was located in the same parking lot as my store. He would ask people if they wanted a hug. He apparently did that every day and everybody in our small town knew him. My dad told me I should give him a big hug the next time I want to get a coffee at Timmy's, since I probably scared the poor man to death. I was involved in two encounters that scared the life out of me. The first one is pretty short. In 2011, I had graduated from university and I fell into light depression. Naturally, I would wake up later than the rest of the household, and given that my room was the loft conversion, any morning noise did not interfere with my sleep. One such morning at around 10am, I lightly awoke to some shuffling. I thought it was probably the birds perched on the roof. I went back to sleep. However, 20 minutes or so later, some light noise disrupted my sleep again. 
When I looked in the direction of the noise, I saw two blurry faces in the distance, holding the bathroom door ajar. I realized they saw me too. I couldn't do anything but freeze. Before I knew it, I heard hurried shuffling followed by two bangs, which means they jumped onto the extension in the garden. I remained frozen in bed like a popsicle until it all died down. Ten minutes later, I checked the ensuite and saw footprints all over the toilet seat, which is just below the windowsill. Bear in mind the window is so tiny and you really need to be a contortionist to fit in there, so how they got in is a mystery to me. Since then, that window remains closed. Several years later in 2017, I saw one of my neighbors walking her dog. I had never spoken to her before, so I expected an awkward situation until we moved directions. But it came to pass that she was taking the same route that I was. We got to talking and she started telling me how she loves art house movies. This delighted me because I never got to meet people like that in real life. So we exchanged numbers in order that we can recommend movies to each other. For a whole week, we were texting about our favorite movies, scenes, and directors. Then one night, she called me. I thought it was unusual since we're not cordial enough for a phone call. I answered, hello, but I heard nothing other than static. I repeated a few times and heard nothing but static and shuffling. After about two minutes, I put the phone down and thought she had pocket dialed me. Then she called me again. This time she was whispering. I told her I couldn't hear a few times. This happened at least four times within five minutes. I really didn't think anything of it. On the fifth try, I finally heard her, but it was not something anyone wants to hear. There are people in the house. I am alone under my bed. Call the police. I thought she was joking, but quickly realized we aren't that close for her to think she can play such pranks on me. I told her to remain on the phone, my heart racing. I rushed to the window so I can see her house. To my shock, I saw two flailings like two lightsabers on the bottom floor. She was breathing heavily over the phone. I asked her what room she was in. She said it was the one facing the street, just above the front door. She reached for the tall curtains from underneath the bed and started to lightly shake them. I got her signal. She stayed on the phone. I immediately called the police and explained the situation. They said a few units were on their way post-haste. I knew the cops would make it in time. For the last few months, I took up a casual delivery role with Just Eat. Just Eat's a food delivery service like Uber Eats, so knowing that knocking on the door to spook the intruders could put me at risk, given that they may see my face. I put on my earphones, some stuff in a bag to make it look like a package, my helmet, and then I hopped on the motorcycle located in the garage behind my house. I also covered the number plates with black tape. I made it look like I was delivering something. I went all around the street and accelerated towards the property. In the meantime, I told my neighbor not to speak and that I will walk her through everything I'm doing. I'm gonna ring the buzzer, I said to her. My heart was beating so fast that I felt faint when my hand touched the buzzer. I cannot describe how difficult it was for me to press it. It was as if I was lifting double my body weight. Now, I'm thinking any real criminal would run away but not these guys. I didn't hear anything, but I saw the torches turn off. I rang again. Nothing. No noise, no shuffling. Nothing that would make one think someone was trying to escape. All I heard was her breathing. I saw a half-broken brick on top of the bin, so I pushed the brick next to my feet, just in case I had to use it. Then, suddenly, I became brave. I pressed the buzzer again, but this time I yelled, delivery for number 22. I heard some footsteps, so I repeated it. A husky voice from the other side of the door said, number 22 is next door. My heart almost stopped. My brain began to scatter and I stammered, uh, sorry sir. Then I heard the most beautiful noise in the world, sirens. I'm not the greatest fan of cops, but that sound made me feel safe for the first time ever. It was like hearing Frank Ocean's nights for the first time. That is when the fear which the criminals in my house had the courtesy of possessing became vocal. Hurrying movements and shuffling radiated from the house. 
I heard a door from a distance swing open, followed by rushing footsteps implicative of running. As the footsteps joined into the unified sound of a whole city, sirens flushed out all the noise. I had to remain silent and alert. With the cops in front of the house now, I took off my helmet. The cop asked me if I was the one who called, and I said yes. Is she still in there? Yes, I replied. They surrounded the house and knocked on the door. Nobody answered. The cops told me to ask her to remain in the house. Another cop then radioed in, saying the back door was open, the garden window smashed. They said they were going in. After searching the house, they found her underneath the bed, safe. A few cops went on to search for the suspects, but because my area is full of lakes, ponds, rivers, thickets and marshes, and intertwined with residential properties, it was difficult to find them. I went back to put my bike in the garage. When I came back, she looked visibly shaken, but also happy. She thanked me, and I was happy she was fine. They didn't take anything, as a bag and some valuables were found scattered in the garden. They probably felt the infantry was too heavy for them to make a swift escape. This whole ordeal lasted longer than the time it took me to write this, but I'm happy I finally put it on the proverbial paper. Why now? I was reminded when two police officers knocked on the door to inform me that the suspects had finally been caught. They had used the footprints from my bathroom and DNA from hers to identify them. The robbers were caught in the act and charged with two previous attempted break-ins, for the one at mine and hers. I guess the thieves were still aiming when they had attempted to break into my room and were easily hurt. Not so much the second time around. This happened in late 2015. I was working as a graphic designer for a very small startup company in rural New York State. There were just four of us in a rented building the owner shared with a computer repair shop. I had been there maybe a month and worked closely with the web programmer. He was a young fella, around 23 in the gentle giant type. Tall, husky and muscular with tattoos and a shaved head, but super sweet and laid back. We'd often take smoke breaks and shoot the shit. I didn't know much about his home life other than he just moved in with his new girlfriend. She usually picked him up after work, but if she worked late, he had to walk home by himself along the highway in the dark. When we found this out, the boss immediately started offering him lifts. I wondered what his situation was, lost car or license or something, but I didn't want to put him on the spot to ask. He was kind of shy. Anyway. Time passes, and one day, the boss wasn't in to offer to drive him home. His rental is a small house behind a boarded-up car wash in the boonies. You had to drive down a short, dark, private road to get to it. You would never have known the place existed were you just driving by it. We shoot the shit for a minute in the car and finish our smokes. I tell him I'll see him tomorrow, and that's when it got weird. He looked at the house for several seconds, quiet not moving to open the door at all. He said, Yeah, in this strange, resigned voice, then slowly turned his head to look at me. Now you have to realize, in real life, people almost never slowly turn their heads to look at you. You can't imagine how creepy it is until someone actually does it to you. And the fact that you're a 120-pound woman and he's a huge guy, in a parked car behind an abandoned car wash, in the pitch black with no other house inside, this was not the look a guy gives you, say, after a first date when he wants to kiss. It was so off, and not an awkward or shy kind of off. He looked at me in the kind of way you look in your cupboard when you can't decide what to eat, or if you should be eating anything at all. His mouth was slightly open. He was staring me straight in the face with a slight squint, as if struggling hard to figure something out. Yet it was me who was the thing. That sudden shift of being looked at like a thing, and not the amiable co-worker he'd been laughing, bullshitting with, and getting to know over the past month, that scared the shit out of me. In less than a minute, he'd gone from his normal self into a state of tense, disassociated slow motion. He actually looked bigger to me as well. I asked if he was okay, and after maybe 15 long seconds, he looked back at the house. Either sighed or gave another resigned, yeah and he finally got out of the car. 
Needless to say, I did not plan on giving him any more rides. But a week later, it didn't matter. He used a shotgun to kill himself on the front porch of that rental house. His poor girlfriend was inside, waiting for him to finish his cigarette. It was then, from his family, that we finally got the backstory. He'd been a newly sobered alcoholic, with DUIs from earlier in the year that explained the no-car situation. He'd also had several serious injuries from car wrecks and blackouts over the years, the last actually resulting in two small permanent dents in his skull. The buildup of brain injuries had done far more damage than sobriety could reverse. His girlfriend admitted that ever since his last accident, he'd had intrusive violent fantasies and impulses of hurting others and himself. You can imagine where my mind went after hearing that. It's certainly my creepiest personal experience, though when I think of it today, all I can feel is sorrow for this poor kid who barely started his life. In the end, strong enough to fight the demons demanding others' lives, but not his own. News about child abductions have become more frequent in my country, so this has led to an old encounter my mom reminded me of from when I was a wee lass. This happened when I was about five or six years old. My mother was a dealer for Coca-Cola at the time in the rural regions of my city, so that meant she and her fellow employees would be delivering crates of coke to little villages in the boonies regularly. On this particular day, no deliveries were scheduled. Anything that was to be delivered was done, so we were all hanging out at the warehouse. My mom figured since it was the end of the week, let's all go on a little road trip with the crew. Everyone agreed. Then one of the crew suggested we go see this new inland resort a couple of towns over. It was nothing fancy, just a large area with a few ponds. A pond where you can catch your own catfish for meals and bamboo huts along the side. We all get in the truck and off we go. We arrive sometime in the early afternoon and my mom is telling members of the crew what to do. One books a hut, one gets our stuff in order, and someone to keep an eye on me. While I look around but never wandering too far, I see this older lady, maybe 40s to 50s, looking at me. I was a friendly kid, so I waved and smiled. She just stared at me, so I told the crew member who was looking after me, who in turn told my mom. She informed everyone to watch out for her, and to make sure someone always had eyes on me. We proceeded on merrymaking. I'm swimming in the pool, my mom and crew having a few drinks and eating catfish. This dragged on till maybe 6 or 7 p.m. I stayed in the pool the majority of the time and would just come up for a bite or a drink of soda, but on my last attempt to jump in, I see at the far end of the pool the same old lady. I immediately tell my mom who looks in her direction and tells everyone we're packing up and going back to the warehouse. We get back and my mom requested that three of the guys stay the night at the old house and if they could stay up one at a time just to be safe. Sometime in the middle of the night, I get woken up by my mom telling me to be quiet and follow her to one of the bedrooms. She said to leave my slippers so we don't make any noise. I ask why and she pointed outside onto the other side of the gate. And there was the same lady. She insisted I go to one of the rooms in the back of the house and stay there till she gets me. I follow her and then I hear her wake up the crew. I hear them leave the house and confront the lady by the gate, asking questions like, Who are you? What do you want? Why did you follow us? But my mom just said she glared at them while mumbling, and every now and then she would crane her neck, looking past them as if to look out for someone. She eventually leaves, and in the morning I'm taken back to the city to my actual house, while my mom went back to the town to continue her job. She informed the local authorities of the lady. I never saw that woman again, and it's been 20 years. Seventeen or so years ago, I worked IT for the large local hospital in my city. We also provided IT services to seven other smaller hospitals in towns across the whole of our county and the neighboring county. My job was to build, install, and fix computers and provide support to 6,000 users. It was an incredibly stressful job, 
made even worse because I was the only person on the IT staff who lived in the city where the main hospital was, so I was often on call after business hours too. When I began there, I was straight out of university and very, very young. I had graduated high school much younger than most kids do. I was also very shy and rather anxious. While I was unquestionably geeky and awkward, I was still young and reasonably cute. I would never have been called beautiful, as I was plain and a bit overweight, but I was cute. I dress in loose, baggy masculine clothing, and I never wear makeup at all despite being female, as I have sensory problems that make fitted clothing and the oily feel and scent of cosmetics very hard to tolerate. So yeah, not exactly a runway model. I was in my very early 20s when this happened, but my shyness and immature social skills made me seem more like a young teen than an adult. I'm also asexual, so I choose not to date. The hospital where I worked was going through some repairs and upgrades, one of these being the replacement of the antiquated HVAC system in the main building on the hospital campus. They brought in a major company to assess the hospital's needs, choose an appropriate system, and install it. This meant that one of the representatives from that company would be present at the hospital daily, he was given an office beside the one that belonged to the head of hospital maintenance, and I was directed to get him a computer and set him up on the network. When I got to this office and began installing the computer, things started getting weird. This was the first time I'd ever met the man, and we'll call him Andrew. This guy was at least 20 years older than I was, rather reedy looking due to being very tall and quite thin, and average in appearance. Your typical, forgettable middle-aged man but he would not take his eyes off of me. Being autistic, I'm naturally very uncomfortable with eye contact, especially the prolonged sort. This man was just openly staring at me as I worked. He introduced himself and began asking me innocent work-related questions, but these soon morphed into very personal inquiries that had nothing to do with work, like asking where I lived, whether I had a boyfriend, that sort of thing. I told him that I lived in the same city as the hospital, but not exactly where. I actually lived right across the road from the hospital, but I did not want him knowing that. I lied and told him I had a long-term boyfriend too. Any questions that veered in the direction of dating or romance got a curt, uninviting, bald-faced lie as an answer. I was getting very uncomfortable at this point, but I didn't react as I would now. Nowadays... I would tell a guy asking that sort of questions that it was none of his damn business, and then inform him that he was being inappropriate, that I wanted it to stop or I would complain to HR. But back then, I was very uncertain, petrified of confrontation. I was afraid to make any sort of complaint about anything, so I just kept working. I ended up having to sit down at his desk to install the correct software access, and while I was seated, he walked up right behind me. I thought to myself, he's just watching what I'm doing to access the program he needs. No. He put his hands on my shoulders and began to massage them. I froze, stiffening up. You're stiff as a board, he said, as he kept kneading my shoulders, all full of knots. Yeah, well, if I hadn't already been tense and bothered by his intrusive questions, I most certainly was after he began touching me. It's very common for autistic people to deeply dislike being touched. I tried to squirm out of his grasp, afraid to tell him to stop directly, as we were in a rather secluded, untraveled part of the hospital's basement. I was afraid to make a scene and anger him. I hurried through getting everything done, told him to call our help desk if he needed any other help, and practically ran out of his office. I should have told HR right then and there, but I didn't. It was creepy, yeah but I didn't think HR would be any help. It was so borderline, I thought. It was just treading the edge of inappropriate. I did tell my boss that Andrew made me uncomfortable, but my boss forgot about it nearly immediately. Now fast forward a couple of weeks. I was working in the medical imaging department, installing some terminals in the CT scan suite. I was visible from the hallway. Andrew passed, walking with two men from building maintenance. As soon as he saw me, he began loudly telling his companions that I was cute, pretty, sexy, smart, that kind of thing. He was laying it on thick. He walked past again and again, 
loudly praising me and saying he wanted to date me every time he went by. Ugh. The two men he was walking with knew me a bit, and I could tell they were bothered and embarrassed by this guy's inappropriate behavior. Finally, I finished up and ran back to the safety of my own department. Another week passed by, and I was heading home late. I was using the underground tunnel between the main building and the smaller one, used solely for administrative offices. It's a long tunnel passing below a busy road, and I often took this route going home, as this smaller building was very close to my apartment complex. I heard someone call my name and turned to find Andrew hurrying up to catch me. It was after hours. The corridor was otherwise totally empty. I did not want him to find out that I lived right beside the hospital. I turned and ran, hearing him call my name over and over again. Being younger, I was faster, and I'd managed to find a good hiding spot inside the administrative building without him knowing where I'd gone. I'd hidden myself in a network hub closet behind the tall rack of networking equipment. I locked the door behind me, thankfully as I heard him walk up the hallway trying the doorknobs of locked offices, calling my name as he proceeded. He jiggled the doorknob of the room I was in as he went by. I remained there, silent and still, long after I heard his last yell. After I was sure he had gone, I snuck out and raced home. Things calmed down for a bit after that. A few months went by without me having any contact with him though I did still see him around the halls of the hospital more often than I thought. I vaguely wondered if he was trying to follow me, but there was nothing conclusive enough to prove it one way or the other. Then came the scariest part. I was working in a part of the hospital that had patient rooms, but they were being remade into offices. I had to pull network drops into these offices to allow computers to access the network. I lost track of time while I worked, and the other people working there with me. The painters and the men setting up the new desks, they all went home without me noticing. Eventually, I was completely alone. When I had happened to glance at my watch, it was almost 6.30 in the evening. I usually left at 5.30. I packed up my tools and left the room where I'd been working. I stepped out into the long hallway, tired and thinking about what I would make for supper. I hadn't gone very far when I heard footsteps approaching and looked up. That was Andrew, hurriedly walking towards me. I hoped that if I switched to the other side of the hallway, he'd rush past as he did seem to be hurrying up. No such luck. He veered over to me, grabbed me hard by my biceps, and forced me up against the wall. He then proceeded to pin me there with his whole body while he touched me, easily pushing away my hands as I punched and slapped, trying to get him off me. For a thin man, he was surprisingly strong. He leaned down so that his face was close to mine, and I thought in horror, oh god no, he's gonna kiss me. So I twisted my neck, turned my face as far from his fetid breath as possible. Instead he growled into my ear. Normal girls like it when a guy wants them. Normal girls let guys date them. All the while I was yelling, no. Finally, my brain got itself out of freeze mode and I became angry. I shoved him hard, and once I had enough space to make the move, I kneed him hard in the groin. He doubled over, wheezing and moaning. I ran and locked myself into one of the rooms I'd been working in. The doors were solid hardwood and the locks were strong, so I knew I would be safe, despite him starting to pound and kick at the door. Only one problem, I had no way to call for help. I didn't carry the on-call phone during the day. I didn't own my own mobile phone, and none of the rooms that were being renovated into offices had telephones installed yet. I was trapped. My only way to call for help would be opening the window and yelling out. Meanwhile, Andrew continued pounding and kicking the locked door, screaming insults and entreaties. Five minutes passed, then ten, and he was still beating and battering the door, slamming hard against it with his full weight. I began to fear I might be trapped there all night, with him on the other side of the door, trying to break in. I don't know what finally made him give up. Maybe he heard someone approaching or something. Suddenly, the yelling and banging at the door stopped completely, and I was left in breathless silence. I remained there, listening at the door, trying to detect the telltale rustle of clothing or squeak of a shoe, 
something or anything that would tell me that he was still waiting there for me to open the door, but it was nothing. Just sweet, lovely, safe silence. I slowly undid the lock, and then inched the door open and peered out. No one. He was gone. I knew he might be hiding out of my view in another office, but I had to do something. I couldn't just hole up in an office for the next 14 hours or so. Knowing it was a risk, I bolted for the stairwell and raced down to my department. I felt safe there, as my workspace was in the code access controlled server room, and only my co-workers and I knew the combination needed to get in. Only one person was still in the department, the woman who handled the help desk calls. I began to cry the second I saw her. She frantically asked what was wrong. She held my hands as I told her what happened. She was the one who convinced me to report Andrew to HR. I knew HR would be empty at that hour, so I sent an email rather than calling. I then went home and became a little ball of tears, worry, anxiety, and horrified nausea. I called sick the next day. The HR staff called me at home that afternoon. I reiterated all I told them in my email. How he'd been kind of inappropriate from day one and about how things escalated so horribly. The HR director asked me to come in and write out a formal complaint form. I did. Because Andrew didn't work directly for the hospital itself, it was difficult for HR to handle this, I guess. I did contact the company he worked for, but he was not fired or even transferred to some other client site. He was given a tiny slap on the wrist and told never to come near me or attempt to communicate with me in any way. I still had to see that bastard at work every day. I felt very unsafe when my tasks took me away from busy areas. This added to the stress of the job and I began to suffer from stress-related medical problems like migraines, depression, and anxiety. I felt very unsupported and unprotected by HR too. About 18 months after that event, I quit that job. So, Andrew, I hope your nasty ass is in jail. The creepiest thing just happened to me. I'm a 20-year-old female. I was laying in bed scrolling through TikTok after a long day of work. As I was scrolling, I noticed breakthrough sounds that were not part of the original audio. I confirmed this by scrolling away and scrolling back to the videos and realizing the sound wasn't there anymore. It started as little blips that I assumed were caused by our shitty download speeds. As I kept scrolling, I started hearing more and more until one entire video's audio was completely covered by what sounded like listening to TV over the phone. I got creeped out and paused the video, but the sound continued. I could hear someone breathing and eating what sounded like potato chips through my phone. I immediately covered my camera. The TV and eating sound stopped. I was left with that static you can hear when someone's silent on the other side of the phone. When I uncovered my camera, the chips quietly returned. I covered my camera again, and after sitting in two full minutes of phone static, I asked, Hello? It was a short, low sound that I assumed to be a grunt and the phone static ended. I panicked, closed all my apps, and turned my phone off. Now I have tape covering my camera, and I just bought a VPN. I know it's virtually impossible for the iPhone camera to be hacked, but I'm still freaked out. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you have a story you'd like me to feature on the channel, you can send it to my email. Or if you have a Reddit, submit it on my subreddit. You'll find the details in the video description below. I'll pin a comment too. Do me a favor and leave a like and comment. Subscribe if you haven't. And hit the bell icon and turn on notifications so you can stay up to date with my latest videos. If you fancy checking out my Patreon channel membership, all my links are in the description below. And as usual, I want to thank my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Cassie Fowler, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, B Nick, Lil Smart, Do It, K, Something Edgy, Pretty Girl 215, Borderline Betty, Sarah C. Blazed Goddess, Christopher, 
Spider's Web, Ulala la Andrea, Lady Dracard, Sue, Absinthe Alice, Rochelle, Estara Ray, Monique, Crafty Kel, Monica Level Ace, Emma, Sean Gorman, Jennifer L, Skittles MM, Gabrielle, Serafina Nightingale, Jennifer C, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I hope you guys enjoyed that and are doing well.